I often think about the danger of getting into a rut. You start doing something, you get good at it. Maybe you keep on loving it, but there is a danger that eventually you get into a groove. You do what needs to be done. You tick the boxes. There is competence, but maybe not excellence because the intensity has gone out of it. You know what to do, and you rinse and repeat, rinse and repeat, rinse and repeat. And this is like that. Bob Dylan once said, "He not busy being born is busy dying." This is a danger in any profession, but I feel that this is particularly a danger in academia. The pressure to conform in academia, whether to the fashions of the day or to the hidebound conventions of the ideological eco chambers, that pressure is so great that to be busy being born is a path to sure death. You will be crushed. There is no space for independent thinkers. Most of academia, certainly in the social sciences, is pompous old farts and pompous young farts talking to each other in a circle jerk game and not concerned at all about the real world. That's why. It's so refreshing to come across those rare academics who question everything, who engage with the real world, and who, by following their curiosities, enrich our understanding of the world we live in. Welcome to the Seen and the Unseen, our weekly podcast on economics, politics, and behavioral science. Please welcome your host, Amit Varma. Welcome to the scene and the unseen. My guest today is Yugang Goel, an associate professor at Flame University and an independent thinker we must all pay attention to. Yugang recently came out with a co-authored book called Who Move My Vote, which uses data to come up with many insights about the Indian electoral system and about Indian politics, many of them counterintuitive. He is also a deep thinker on everything to do with this country and in this conversation we spoke about education, elections, colonization, religion, history, society and much much else. I had so much fun recording this that I can't wait for you to listen to it as well. So let's do just that after a quick commercial break. Hey, the music started and this sounds like a commercial, but it isn't. It's a plea from me to check out my latest labor of love, a YouTube show I am co-hosting with my good friend, the brilliant Ajay Shah. We've called it. Everything is everything. Every week we'll speak for about an hour on things we care about, from the profound to the profane, from the exalted to the everyday. We range widely across subjects and we bring multiple frames with which we try to understand the world. Please join us on our journey and please support us by subscribing to our YouTube channel at youtube.com/amitvarma A M I T V A R M A. The show is called Everything is Everything. Please do check it out. You are welcome to the scene and the unseen. I mean, it's such a pleasure to be here. I've admired it for a long time, and so happy that I'm here today. No, no, I'm really glad to have you on. And I was thinking that the moment you walked in, we should have kind of hit the recorder there itself because you were saying so many interesting things. And I'm going to ask you to sort of elaborate on one of them because I don't know if you came up with it on the fly or you've thought about it in detail. But we were talking about how you were you were telling me that you know when you went. Uh, abroad to study, you and the other Indian in your class, you knew each other, and everybody was surprised. Kerala from such a big country, how they can know each other. And before that, I was telling you about how all my guests in the seventies were part of the small elite Saint Stephen's Hindus. They all knew each other. Everybody's in the right. same thing. Yeah. And thankfully, opportunities have expanded since then. It's no longer a, b- a bunch of small elites. But you made a very interesting point, uh, drawing on from that, which and, and you came up with this metric for egalitarianism within a country. So can you expound <laughs> on that? Yeah. Okay. So this it was. quite funny actually because you know all my european and you know non indian friends particularly from the cold countries they were very surprised that both of us knew each other the other indian and uh, you know happens to be uh, used to be my former colleague at jindal uh, shilpi and so the idea was that if we if there are two indians you pick them randomly in india and you pick two indians outside india randomly in the same country chances are that likelihood of these two knowing each other will be higher for the second couple and this is this can be done for any country in the world so if the likelihood of two people within their own country knowing each other is less than any two randomly picked people of that country in another country then we know that this country has a very low level of egalitarianism the idea is that if there's just one person people educated or two person people educated and they're going to be abroad they are likely to know each other because there are very few universities that are producing these uh, elites um, and so the likelihood goes up so two germans within germany randomly picked and two germans within australia randomly picked i don't think likelihood of a is more than b or less than b i mean it's very hard to quantify but let's say two bangladeshis or two indians or two nigerians picked up within their countries and outside 
you know we could probably make a claim on this life and so i now think with so many indians abroad chances are that their likelihood of them knowing each other is reducing over time and this i think is a good thing uh, so you know while we might it's easy for us to know people in the 1960s and 70s and then through them know everyone else who's important and not so much now i think it's a good thing like i i think it should have happened earlier the enrollment rate is increasing every indian now wants to study go to good university probably even go abroad and right now they can think about it because those possibilities are around and they're exciting so it's so for that small group of people who know each other is not a very good thing for the society at large i think it's definitely good and i must tell you you know i i have a feeling that one of the angst that you know political parties who are now kind of catching up with bjp is that you know and you know the prime minister has made this comment you know the khan market gang uh, so and 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 this statement doesn't come i mean factually one may, one may argue you know, there are people who are elites within even within bjp but there has been a sense of breaking up of this uh, monopoly of you know the elites earlier to some extent or at least in terms of cosmetics it has definitely happened so but yeah yeah i hope that you know as and when we grow older indians outside india are less known to each other in a way no and actually i shared a disdain for a certain kind of elite so i totally get where that's coming from but i also think that the disdain for elites can spill into a disdain disdain for knowledge and expertise almost which in a sense it appears has been monopolized by said elites and i think that's a problem so right, it's right. that 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 i think you're right so what's happening is uh, in the in our obsession to hate capitalist we will end up hating capital in our obsession of hating elitism we will end up hating elites and that that's not what we should do yeah. so elitism needs to be hated but not elites because these are the guys who are probably you know doing many good things as well so good that you pointed it out actually so tell me about yourself where did you grow up are you an elite i'm actually we we are all elites by default in a sense but uh, uh, tell me a bit about your childhood where did you grow up what were your growing up years like Th- thanks i mean i i would like to consider i mean now definitely we are elites but i don't, i don't think i grew up as one i grew up in a very old part of uh, agra agra is don't worry i don't have guns in my pocket right now <laughs> but uh, i grew up in agra it's a small mohalla in the old part of agra which was very close to this i mean somewhat famous monument called etmat ud-daula etmat ud-daula was this monument that shah jahan's wife mumtaz mahal had built in the memory of her father so it's like old part of agra which was uh, hugely influenced by the mughal the mughal regime I, i and this is what i think um and it was quite a rustic childhood actually so some of those postcard images of taj mahal in the backyards where some of these little boys uh, are playing cricket on the sand maybe i could be one of them like so that so that's how i grew up and then you know soon my father kind of realized that if i don't get good education i'll probably you know not do anything in life uh, so he put me in a good english medium school yeah and that's i think what changed so in the school we are talking about so this was a convent school you know the sisters and nuns are they're speaking in english at home i am probably milking a cow or riding a donkey and doing doing those type of things so it was an extremely you know diverse sort of childhood in some ways because in the first half of the day i am reading in english doing things which otherwise would not be common to the second half of the day um, and i think what this did is that it led me to run into people who influenced me either my teachers or friends who come from who used to come from elite families and their parents and slowly they would tell me you know do this do that this is a good subject this is a good book study this and things like that so i so i picked up things and i so i, I think i was i would score well and things like that so you know like most indians who have scored well in their schools during the 90s and 2000s were pushed into engineering and so was i and so i um, i mean i got through uh, some of the delhi university colleges hindu stephen sans raj but you know the parental expectations didn't quite match there like you know this boy itna padhai likhai karke ba karega to achhi baat nahi hai so therefore it's better you do engineering so i went to nit surat i did my engineering and mechanical and i quite liked it actually coming from old part of agra to town called surat was a phenomenal and i think i'll tell you why it was i think it has had a huge influence on me looking back because in nits unlike iits there used to be a state quota which means you will necessarily have students from each state of india no matter their ranks so states like gujarat which where competitive culture or cultures for for these coaching institutions and entrance exams is not very high you will have those students too as long as they are good in their state ranks 
but so so you can so you will sit with a class which is kind of very you know, sort of culturally it's very rich class and right? i have friends from all, all almost all kinds all kinds of region in india and so there are two learnings that i got one which i got then the second which i'm which i got much later the first one no matter your rank you can still top your engineering colleges okay so in a way we would always consider is do engineering entrance exams select only the brightest and i can you know i can say that yes by and large they are bright but they are not at all a proxy of intelligence because folks in my class who came with a so called inferior ranks because those states you know were not very competitive in their they were doing very well in exams and the other way around as well right part of it can be attributed to well you know those guys who get good ranks they don't do hard work in their colleges but i know to the extent it is true but surely intelligence has nothing to do with your rank you know this is one thing that i learned and now i learn that i was unknowingly part of a very cross cultural you know ecosystem and that cultural osmosis that happened without us knowing it is happening i feel makes me now a little bit more open in terms of the diversity that india offers both intellectually as well as culturally but i was never interested in engineering like right mo- like most indians i do engineering and like most indians i am not interested so i turn so i had many friends who were doing law in many you know some of these universities national law school nalsar and it it was through their influence that i started getting interested in law you know i picked up a few books i you know read some, uh, used to read newspapers uh, you know extensively we went to some conferences and everything started making a lot of sense to me a lot more than engineering and and so by the time i was in the third year i realized that my cv if you can call it a cv there was a fair bit of uh, you know law that that had gotten into it uh, so we started a small law magazine with many of these law school students so, you know bunch of them from nalsar some of them from bhopal and it was a it was a magazine that was edited by the students of law there was only one person who was not from law as me and so i got a fair bit of exposure and because engineering is a mathematical science i knew a little bit of economics so what i did is i somebody told me again like i when i met these small uh, you know mentors for small duration so to speak so then you know, at that time point of time somebody told me why didn't you apply to this scholarship this is a good one called erasmus mundus and i didn't i hadn't heard of it i remember noting down the spelling because i wouldn't even know about it and internet was new this is mid 2000s computer was new so i back in my at least my in my uh, you know ecosystem and so i found this scholarship out i kind of liked it european union is giving you money to study in different parts of europe in different universities for different semesters so i applied in a program called law and economics european masters in law and economics and this was fascinating because i am neither a lawyer nor an economist by my formal degree i got through later on one of the selection panel members who happened to be my teacher in rotterdam netherlands told me that what he really liked in the application was that i am even thinking of doing this <laughs> you know being an engineer i mean so i was the only non lawyer non economist in the background uh, who was in that class class of around 90 100 students from all over the world and that exposure so so 2007 to 8 i did this masters um i didn't sit for cat i mean i had grown uh, really sick of entrance exam after my engineering entrance exam experience that was only once and i was so uh, so i didn't apply to study abroad uh, sorry i didn't apply to study in india i went abroad and now so th- i remember myself walking on the street as a extremely intrigued and curious child trying to understand why is this place so different and i mean days after days i would just walk or ride my bicycle thinking about what is it how is it possible that if you make me blindfolded and plant me here and i will tell you this is not india uh, is it really the urban architecture and urban space maybe not that is it the people maybe not that what is it and so since then i had this question of difference between east and west in some ways has been a driving force for me at least in terms of my own curiosity uh, so i i graduated you know scored well i really i i and i remember and enjoyed the most my class on comparative law and comparative law in which the our professor i still remember his name professor yan ting ting yan tingenbergen he says that he announces in the class that you think laws are the same around the world and they're different and for me as a non lawyer i mean i understood this a little bit but more importantly he then gives us this book called zweigert and kudes on comparative law and i read how lo- legal families 
are different around the world. So Japanese have a different system, common law, civil law. Now, I had known that they're different, but historically why they have been different was the first time that I read it. You know, Napoleon's uh, common law's origins. And this, so that made me, and so from there, I'm trying to connect. Why is Europe so different from India? And why are certain legal systems, why do why do they work here and they don't work in India and so on and so forth. Anyway, long story short, um, I came back, I joined a private firm which was basically a joint venture between ICICI Bank and West Bengal Industrial Development Corporation. So it's like a consulting firm on massive rural infrastructure projects in eastern part of India. So I joined them, worked out of Calcutta and Delhi. It was quite nice actually because I worked in Jharkhand, Odisha, Bengal, little bit of Bihar. And so I really saw a lo uh, another part of India. So I'm, I'm in the north. I grew up in the north. I study in the western part of India and then I work here in the east. And eastern part of India, and this is the time when I am, you know, in my early 20s. And I am hugely influenced by what I see in the Naxal affected regions in, you know, in somewhat of a... Because when you're at home, like, I mean, western UP is also poor, but not as poor as eastern UP or Bihar or Jharkhand. And when you're at home, you're kind of still, you know, living a life which is not as you know, brutal in your face. But when I'm going to these villages where, you know, the government is planning massive infrastructure projects, I'm meeting these people and I'm looking at these things uh, with a sense of curiosity. I've remained curious for most part of my life and that is, and that's when I decided I don't want to do this. I want to, I want to do something else. I don't want to look at targets and stock prices, etc. Because a real deal is somewhere else. So it was a huge, hugely important and learning experience for me. But uh, I couldn't continue it. So, and that is when I got a call from somebody who I had met in my during my master's days when he was doing PhD in Hamburg you know kind of coming to the same connection and elite bit that you were talking <laughs> about earlier and he is like the second or third employee in a new setup an enterprise called OP Jindal Global University and they're, they've just bought land they're just buying land and he calls me and you gang what do you want to do you want to help these uh, you know ICICI bank make money or you want to change the higher education landscape of India you know one of those proverbial <laughs> phone calls I'm like yeah I'm looking for a change I had never wanted to be an academic but uh, the vision that he shared and then I spoke to Raj who's the, who was the founding vice chancellor continues to be and you know I thought this is something else going on I mean back in 2009 think about it this way private universities were really looked down upon I mean even now for that matter but less so and here's a new private university emerging where Naveen Jindal has given a huge amount of money, but he said like, look, I don't have time, so you guys do it. So everything is being done by this small group of people. So here's the startup university, if I can use that term, that was in the offing. And I thought, let me lap it up. I wanted to go to Delhi anyway, away from Calcutta. And, and so I joined it. And that was a joyride. It was extremely, it was a hugely huge learning experience. We were working... 14 to 7, 18 hours every day. Uh, this was 2009 to 10. And it was amazing because we are trying to go to... So think about it this way, Amit. I'm going to some school kids. First of all, I'm telling them, don't do engineering. Do law. Then I'm telling them, even within law, don't go to national law schools, come to Jindal. And then here are the, here are the, op here are the factors that could drive your decision. What are the factors? Well, the faculty members are not quite old. They're very young, frankly. The university is in Haryana, a little away from Delhi. The construction is still going on, but it should be done by the time you join. The, you know, we don't have a placement record because you guys are going to be the first batch. <laughs> <laughs> and I trust, I promise that you'll do a good education. You know, the education will be good. And you have to pay five times what <laughs> any other expensive law school has. I mean, so are you out of your mind? Like, what is making you even ask this? So I think there was this conviction that what India needed was good quality education and people need to pay for education and not something else. And education driven through faculty. So, and uh, let me, let me take, I mean, this is an important segue here because, you know, universities in India have been good because the students have been good. You take IITs or IIMs or national law schools or any of the top universities in India, by and large, their expertise or their reputation their uh, aspirations lie at the level of brilliant students. And well, of course, students are going to be brilliant because out of lakhs of students, you're selecting 100. They have to be so bright. These are the kids who will do anything, who can do anything really well. They will be smarter than their teachers. And in Europe, I realized this, that, you know, teachers, I mean, their one hour of lecture is so full of knowledge that you don't want to miss even one minute of it and you want to listen to it and then, you know, prepare for the next lecture and so on and so forth. So can universities be driven through the intelligence of the faculty members 
and not just the students is the, it, there was this was the hypothesis we were trying to test and so the deal in jindal was we get the brightest minds to become faculty and let educational experience and learning be at the forefront not jobs or not anything else surely infrastructure but and in order to attract these bright kids to uh, bright minds to teach we need to pay them salaries that are competitive we need to get many of them who are otherwise teaching abroad or studying abroad to come to india and teach and you know many of these kids want to become teachers but they simply don't because the systems here and so that is what we were trying to test and frankly that test turned out to be quite so people are so you pay money for uh, uh, you know for education and not just uh, placements for that matter um anyway so 2012 i realized by 2 3 years we worked i was also you know helping them develop their international collaborations went and uh, went and ex- exposed myself to many other universities globally It was very very uh, useful learning lesson and 2012 i decided i want to do a doctorate because i want to be in academia went again secured the erasmus mundus scholarship returned i helped set up school school of liberal arts and, uh, when i so i returned back to jindal i helped set up their school of liberal arts and humanities in 2009 we were doing school of law business international affairs public policy um and then 2021 5 years after that i moved to flame university which is again one of the a few prominent prominent few private universities whose mandate is driven by the research and the pedagogy by their faculty members and you know students can benefit so the, so the idea is instead of collect instead of getting people who are at the 90 and making them 95 let's get people at 70 or 80 and make them 90 right so this is the premise on which these universities um, and now of course my research has moved um, significantly towards public policy so i i used to write in law reviews earlier after my phd I started writing in economics journals i continue to do that uh, but now i engage with the government extensively and work on public policy issues and areas my curiosity that I, that got triggered when i went abroad now has found a place in a major project that i'm doing in flame university where we are documenting district level statistics and district level cultures in india so despite being an economic economist and some sort of a public policy at least enthusiast i also take keen interest in um, cultural differences just too long perhaps uh, for an introduction no no not long enough i mean there are at least 40 things here i'm going to double click on and we can just talk about this part alone for hours but uh, i want to continue around that very important segue that you took where you spoke about education in the universities and all and i have a couple of questions here and the first of them is a broad conceptual question which is sparked by your insight that look a lot of those earlier colleges did well because they were selecting only the brightest right like karthik mulli tharan in his episode with me on education pointed out that over here what we do in our education system is it's it's not a system for teaching people stuff it's a system for sorting you sort out the best and the brightest and that's it and i have always thought that this is a freaking waste i have always thought that as i he queue that only the bright brightest people can learn engineering or medical why can't everybody freaking learn engineering or medical if they want to yeah. you know we should all have the, the scope to learn whatever the hell we want yeah. and uh, and therefore i love the fact that um, you know jindal and flame and some of these universities are taking that forward and saying it's not just about sorting and selecting the best no matter who comes here you know we are good enough we'll pr- pr- give you the knowledge and the insight and we'll make you good and that, that really strikes me and and i wonder therefore that you know is it that it is only in india that we think of it like this that uh, we start sorting people out or uh, is that mindset elsewhere also like even abroad there are only a limited number of people going to get into harvard and honestly a lot of that isn't even merit it's about you know donors kids and this and that and it's an extremely political system even there so how does one think about the democratization of education because on the one hand it is perhaps simplistic to say ki internet aa gaya hai wahan pe sab aap dal do courses dal do etc etc usse ho jayega no not quite because you need those that physical contact the networks and actual active human guidance and all of that is important equally i just feel that you know i can go online youtube has all of robert robert sapolsky's lectures on biology online mm-hmm. there is you know i'm currently doing um, harvard's iconic cs50 course in computer uh, science correct, which is free right all of these are free all of these are kind of available and 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 i think the biggest 
way to get rid of uh, you know the sort of speaking about egalitarian societies earlier the biggest way to make a society more egalitarian is just equalize and democratize access to education you know so what are sort of your thoughts on that so i you know this is this is a great point actually amit and i've learned it through my experience my work on higher education really comes through my experience in higher education rather than studying books on it actually and so this is something and so you're right i think sorting is a problem that he, Sorting is not a problem of principle. Sorting is a problem of resource. So you will need to sort if there are fewer places and there are more takers. So any society where this has been the case, sorting has taken over. So you know you have very few. I mean, China's meritocratic system, their entrance exam cultures predates uh, India's by so many centuries, and so even in Harvard for that matter. So sorting is not the problem. The problem is twofold. Problem is one problem is how do you sort? What may what is the factor that you use to sort people? and so if you are sorting based on how the person performs in a 3 hour test vis a vis sorting based on what has a person done in his or her own life uh, suddenly changes the equation so this is one the second you will need to sort if like i said earlier if there are fewer places so you in order to democratize education you the only option you have is to create better and larger supplies now between better and larger number of supplies larger is what we get better is what we don't get and that is why i said you know so enrollment rate for instance number of indian students getting into any college as a fraction of total number of students graduating class 12th this is called enrollment rate enrollment rate in india is now i think around 25 26% and the idea is by 2035 we should reach 50% when we were starting uh, back in 2009 or 10 we were starting jindal the enrollment rate was around 11% which means out of 100 indians graduating after class 12th only 10 or 11 at that time so basically uh, were going to college so basically our enrollment rate doubled did this doubling of enrollment rate lead to doubling of quote unquote collective intelligence of the society is a question we have to ask the answer would be i mean we would not be, i i personally would not be very excited with the answer because creation of new colleges and universities with respect to its infrastructure does not lead to creation of intelligence uh, so let me tell you two things one when when students are going to a university or a college which are where the teachers are those who are teachers because they could not get their best jobs then it will do very little to inspire these students so you know in my career i may have i must have given around 300 to 400 talks in schools and colleges alone uh, across the breadth of the country length and breadth of the country and one of the questions that i have consistently asked people is how many of you want to become teachers when you grow up and you know we say that india is a you know, unity in diversity and we have a long list of why we are unity in diversity there's one more point that i want to add to that list there is a unity in diversity in terms of how many of us want to become teachers practically none you know uh, very few hands would go up and then i would ask them if none of you want to become teachers how do you think we are going to get those inspiring teachers who are going to teach you or your kids in future and so we don't have good teachers or scholars because we have not created the ecosystem and that's a separate this is one point the second point is these kids when they join a college their goal and hope is to get a job which by the way is true for any developing country and i think we cannot ignore so i'm not going to be one of those idealist educationists who will say well forget about the jobs they need to be given skills so that they can learn but if if they are not inspired then they will not learn how to learn and i think in today's world i mean that's more important because whatever you learn by the time you graduate is going to be probably outdated right and you know you and i we don't need to dis- dis- discuss this so for us to democratize it we need to ask the first question the, the first principal question is what is a university for or what is a college for is it to give jobs yeah uh, or i mean so i mean if it is to give jobs then it is a, just supposed to be a sorting mechanism and by the way many colleges their degree their degrees don't carry that value so imagine one of the most important functions functions of a university was to signal the quality of intelligence right if i see a cv and i see what college you studied from should give me an impression about how intelligent you will be for doing this job if the universities have lost this signaling function that means they have simply become a sorting mechanism you get a degree and and so by the way so you know i am i sit on the academic advisory council of indian school of public policy and ispp located in new delhi um, is a one year or 11 month program which does not give a degree it's fairly expensive 
students flock towards it because it's not the requirement of a piece of paper that they need which certifies that they have gotten a degree it's about whether they have learned or not and so my my excitement in the last 10 years has not been because there are more universities being built because if they don't have good and inspiring teachers the students are not going to learn and we are again going to be in that rut of sorting because there are very few universities that you can build anyway but my excitement is with this change of attitude amongst indians that we don't need degree we need intelligence we need to cultivate intelligence through we need learning which is also something that chimes well with the corporate world so they are hiring people without them having a degree i mean the government sector remains separate so if i have to com- combine all these points and put them in bullets bullet point number 1 sorting is a result of demand supply gap we need to increase supply uh, supply means build more higher education institutions but two we cannot simply build them we need to create a powerful soft infrastructure it's not about hard infrastructure and to do that we need to get great teachers if we don't have great teachers these places will mean nothing in fact us um, and which is connected to this point which is the third point is because of the loss of signaling value of these universities we must be mindful of this second point even more just by building more and more universities we are not going to create you know the type of you know intellectuals intellectual class or cadre of uh, you know people who can be professionals and practitioners in future and therefore while my hope and you know when we were do, uh, we were working for jindal and even now in flame we do know that there have been some efforts where learning is more important because the focus is to get good teachers and then learning will happen i would have thought after the experience of jindal flame ashoka azim prem ji i would have thought there should be 50 such universities wh- which will focus purely on learning and get brightest of minds to teach not worry about the roi as much i mean roi needs to be worried about so you need to be sustainable but it but but that has not happened you know 3 years ago i think it was 3 years ago when we reached a tipping point in india when number of students in private universities exceeded those in public institutions and this was not noted in the media as much but i think it should have so now if if most most students in india are being educated in private universities and if most of them are not good where are we going then in that case so here's the point that i leave you with this question how do you know whether this private university is good or worth or desirable and this is not because you have now these two categories of private universities you have all these uh, mediocre institutions all around us and then you have these bunch of 5 6 that i just mentioned and the funny thing is Yeah, so I was doing this sort sorting off the private universities in a way, and I realized there are three or four factors that you really need to distinguish between these two. Almost all of them, all those factors will converge to this: that the owner or the promoter of the institution is not dependent on that institution for his or her own survival. So this is a nice proxy, huh? So if you find a university's owner or promoter does not, I mean, either because this guy is so big, or because this person has simply forgotten about the university. and it is run by institutional you know by faculty members and deans alone then that university is doing good a typical indian is desirous aspires to be in that private university if the promoter for his or her survival depends on this university i mean on paper all universities in india have to be not for profit but you know it's not, i mean it's, nothing is on paper always right and how do you how do you know whether this is going on well a i think faculty student ratio could be 1 is to 10 or 1 is to 12 very difficult for the mediocre private institutions to carry b the faculty salaries have to be fairly high because only high faculty salaries will encourage will encourage good people to come and this will only be done by those who are not sitting on the balance sheets you know because the institution is running by itself and you know we can think of which number um and there is a significant research budget so faculty publications per faculty per year in let's say scopus indexed a b degree journals like these are the these are the measures these measures i am not finding and so my, even though i am hopeful and excited about the future of india in terms of education i am not as excited as i was earlier because i would have thought 50 such institutions would have emerged in india i mean there's huge amount of wealth in this country now and thankfully one uh, so, you know thankfully we have been able to lift so many people out of poverty but many of these uh, big people big guys they have not translated into what we can call as really generous philanthropy because only that will be a, that will so it'll resolve the first problem which is more colleges and universities but also resolve the second problem which is you get really smart people to become teachers unless you have smart people becoming teachers 
it's then is just a you know building with some lights on thank god you're a teacher so i'm going to double click on more of what you said but before that i'm going to triple click or in a sense take a segue from a segue and when you mentioned that we are not sorting well we are sorting uh, you know according to the wrong parameters or metrics or whatever i want to double click on that because earlier when you were talking about your life the thought actually struck me that if i was sorting for success or trying to predict who will be successful i'll pick many of the things which are either circumstantial in your case or which seem inherent to you like for example you said when you applied for the erasmus uh, scholarship which another of my guest shruti rajgopalan has also done i think uh, perhaps a bit shruti and i were in the same batch actually you were in the same batch you were in the same batch <laughs> but we did not cross the same universities Scoundrels. so we hmm. went, uh, yeah but but we did meet in many of our you know common gatherings so oh great yeah yeah of course small world. small world again and yeah. you know going to your first question again as well yeah yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. see now i know both of you also so we are all kind of elites uh, but here's the thing you mentioned that when you applied for that one of the people who was on the selection panel later said that they chose you because they were like just impressed that you would apply and i'm equally impressed like if i was in his place i would immediately say ki isko lena hai because what that indicates is two things one is curiosity and two is initiative and i guess a third if i'm thinking aloud could be the, the 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 willingness to think outside of the box and i think all of these are sort of fantastic qualities and one of the questions i was going to double click on is whether that curiosity is inherent to you or to some extent it was helped along by the circumstances that you're simultaneously in so many different worlds like when you're in school you are Uh, half the day you could be milking the cow and all of those things and presumably you know talking in hindi and etc uh, etc et and it's a very different kind of cultural osmosis which i envy because sadly i was just in that english speaking bubble but the other half of the day you're exposed to another world and you know you pointed about how much you were reading and all of that and that's all open to you and equally then later when you go to nit you have people from all the different states which is a huge feature not a bug right yes. little harder to find your comfort zone maybe if you were just in a homogenous place but it's a huge feature because uh, you just learn so much and you just taken so much just by osmosis and what i would look at if i was sorting is one i would look to look at the level of curiosity and initiative and two which perhaps the applicant can't help but i would also look at this kind of broadness in their world experience that are they from a bubble and if they are from an elite bubble they probably don't need to join here anyway mm-hmm. but uh, are they from a bubble or do they have that variety of experience which i think automatically at some level means openness as well etc etc so what are sort of your thoughts on that both with regard to yourself and with regard to you know that you teach so many people is that something that like for me india's hope is young people from small cities because they've got energy openness and they're not hide bound yeah no i think this is great so i i mean i've thought about it frankly and i don't know the answer what makes me curious i mean so i do know that i am a very curious person because i i have cross navigated across these vertical silos of discipline in not just professionally but also in my own interest like you know for instance the type of books i've read but my curiosity coming from now that you're telling me in fact it's an interesting way to wrap up what i said but you know the way you wrapped it up in in a way my curiosity could be coming from my school experience where i'm reading you know i went to icsc that convent school was icsc board so i had so to read shakespeare I. you know original shakespeare books right you know um so i'm reading shakespeare I, the victorian I, I, I english i had to do julius caesar what did so you so we we did merchant of venice and tempest so those are the easy <laughs> okay, ones okay, yeah. as they say but you know i mean so you know you reading elizabeth in english and then you are talking in by the way i used to speak in braj bhasha and khadi boli not hindi beautiful, so to speak right yeah. so so i think that and then the nit experience so back in my back in the days when we were in college we used to lament of how we are sitting you know so i am from up in up the competitive culture for the entrance exam which i think is undesirable but it exists so we used to have good ranks but then there were other folks from other states which who did not have good national level rank but still so we used to lament you know we are sitting with these people who didn't do any coaching who didn't do any, who didn't study at all and they just came to the exam and they got like you know horrible ranks but still part of a but now i think it was so amazing like you said it's not a bug it's a feature actually and i actually feel that this type of this type of diversity in a classroom which goes beyond the score that you have in your exam is extremely important and i don't have any scientific study which i may have conducted with respect to my friends who went to iits and who did not have this diversity but i think so what you're saying makes me feel maybe this is what drove my curiosity further um but in principle i don't know if curiosity is inbuilt or it can be cultivated so i really don't know 
what i do know is that it can be killed <laughs> if you know if uh, if it is at all inherent then the system can create you know uh, systems can make huge amount of effort to kill to kill uh, uh, creativity or curiosity uh, you know children are the most curious and then you know what happens as they grow up it's like we are intelligent despite education not because of it in a way so that's definitely one part but the other part is that if you were, if someone is to sort what are the ways through which they can look at so you say the diversity of experience is one of those interesting parameters that you could potentially you know see so you're right i think anyone with more diverse experience will probably have a little bit more to add in the on the table at least in the classroom let's say so i'll give you two three two examples perhaps one is that i know a lot about uh, what is happening in the world because in my in the classes that we used to sit both in nit as well as in my masters and phd the comments came from a perspective that i would never think about because these guys are in a different part of part of the world and for them this something matters and the same thing goes to me i mean as an as an indian i have to say we were or at least i was you know a little bit reserved in terms of speaking my mind compared to compared to others and you know part of this confidence comes from your skin color you know particularly when you're first generation you know indian going abroad and things like that but i could i so i could see that different kinds of uh, frameworks coming together like when i went to europe i was told that you know of course if you're walking by the car has to stop and that came to me as a surprise like well, well the road is meant for the cars isn't it that's what i grew up thinking about i was like no but this is not how it's supposed to be in fact uh, so for instance in netherlands they have strict liability against any injury if you do it against pedest- against a pedestrian or a cyclist so you know no matter who's fault so there's not fault based liability in tort anyway so in some ways that is very useful but the flip side to this and i mean this is something i'm seeing in the last few years i don't know what is your uh, impression on it because western universities th- look at diversity a little bit too seriously folks definitely you know in india and maybe even other parts of the world they fabricate the type of diversity they've had in their lives in their statement of purposes so as to get you know brownier points in their selection when they apply to western universities or american universities let's say so you will you will probably have you know this this girl or a boy the quote and quote elite who will say how you know the person is uh, has suffered because of some emotional violence at the hands of you know let's say because the person belongs to a minority community right um, or they will say because the parents are having uh, you know they're going through separation so they will so while i don't want to belittle this but this type of sympathy that their statement of purpose draws in the hope of expressing a level of diversity that they've gone through is something and, and by the way the american university the selection uh, people who you know selection panels they now are able to get this as well so they're trying to find some other proxies in order to find out who can be smart so you know one of these uh, amazing thing that i'll tell you somebody told me who met, who meets this american university's admissions head and this guy is telling him you know what many students are applying from pune you know to our engineering school and so you know uh, so he said yeah that's great actually pune has a lot of good you know intelligent engineers he said but you know what we we are never able to figure out who is the best because they're all very good and their statement of purposes are all very shiny so now we have found a proxy and that proxy is a very funny proxy but we have realized that that works very well in terms of our past students and what is that proxy you is amit you this will shock you okay so here's the proxy that this american university has figured out to find out the student ha- will be good in future in our college or not second semester score in mathematics during their engineering college days why is that the case i don't know but he's looking at the past data and this person is saying that somebody who has scored very well in second semester mathematics in their engineering college in pune is has somehow turned out to be a good student here in the last few years and so now we whenever in doubt we just see that score wow now anyway <laughs> coming back to the point that i was making is that i will obviously go and you know advocate for this sorting to be done in a more holistic manner because you know what if you're sick for those 3 hours when you're giving an exam you know all kinds of things and of course your life experiences make you more curious but because students can con the system as well this has to continuously change this sorting method which is more holistic cannot remain fixed because if it remains fixed you know just like election systems it'll be game you know then then it'll be game so i strongly think uh, you know sorting has to happen in a more holistic manner the problem is in india is people so many people who apply the sorting becomes very difficult but through 
smart proxies like this or through thankfully the help of machine learning and the large language models maybe that can also be sorted better but any day life experiences count more and in india actually we have a lot more heterogeneous life experiences by and large right so yeah you know you totally destroyed that particular proxy because everybody who is in engineering in pune in the second year now is going to say ki math karo second year important <laughs> you know hedge your bets do your math no and i totally agree with you and it's something that i feel strongly about and i'll use it to lead on to my next question that sometimes there is a danger one can make a fetish of diversity in the sense that a i feel that more diversity is good i think i came across this study in philip tetlock's book super forecasting where he talks about how the biggest predictor of good decision making is not intelligence or education but diversity you mm-hmm. have a yeah. room with diversity of viewpoints especially you're going to get better decision making because you have people coming at a problem from different places but i think what is also happening across the world is you know one reason when i speak about wokeness i say that wokeness begins where liberalism ends because liberalism is all about individual rights and individual freedom and individual autonomy whereas wokeness jals brings narratives around group rights where everything is about victimhood and oppression every single thing you look at through the lens of victimhood and oppression and when you do that you have what i find as a kind of victimhood olympics going on where people are you know trying to figure out as many ways in which they can yeah. be victims as possible yeah. and that leads to exactly what you're pointing um, out to and and i think that is cancerous but regardless of that particular cancer one thing that i find is true of academia and our mutual friend ajay shah and i in an episode of everything is everything about the knowledge society spoke about this as well is that originally you look at universities as something absolutely beautiful it is a way to discover knowledge it is a way to disseminate knowledge etc etc you are in the knowledge game but what has increasingly happened over the last few decades is that it has become a self referential game with no connection to the real world it has become a kind of a circle jerk where you have academics talking to other academics as they enter deeper and deeper silos and uh, you know no connect with the real world again and a lot of the incentives are screwed like a constant lament of ajay's and i could to agree with him more is some of our brightest minds are lost playing that academic circle jerk game this phrase is mine not ajay's uh, are lost playing that game because it all becomes a question of you know you get tenure by publishing set number of papers and set number of journals and there will always be ideologies which are fashionable at a particular point in time and therefore you have to cater to those and you don't get funding if you move outside of that you know narrow band of acceptable or fashionable ideas and it seems to me that what is happening in the west uh, and we have perhaps seen this with recent events in america as well is that Acad- a the academy has lost a lot of its respect among the common people just as con market liberals have and uh, there is good reason for that and to it's more and more sort of ossified and not relevant to the real world anymore you've completely lost the purpose so how do you think about this and especially how do you think about this in the context of building a university ecosystem in india that doesn't fall prey to the same trap so i mean brilliant uh, brilliantly put actually and i i think i couldn't agree more either the so it's an echo chamber we often call the university you know discourses as echo chambers and i think a lot of it is driven through the politics of publication the journal you know the journal editors you simply cannot write so it, during your tenure you simply cannot write let's say in economics anything against rcts because your uh, you know the tenure committee will in- definitely include one of these people and they will not and so your your papers imp- will not be accepted by top journals and so on and so forth but by the way this has been the this has been the case ever since like you know elites when they capture they would like people like them who would uh, you know the gate they become the gatekeepers so they will only want their kins to join the group and so i don't think that is really the princ- the, the principle at the principal level that's not the problem because elites always want people like them the problem is in the with the rise of social media this problem has magnified to at a different level so i'll tell you uh, what has happened into uh, you know by, by giving two two examples example one when i was doing my phd in fact that was not too long long ago in fact when i was doing my bachelor's or my masters at that time the scope and access of google scholar was far less limited far limited compared to today so today i can really f- go to google scholar and find out literally everything that has been published which is of any worth now on the internet which makes my publication so it allows me to publish faster when you can f- publish faster you will also publish trash 
because at some point in midway through your paper when you realize oh this is not a good argument you will not quit you'll say oh well might as well just funny finish it and send it to some journal because i'm looking at one more b category journal in my cv and i'll do it uh, 20 years ago if i realize the argument is flawed and there's some scholar who has already done this i will probably not continue with it because my opportunity cost is very high the more time because my paper turning is going to take long time so therefore what has happened is that with the large number of uh, journals with a large number of you know pe- uh, with a la- with a greater focus on publications by universities people have resorted to quote unquote conning the system as well so they will publish garbage after garbage in some journals which are not top a grade but as long as they match certain criteria let's say in scopus index or somewhere they will secure some standing for giving points to the author right and so therefore all the incentives for a for a scholar for a university professor is or a tenured you know person in tenure track is to keep publishing no matter what uh, some people will focus only on the top quality and this doesn't mean that everywhere quantity is all that matters in fact in good universities only quality is mat- quality matters but there the problem is different you will create uh, so Uh, this is one group of scholars who are publishing somewhere this is definitely a huge loss to society because they are writing something which is totally useless because by even even by their own account they'll probably never even uh, you know discuss this paper with people because they know that there is a problem and you know you and i we, i mean we know social science is a bunch of ideologies also it's not i mean i don't know why social science is called as science i think i mean there is nothing scientific about it force equals to mass into acceleration is not <laughs> equal to how society is for instance but anyway that's for another another uh, you know debate so this is one group of people how smart people doing this because the ugc requires it or their publication requirement requires it they're just doing it second group of scholars who are doing trying to do it only in the the most amazing and the most sort of uh, sought after journals which which uh, which emphasize quality over quantity the problem is they are sometimes surely they make good arguments but they're also making arguments which are absolutely brilliantly internally consistent but with less relevance to the outside world right um this is a criticism that economic theory has received significantly you know complex mathematical models is like as if economists want to be like physicists and physicists of course laugh at them that look you can't be like us so if you pick up one of the you know journal articles from i don't know american economic review you will find a lot of these papers regurgitating some high math which makes very powerful internally consistent argument but the extent to which it could be used by let's say a policy maker is far limited so it's like a brilliant guy telling the other brilliant guy look this is a brilliant argument that no one else can understand this disease by the way has percolated across all social sciences so if you read a paper in um, any other relatively more accessible discipline like sociology let's say you will find terminologies and nomenclatures used which make a very simple concept look really heavy now of course this can be defended because they'll say well there are so many layers to it if you use the word certain type of word but frankly it's not really needed and so they become so it's like creating barriers to entry because the more barriers to entry there are the you know more uh, desirable your profession is in some ways which which is like sad because the real purpose of this person being a scholar is so that he or she could translate some of the wisdom to an uh, you know to an audience who would otherwise not be able to access it so so the so this group of people who are really writing well um, you know by the way let me, uh, i'm just reminded of very uh, very quickly i'm reminded of this paper published in american economic review in 2015 by two sociologists and the title of the paper is the superiority of economists <laughs> and the so the so in the in the paper they're trying to argue why are is it that economists feel superior and why is it that why is that the case if it if at all and you know one of the things that they're showing is that they are most insular in terms of their collaborations with non economics uh, you know ideas or non economics journals so co-authors of economists are often economists which is not the case in many other disciplines and things like that anyway you know just it occurred to me to 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 emphasize how economics as a discipline mean, i i'm talking more on economics because that's the, my own discipline in a way and you know like mr b and i am kind of self deprecating in many ways with respect to my my discipline the so this group which is publishing in really good journals often is publishing arguments which have a very strong internal in, internal consistency but may have less relevance to the outside world and i mean one defense to this is well we are writing for for um, you know technical audience it is the job of many others to translate into accessible policy conclusions and suggestions and tell the world but the other thing is how many of them are actually writing about things which are really the pressing need of society like we are facing wicked problems today right uh, we, we are talking about wicked problems those problems do not necessarily assume center stage in the mind of this bright chap who's in a university 
tenured position so this person is writing let's say how social ordering is done or is organized but not writing about let's say public procurement public procurement i mean ordinary indians are suffering from public procurement the ordinary indians are also suffering from uh, let's say social ordering but social ordering is intellectually very stimulating public procurement is really boring so we have taken these bright brilliance to you know folks away from quote and quote public procurement to quote and quote social orders so they'll keep on churning newer and newer articles which will make a lot of intellectual sense but to us a joint secretary or a politician it has absolutely no meaning over a long period of time perhaps uh, hopefully some changes will happen and by the way those changes will not necessarily happen by academics alone they will happen through these politicians and through these policy makers or bureaucrats and you know connectedly something that came to my mind those who work in in a particular discipline during their phd days and then they continue working a little bit longer in that uh, you know in their defense it becomes very difficult for them to change the discipline as well so i know many people who in the in the middle of their career feel that they wish they had worked on something which was more tangible which could have directly impacted some policy issue but now that their cv has been built in a particular direction you know the path dependency is so high so switching cost becomes very high so i think at some level if we have to puncture this cycle so you know it has to be punctured at the level of doctoral supervision so because the the same person when he or she becomes a doctoral supervisor will only encourage his or her student to write something which he or she has been working on or the ideas that he or she has been developing and so it's kind of a self fulfilling loop where i study let's say i don't know i study gender relations society my doctoral students study gender relations society they also study gender relations society you know so on and so forth but for instance for them to pick up an issue of let's say has banning of alcohol led to a better society for women is a question that will escape them probably because this is not or maybe it doesn't escape them what i'm trying to say is that a more technical issue which requires large churning of data might simply escape them because so if it's only at a very at a phd supervision level where a doctoral supervisor needs to be mature enough to advise his or her student to do a project that has a tangible relevance in society and can i tell you something amit i know even though this may not be apparent university professors they are of course happy when a you know when something gets published by them in a good journal they are happier when one of their ideas is picked up by the government they are actually happiest so relevance is something that they also miss but the way the system is designed the incentive structure is designed very few will have that courage to step aside and not go into the publication route or at least remain in publication route for being relevant quote and quote in their cv value but also be relevant in their policy or you know impact value for that matter there's a great essay by the philosopher agnes callard which i'll uh, uh, link from the show notes about why is academic writing so turgid and even though she's a philosopher you will be pleased to know that her answer has everything to do with econo- uh, economics it's about incentives where she's just pointing yeah, out that yeah. look if you're on the tenure track you have to write for a particular set of journals there's a particular kind of insider lingo you have to go for and the problem there like you mentioned part dependence the problem there is that that language then becomes the only language you use and the only right. language you think in and you know complex complicated muddied language leads to complicated muddied thinking you know there was a time where i would read something and not understand it and i would think the problem is me yes. today i know the problem is not me yes. if something reads like nonsense it is nonsense i don't need to you know gaslight myself for yes, it yes. and uh, all the great writers and all the great thinkers are absolutely clear in their very, writing very simple in fact let me add quickly i'm sorry to interrupt mm. here it just occurs to me when you look at the course manuals of many of uh, you know professors who prescribe it to the students and you may remember from your own days it looks like as if every professor wants to make the students into a professor and what's the point of uh, you know giving uh, uh, heavy duty journal articles when the idea is to enhance the capabilities and the faculties of mind by giving ideas that can inspire uh, if they're not even accessible and i'm talking about ug first year let's say or second year for that matter this doesn't mean that journal articles should not be prescribed i think they should be but this doesn't but but to think that we should only prescribe journal articles um, i think it does it does a lot of harm to you know incoming class who's really i mean st- students in the first year are the most motivated uh, bunch of uh, communities that you can find in the world they are out of school out of home coming to college first year and then uh, you know they need to be given ideas that are accessible so that they can think beyond what their minds would otherwise allow and this is exactly what it is and 
partly i think it's great that you mention about uh, about this incentive structure because it's not that they're deliberately they're trying to do this it's just the, the it's st- rational it's rational actually it's rational for them yes correct have you read timur kuran's book the long divergence of course of course yeah yeah yeah, yeah. so it's i, I the you know brilliant ones yeah it's a brilliant book and you were speaking about the intersection of law and economics and that yes. is just such a so illuminating in that and i thought of timur because he did an episode with me and he echoed many of these thoughts where he was talking about how today he would not be able to do the kind of work he did because he would not be allowed to write about the middle east or about islam because he's of course writing in a very nuanced way and today that kind of nuance is not appreciated you can yes. you know you can't look at the Gray as no, you in fact, uh, you know, I met Timur several years ago. In fact, I met him the year I was planning to join my doctoral program. So he has had some influence on me because not just his book, but also you know, the the way in which he he tries to persuade you in a soft way. And and you know, I mean, he's absolutely right. I think. In fact, I prescribe some of his articles to my my own students. So great that you brought him up. Yeah, you mentioned insularity, and that also, you know, what you said about economists, it really strikes me because to me, the one mark of a mediocre mind is if you just stay in your lane. You know, the best thinkers I know are just multidisciplinary. They are trying to they are going all over the place, which is why Ajay and I called our show. Everything is everything. Everything is everything. Yeah, exactly. You know, where is the Renaissance man? And I want to now sort of. Put the focus back on you, and here's my question. So, uh, I have a very dear friend called Suya Shrai. You might know him, Carnegie India. Uh, and uh, so yash did an episode with me where he told me this beautiful story which touched me a lot i may forget the details but the broadly the story is correct which is that he wasn't privileged when he was young to be able to read a lot and so on and so forth so when he did his first job i think it was somewhere in baroda uh, he got his first salary of 7000 rupees or something like that which at the time would have been worth a little bit more than today so he just went to a bookshop and he told the owner that i have this much money you take it all i don't know what books to buy i want to educate myself you pick something for me and wow. then the gentleman spent a few hours picking something wow. picking books for him i think it's such a beautiful inspiring story because these are the kind yes. of people who really you know go ahead i mean this is what i would select for yes. and it also shows that hunger for learning and so my question to you is tell me about your early hungers I I know a lot about all the things that you are passionate about today. You know, from your book, I understand you've thought deeply about elections, and we'll talk about that. You've spoken about your current work, and hopefully, we'll speak about that also. Tell me about your early hungers, the rabbit holes you dive down. What were you really passionate about? Wow. Okay. So I haven't thought about it. So let me give it a try. So my father used to. I I think one of the earliest memories that I have of picking up things that I would never do is that I would typically not do is my father used to work in uh, Kenra Bank. and you know there used to be this magazine banks magazine that would be uh, sent to you know some bankers and it used to be called as shreyas and the magazine is nothing but basically many bank branches telling about what they've done right they're singing songs on praise of their own glory of how many accounts they opened and what uh, what did they do and there i so i mean we didn't have many books to read so i would so i would actually wait for shreyas to come and i would just read what bank branches are doing and it would it would be the most boring thing in some sense right uh, but then there would be pictures of somebody you know cutting a ribbon and you know and because kenra bank is headquartered in bangalore i would read a lot about i would read south indian names a lot which would uh, kind of impress me i'm talking about like really you know in my school probably in my you know class 1 2 or 3 or something mm-hmm. and then and then on the last two few pages there used to be some fiction that bankers have written right so there used to be some competition submit some story and so there's a banker who's you know maybe a writer he's sending a story they they used to be in english and hindi and uh, those i hooked on to sometimes poems folks would write fictional stories maybe sometimes non fictions from their own bra- branches so i think that is and it was surprising for my dad because i am reading something which uh, is otherwise a very boring thing so that's definitely one thing that comes to my mind the other you know inspiring things that i went down the rabbit hole with is are these two three you know uh, two three magazines that would come during the 90s if you remember uh, nandan and champak do you do you remember them i remember champak very well i don't remember nandan so well but i've heard the name so champak used to be like you know they would uh, uh, they would personify animals right and all these so the stories about animals and you know so it's kind of fun right so these are animals who have their own kingdoms and they're talking to each other wearing human clothes and things like that nandan used to be all about fairy tales you know there's sort of some prince uh, some uh, jadugar and things like that so that used to have uh, a huge amount of uh, you know i used to have a lot of fun like i would read them cover to cover and then there were a bunch of uh, you know comic books uh, which were all in hindi by the way um, i 
didn't speak english until much later so that and then i think our own texts particularly the hindi texts i would say you know poems and stories by premchand for example so when i read premchand for the first time i must have been in what i think class 5 6 or 7 i don't remember now exactly uh, and my you know we used to have that um, you know premchand's uh, famous story book in my house i i read it i don't know how many times and then uh, some of his novels i don't remember much of it because that was all in my school but i do remember so the type of you know so think about it this way amit i'm growing up in a very rustic environment and my school is extremely elite which is you know an english speaking for, you know full of priests and um, and nuns and uh, you know you, you can be fined if you speak in hindi you know that type <laughs> of school right uh, you know strict ones like dead poet society type story and was by the way only boy school uh, set up by british in 1846 actually it predates the first war of independence wow. um and so i would not be very proud of you know my home in order to be able to even invite my friends because they all came from different you know better probably economic class and things like that so so though so premchand allowed me to appreciate where i am from actually because he's writing about these ordinary stories of indians maybe uh, maybe that's why i liked him uh, liked his writing and so on and so forth and then of course there are many poems that we would read in in poetry maitri sharan gupt or jayashankar prasad so i think these and then my general inclination to you know debate in school take part in quiz led me to you know go deeper into understanding about the world so at that time when there was no internet there so there was a bunch of friends of mine in school we used to just talk to each other extensively over fun things and uh, somebody would tell me about some history about some king and that would pick my interest so in fact i if i were to say that i learned as much from outside the books as much from within i would not be wrong and this is something that i'm thinking loudly with you with the, you know uh, when you pose this question it was through what people are telling me and oh and by the way i would i would read the entire newspaper every day we used to subscribe to dainik jagran at that time you know i would in fact sometimes it wouldn't come at home so we would i would go to shops in the area i would sit with the some tauji some uncle you know all every, all the shopkeepers knew me and we knew each other you know it's like an old part so i would sit there and i would read it and i would listen to their stories they would tell me all kinds of stories so i think that so in a way i learned more informally with whatever i could lay my hands on than formally uh, other than my school text obviously than formally when you know some book is coming to me when some uh, you know one book is leading me to go for another book which is leading me to go for another book so in other words i don't think it's the vertical bar of t through which i learned it's the horizontal bar of t the english alphabet t mm-hmm. uh, so i uh, i mean maybe that's a way i can put it so so yeah i mean th- uh, so uh, i don't know if i have answered your question maybe there was no rabbit hole that i went deep into but there were many holes that i went in and came out of no this is very illuminative because in your book you, you know you mentioned premchand you meant you've in your book in the up chapter i think you've mentioned a story kafan yes. which is basically for the sake of my listeners it's about this impoverished father and son and 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 uh, the, the mother the, the, the gentleman's wife is dead and uh, they don't have money to buy a shroud or a kafan for her so they go begging for money and eventually somebody takes pity on them and they manage to get the money and this father and son spend it all drinking and uh, you point out that this is like the story of up and that blew my mind yes. because it is right and it is and it also tells me that it, in this there is also an education that in a story like this you arrive at this deep truth and all the learning in the world and all the data in in, in the world may not express it as beautifully yeah. as this yeah. so it strikes me that again this is such a great illustration of how when you expand your uh, sort of where you're taking an art from and all of that you kind of do you feel that you know many of your colleagues and many of the people you studied with and all of that would be people i would say people of privilege who have not had this privilege of taking in content in the languages and have had the kind of the kind of education i lament having where fine you get the best of the west but that is all you get and uh, you know i had once done an episode with shruti she had written a paper on it also with alex tabarok on isomorphic mimicry that isomorphic mimicry would basically be that they are you know policy makers are taking a policy that has worked in the west and they are using it here but 
this is a different place it is a different context it worked there doesn't mean it will work here and in a broader sense beyond a point of policy application i think a mistake many people make is they will bring frames of the west to bear on india for example in politics whenever people go on about the right and the left the right and the left i'm like and you've also lamented it in the book and i've just been scratching my head for years that this this is this sheds no light at all it is you know absolutely not uh, useful so what is your sort of sense of this when you look around you do you think that this is sort of a problem that having a western education going abroad getting these degrees at good colleges on the one hand you get the state of the art education which is not available to you if you are just studying in a mofasil college over here but at the same time that you to understand your country and your people better you know you need all that no I, this is you've touched the touch the nerve i mean this is something that i have been thinking through so deeply for so many years because so i think many indians go through this experience which is where they have gone at least now for that matter uh, because you know many people who were otherwise growing up in an underprivileged if not underprivileged at least non elite ecosystem have now started to you know and so in a way there were many school friends of mine who i would put in this category but they may not have thought through this because of the compulsions of their you know living and uh, you know being busy with the world but be- being an academic it allows me the liberty to think uh, and reflect and compare these reflections with other such reflections and i think one of the things that i have really that, that i have realized and i say this with a lot of responsibility and i've said this in many fora you know the in india i have realized this that the more you study the more degrees you take the less you are connected to people you have grown up with actually or you are the less connected you are to your childhood in a way and i'm using the word chi- i'm using childhood in a very metaphoric way so you know somebody who does bachelor's and then masters and then phd maybe another doctorate will this person be able to sit in the in the house of the rickshaw puller who used to take him to the school when he was a child um, i don't know in fact many of his school friends childhood friends would be people he or she may not be in touch with for that matter and so you disconnect from your from your uh, roots uh, because maybe your roots were non elite and now you're an elite uh, and education is making you an elite in some ways right and i think that is an aspiration actually that they want to be elite but i thought the whole purpose amit of education was to connect you to your communities but we have we have ended up being exactly the, we have ended up doing exactly the opposite and i'll tell you an instance which um, happened early in my life which at that time it didn't matter much to me obviously but now when i reflect so i remember very distinctly i think it was class 5 or 4 when i or 6 i don't remember but exactly but the incident was that my teacher my geography teacher uh, she taught us solar eclipse and lunar eclipse for the first time and i had grown up in a household where obviously eclipses are religious phenomenon you have to follow certain rules and customs can't eat during the day eclipse can't sit on the bed you know you and, and i think most indians have have depending on which community you come from you know you always have some religious customs which you have to follow and this is the first time i realized that eclipse is nothing but uh, you know earth you know, the planet coming in between sun and the moon and the moon is disappearing because there's a shadow and that's that's all about it i mean there's nothing there's there's definitely something celestial about it but not something religious about it and you know we we've been hearing rahu and ketu come and they you know take take over they they swallow you know the planet and so you have to pray to these uh, you know demons or 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 uh, or gods whichever way you want to put it demons and gods with a small d and small g you know mm-hmm. anyway i come home and uh, you know i tell my dadi you know what's going on like you know you you guys have been just fooling around this is quote unquote superstition superstition is a word that we in india learn very soon and uh, you know and then i remember you know eclipse taking place and i am not i'm defying all her uh, requests i am watching the eclipse through that x ray sort of print and you know things like that now well what will she respond you know i am the educated one i whatever she responds is not going to go through my rational mind and she is the irrational one but by this logic millions of indians are irrational actually in fact they and these are the same people who are otherwise running banks who are otherwise doing businesses they are somehow meant, you know surviving making sure their families are you know well fed and kids grow and they you know they're raising families and they're also behaving this hugely irrational way in fact you know ak ramanujan has this interesting essay which goes by the name by the title is there an indian way of thinking in which he's saying is there an indian way of thinking is there an indian way of thinking 
is there an indian way of thinking is there an indian way of thinking so he's and and the question he starts with is his father is a scholar but he's also an idol worshipper like most indians are and he what can't get over his head is how is this possible that my father who's otherwise a great scholar of math and sanskrit i forget the subject though uh, he is wearing a janeu and in the morning he is chanting some mantras to a stone which he hopes to you know be a very you know a stone which he believes to be god and whose uh, whose praise is necessary for him to do in his life because he's supposed to be a rational man and there's something that we've all gone through right i think when we are growing up we look at all of our parents and grandparents as people who are just sort of little irrational in their behavior this irrationality is a very uniquely indian thing right otherwise rational person behaving irrationally when the person is sitting in front of god so this i'm coming back to the question on education in terms of whether we are you know western education uh, so of course western education will make it look like as if this is but there's not western education solar eclipse is solar eclipse it's actually true in some ways and uh, so so what is it either my grandparents are foolish or they're intellectual imbeciles or what teacher told me is wrong that now we know that what teacher told me is not wrong how do i make sense of my foolish grandparents then who are otherwise intelligent in raising a family in some ways so this is what western education is it's not about studying shakespeare i mean frankly i mean we can talk about that another time perhaps but you know indian students reading shakespeare english elizabethan english which is not spoken and understanding about england of 17th century is like english students studying premchand for that matter i mean uh, will it will it not be so bizarre that if english students are prescribed premchand in translated premchand will it be so bizarre for them to learn I mean, we still continue to do shakespeare well, i mean premchand is 20th century so actually more uh, relevant I actually it will be yeah. more relevant to them yeah, frankly yeah? yeah but i'm not saying so this is one criticism that western education has is that you training kids in con- things which are not part of their context but the problem is you are not training them in their context so th- what happens is so my problem with western education or western uh, education that was inspired through western ideals is not as much as what they bring on the table but what they take away from the table because there is an opportunity cost of doing something so this is some form of that epistemic violence that gandhi spoke about when new knowledge comes it destroys old knowledge because you can i mean typically you can have different types of knowledges coexist but the way it has happened in india is that the other knowledge has gone away and therefore when it is coming now in terms of revising histories and revising our cultural studies and so on and so forth it is coming with some sort of quote unquote vengeance some sort of an aggressive you know uh, it's coming with as if a volcano has opened up because for for many decades the understanding of india in the context of india was missing from our textbooks so i was told that this is how solar and lunar eclipses happen but i but there was no discourse at all if at all there was uh, on why do we do what we do then who will explain me that why is i mean because the only thing that comes out of this experience is that my grandparents are you know kind of foolish people who haven't gone to school so they don't know reality they're just being told by some uh, you know brahmin or some pandit oh this is what happens and they just tend to believe it. but frankly they're not foolish because they if they were foolish they wouldn't have been able to raise my father and me for instance right and so this is my this is my problem when you create a new framework to understand the world it takes away the existing frameworks or it does not allow newer frameworks to emerge in fact this is one of the biggest problems of colonization it did not allow newer types of modernities to emerge we only think there is only one way to develop i mean i mean think about it this way and this might be a sort of a, a tangent but let me you know put it on the on the table because this is important you see if we have to match america american per capita income by 2047 let's say you know depends on what type of method you use but by and large you will need to grow at a rate of around 10 to 12% maybe 11 plus minus 1 or 2% depending on how you're calculating it and assuming us is growing at let's say 2% between 1 and 2% now i mean you and i we can agree on this 11% interest in uh, sorry 11% growth rate for another 20 years i mean how can a country have this much of stamina this of course doesn't mean that we need to if it's not 11% next year we won't reach that level it certainly doesn't mean that if we have it we will reach it's an average but this is a humongous task and if this and then also we are only reaching american per capita income put it differently if every indian gets a car and probably the size of the car that every american has it's very hard to negate that that aspiration will you and i not like every indian to have a car well maybe we will but is this possible 
like how many roads have we got what is the total surface area of india if every indian has a car it's going to be physically impossible for them to place it on the, on the on so are we saying that indians should not have a car i mean this is a tricky one are we saying that because we can't grow at 12% per annum for next 25 years consistently we won't reach up to that growth but why am i why, why am i making these statements i'm saying this because we don't know what is an alternative model of development this is the only model we know right now the point is not this the point is when colonize when colonization happens the biggest violence that colonization does is that colonized start thinking like the colonizer it's not territorial expansion that is the violence so surely that is but this is a much greater violence and you know the way this happens is well the frameworks through which the colonizers live intellectually the frameworks they use to explain the world are the frameworks that we start using to explain our world our worlds are different so we cannot use those frameworks just the other day i gave a lecture somewhere in, you know in in pune where i where i discussed how more than 90% of india's workforce is informal in nature that does not sit on a written contract and property rights framework more than 90% if you include agriculture if you take away agriculture it's still 60 to 70% this is our experience economic models do not explain this economic models explain us the demand supply curves for that matter explain us part of the world which is not central to our being and so what we do is surely we should study them because you know this is a globalized world but we do not have alternative models to explain or understand we have them in economics but they're relegated to some footnote or some box at the end of the chapter the problem of westernized education is we are unable to explain the world in our own language we don't have vocabulary and you know when you don't have vocabulary that is the worst because you don't have access to your own experience so i my experience is that in solar and lunar eclipse i should not be sitting on the bed for instance let's say but i don't have a vocabulary to explain this i'll give you one more, one example that that might uh, chime chime with you you know in puja in hindi is typically understood as worship in english right now because a prayer would be prarthana let's say right so puja is worship so if i have to translate i am mai puja kar raha hu you know i am worshiping for that matter now now listen now now see 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 what it does to us we you and i and any indian knows this that when we enter a house we do bhumi pujan when we buy a car the pandit or we do a puja of the car so you know somebody buys a bicycle wo bicycle ka puja ho raha hai vishwakarma day we do a small puja of our you know tools for instance can we say that i am worshiping my car when i buy a car because worshiping has to happen to the creator of the universe now am i in some sense of the word considering my car to be the creator of the universe of course it can't be the case so if i'm not doing so then to a western mind this is stupid like how can you worship a car this this is the most stupid thing that you can do this is this guy is otherwise a rational guy but he's worshiping a car and slowly you will think oh well yeah i think we are intellectual imbeciles we just don't know but the problem is we so, you know what is going on here we are not able to access our experience because we don't have that vocabulary we don't have the vocabulary because the frameworks do not allow us and these frameworks are western in nature in in an abrahamic in an abrahamic faith worshiping has to be done to creator of the universe not to you know let's say an inanimate object like this so sorry for being a little lengthy here but the point i'm trying to make is western education is not about the content in my view i think that content is useful it is welcome it is necessary in fact i would in fact let me put it with big bold letters thank god we have some western education as well because it has led to a huge amount of empowerment that was otherwise missing in this country but it has replaced the both if at all there were some frameworks that existed but it has replaced the possibility of those frameworks to emerge and that is why today when you see the clash between east and west intellectual clash you find that the that the west has a solid theoretical framework and grounding in the frameworks that they develop and the east or the non west or we do not have a framework but we are only reacting oh well no this is not related to indian culture how can you say this well because there has there has been no development in terms of the framework itself and that i think we are missing because we never had any 
Really wise words and please never talk about being too lengthy for this show this is a one show where you cannot be too lengthy you know I'll read out this passage from your book which you reminded me of when you spoke about uh, you know when the colonizers start thinking like colonizers so over here you write quote we cannot help but remind ourselves here of Ashish Nandi's brilliant weaving of an argument in his book The Intimate Enemy a nation does not colonize when it physical physically terror realizes a nation forgive my pronunciations it colonizes when the colonized start thinking like the colonizer and begin adopting the value system of the colonizer india has been a real colony in not just continuing with most of the codes laws and bylaws that the british had drilled down through the last century but also in the choice of the form of government the new leadership which was indian in blood remained english in thought a uh, stop quote and of course you carry on and i had a recent episode with orgosh and gupto on this also he's written a book about you know the colonial constitution and he was criticized for the title but the title seems incredibly apt to me because we use the same infrastructure for uh, rule ruling the people as it were and i use the word ruling with uh, some thought as the, the british did for oppressing us that is how it was and i loved that example that you gave of doing puja around a car because i mean i'm atheist i don't uh, you know do any kind of puja but i love the thought of that because to me when you're doing puja for a car it is a ritual of gratitude it is a reminder that these things are important you know and if that is the only purpose that it serves it's a big purpose and it is a purpose that without that ritual you may have normalized it or not taken it for granted or whatever that thought of doing puja to your tools is beautiful i love my tools so deeply you know the microphone that you're looking at right now the laptop even the apps i use like rom research i would do puja to them if i was a puja doing person and it seems to me here that the primary sin is not so much western education per se or even rationality the primary sin is that judgment when you go back to your grandmother and you say oh you are superstitious yes. or when you look down on someone who believes differently and you say what a superstitious fool this is you know this is a scientific way of thought and etc etc and i think that is also what breeds resentment yes. because you have especially in india for so long the elites passing judgment not just in matters of science but in some cases in matters of values as well where the truth may not necessarily be on their side and um, you know to me that is also you know that speaks to what we were discussing earlier and like you said it has you know like a volcano sort of burst forth tell me your, your you know when you came you were talking about your current project of looking at how the colonial way of looking at indians has influenced how we look at ourselves and indeed what we have become which is you know a very evocative uh, subject to me so if it's a work in progress i won't you know force you to speak on it if you don't want to no, no, but sure. i find it so fascinating i mean of course i mean i mean let me give an example like i don't know what was your experience but i remember not knowing how to use spoon and fork or knife and fork was something that i felt i have a i have a, you know personality disorder if i don't know how to use it so i i was interrupt and say i was at a dinner three nights ago with people we will knowing economists and other people as well and it was a chinese restaurant and they were all using chopsticks and i was fumbling around with my hands because i still can't use chopsticks yeah. you know and i'm not bothered to learn and one of them then asked me do you travel much <laughs> so <laughs> but anyway <laughs> leaving leaving that aside ha huh? so no, you know this is the thing you know the judgment bit that you mentioned so i mean why do we have to learn how to eat with the fork and knife and how which one is a tablespoon and which one is a sugar spoon and things like I mean the reason I have to do this is because of course the colonized start thinking like the colonizer and the colonizer's value system was this in fact uh, you know for a long time I have I have felt that so and this is not about english right so pe- many people talk about that we should be speaking in our mother tongue and you know some of those i mean i don't really have a huge amount of sympathy with that i mean surely we should speak in we should know about our uh, we should know our mother tongues because a lot of ideas go away when a certain language goes away some of the thoughts and concepts go away but the but this is not about that english bit i'm saying i'm saying in advertently without knowing we are doing things because they because these things are pres- these things prescribe us closer to the colonize colonizer you know uh, you know i'm wearing a kurta right now right now this is uh, you'll call it an ethnic wear right i would imagine if uh, you know somebody from the us comes over and says oh, this is a nice ethnic wear why will i not call a pair of jeans ethnic to the us why is that never called ethnic and i mean it's not called ethnic because it's not called ethnic there is no reason to it but it is an ethnic wear of the us which we now wear so it's about who whose gaze are we seeing like who who is looking at who who is the questioner the person who asks a question becomes the person who's uh, more powerful 
obviously like right now you're more powerful because you're driving this conversation because you're asking me the question if i start asking the question then i become more powerful so when the colonizer comes to a new society and when they start asking questions they assume that power and if we are unable to respond to those questions well then we don't question the questioner we start thinking oh how can we not know this answer and this is where my you know this uh, this work that i'm doing so i am so now back in the back in the uh, during colonial times british used to write these big documents called gazetteers of india you know these gazetteers were extensive documentation of everything that they would see in india i mean they they're coming here looking at the length and breadth of the size of this country this is a crazy place um, you know all of these are uh, pagans here they don't you know worshiping all false gods and we need to civilize them you know the classic story everybody knows about it but what they did in 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 thinking about this is that they they started writing about us so if you pick up gazetteers you have gazetteers of the whole country you have you know archives and then you have district level gazetteers so you know pune district so the collector of pune is writing about pune and the next guy is probably adding to it so th- this was a period during let's say 1870s 1880s until 1920s when india was actually the most documented country in the world at that time and you know there was this bug of anthropology that they started when napoleon went to napoleon went to egypt and started measuring heights and nose of people and that bug started you know all, all europeans were infected by it but british particularly so so british wrote huge amount of british have huge amount of writings done on india in fact even in the court case of babri masjid court court case um, the you know the judges had to refer to the to fezabad's gazetteer what british had written in it and you know earlier i was telling you about james mill john stuart mill's father who wrote this three volume set on history of india which is which used to be back in mid 19th century the most authoritative text on india and how many times has he visited india zero because of course he had access to everything written on india by british who were in india so so here's a an exercise where this uh, you know this collector who was sent from uh, england actually most of them came from scotland because the british hated our summers mm-hmm. so they would send scottish here and so most of the people who ruled us were actually scottish and not british um, not uh, english anyway so this guy is sent to run and govern a city larger than the size of london he has never been to so these documents acted as very important primary resource for these people to know what are these people who they are governing so if you pick up a gazetteer it will have 1890 gazetteer of pune will have 1880s gazetteer of let's say kolhapur which i am currently you know reading and I'm, i read a number of these gazetteers because of this project you will write what was kolhapur like in 1880s as it is and it's absolutely detailed brilliant what it of course it is written in a very racist language but you know these guys were like they were the kings they could write whatever they wanted to um, but what happened is that these texts became the source primary source of our past in colonial times and because these people wrote the past of india in those documents they also become primary source of our past that predates colonial times as well so which means they are some of the most important sources on which our even class 8th history textbooks are also written right so there because the, i mean an indian culture primarily has been very oral in nature old traditions and you know these guys were so anyway the project that i'm doing in uh, in flame here in set up a center called center for knowledge alternatives is to recreate this exercise of writing about india but we don't want to call it gazetteers this these we are making massive digital repositories of statistics at district level and cultures at district level and you know so we are doing a pilot in maharashtra and in doing this we are engaging with a number of gazetteers and we are right reading about how british would explain us or describe us how would they explain everything that they saw here a we realize a lot of it is continues to this day which is where we come to the point that you were raising right western education and how much have we changed you know we've hardly changed in terms of how we look at ourselves how the government sees its people you know british government was a government against the people and sometimes this is what you see in ordinary behavior of a policeman with you for instance right so you know not much change in after that and so we have kind of uh, kind of inherited that in fact with one of my colleagues uh, at flame we are doing some work on understanding the sources of constitution so constitution of india comes from a number of other documents right and we only know about government of india act 1935 but then there were many other constitution frameworks that were written different types of reports that came and how much have they merged to become so you know a part of the constitution and in that sense i agree with argo's argument in at least the title definitely so the constitution is colonial in many ways anyway coming back to the the idea of what british were writing british were writing 
for instance they were writing about the castes in india um uh, and they were documenting the caste with respect to their behaviors i wish i had brought some of the gazetteers with me here today so i could have read them um you know as we speak uh, so for instance they are writing about how jats in you know when they are writing gazetteers in haryana how jats are this aggressive tribe uh, they are writing about how you know some of these tribes actually they notified as thieving tribes i mean can you believe it i mean today of course no one can think about it and back then people could think about it but the fact that they are thieving tribes is an appellation that was created by british and so these these are nomadic tribes i mean these are banjara tribes and they have, they relegated them so all these uh, people who they called who they notified as thieving tribes you know they were supposed to come to the local police thana every month to mark their attendance wow so you know that i'm here and i haven't done anything uh, it, it's another matter which is which is you know so ironic uh, it makes me angry and you know it's just so funny at the same time is that after independence he started calling them denotified tribes so that if i know the tribe is denotified then i know what was it notified earlier as like it's a funny thing that in, in, indian government is capable of doing so many amazing things this is one of those amazing things anyway they are writing about how dirty indians are i mean and this this idea that indians are dirty has continuously over and over and over again has been impregnated in our social fabric so much that even today we think the government needs to train us and teach us how to be clean um, and why am i saying this well i mean i mean i mean we are in mumbai right now you go to go, i mean if we walk to a slum and if we go into a into a small house there chances are we'll have to put keep our slippers outside the house will be spick and span most indians take shower twice a day if chances are that our kitchen we are not allowed in the kitchen with our slippers on i mean and and we are dirty so this doesn't mean i'm not trying to say that indian streets are not dirty and the garbage collection method has to make be more efficient and so on and so forth that's what i'm trying to say but to convert a statement that india is dirty to indians are dirty is too much of an too much of a uh, you know generalization and this generalization carries on to this day they write about how indians are dishonest or certain communities are dishonest these are the same communities that do millions and millions of rupees of you know word of mouth businesses on a daily basis i mean if indians are dishonest how is it possible that like we mentioned vast majority of indian workforce is informal in nature it can't be the case in fact we we trust each other so much that we you know surat has is the largest diamond market in the world and the entire business that happens in surat is on word of mouth in fact it is that social trust that maintains us as a society and the government laws and the you know top down legislation is just happens to be there exactly and so if you look at it this way you can go on and try to if, i mean if you extend this argument of the british that what they so so british are not writing about indians they are writing about their experience of india and their experience of india and india are two qualitatively different things if i write about you knowing little bit about you and if you write about yourself i'm sure the two texts will be very different so we know about india through british experience of india not through our own experience i mean we know about it through our own experience but maybe because it is not documented that is relegated coming back to the same point of western education so indian frameworks are understood through the experience of the british continues to happen so because obviously you know the elites of the past were those elites which were enamored by british they go to british universities they understand those frameworks and these frameworks are most poignantly visible in the clash that we find today in policies that are quote and quote related to religion you know consider beef very interesting example right and uh, balagangadhara has written a lot on this these frameworks um so for instance beef Uh, when i go up, when, when i was abroad people would ask me why don't you guys eat beef right and i and like i mentioned the moment they ask this question why don't you eat beef i don't know why i don't eat beef frankly because because any rational answer is going to make me look stupid so consider this i don't eat beef because i think i treat cow as uh, cow is revered and cow is a goddess let's say in my eyes i pray to cow and the next question would be well but i see cow you know rummaging through the garbage on the street do you keep your goddesses like this or cow? no we don't of course not cows can't be like this so then that means she can't be a goddess she can't be revered like a god if it is then she would not be roaming around on the street uh, you know rummaging through the garbage okay what about the answer of the fo- of the following type oh, well maybe i don't eat beef or we don't eat beef in india because because beef uh, you know uh, historically we have not eaten so it's uh, but it's strong i mean historically we have we have accounts perhaps that, you know somebody will pull out some accounts in fact 
um hindus eat beef in uh, kerala bengal and many parts of the country that doesn't cease that doesn't make them stop being hindu right doesn't prevent them from being hindus um or for that matter well beef uh, because cow is commercially very useful with milk well but you could make the other argument that you know cow is commercially very useful for beef so how do you answer this question and i i'm continuously thinking and i don't have an answer i'm not very, i'm not like religiously inclined not to eat beef but i just don't eat it and so here's the thing what if i reverse this and i ask my american friend hey dude uh, tell me why don't you eat dogs like you know they fairly tasty like you know i might annoy some of your li- uh, uh, listeners but let's say if i ask this question what could potentially the answer be from his mind is he going to give me a theory that i am trying to think about for beef he, i don't think he, he, probably he'll he'll ask me what are you talking about man like how can you eat dogs dogs are not supposed to be eaten i'm like yeah i mean with exactly in the same way we think cows are not supposed to be eaten so in a way i am doing this not because of some theory that is guiding me and explaining this behavior of mine i am not doing it because i don't see food in cow and maybe indians don't see food in cow they see food in maybe other animals but in cow they don't now we d- the framework that comes from religion that we don't eat cow because of religion will make us run into these illogical walls and we will have to come back and then we will have to find some text some traditional scripture which has written oh cows are not supposed to be eaten and that's why we are not eating it well maybe there is or for that matter many people would ask me why do you guys wear a bindi and i'm like um, I, i don't know like then then they, you know you always have these smart people smart indians who will say oh well there is some acupressure thing going on or maybe because there is some text that is written well um, you know the class classic answer could be well i am wearing a bindi because my mother wore it and because she wearing because her you know she, th- these guys told you know, it is just an ancestral practice if it is an ancest- ancestral practice it does not need a theory to be explained this is very difficult for somebody who has grown in a culture of abrahamic faith which are theory driven religions to be absorbed so so you know bal gangadhara for instance so we call him balu balu divides the you know the frameworks of the world in two categories theory theory driven or theory inspired uh, you know folks and there are empirics experiential ones so theory ones will need a theory and so the western world is by and large theory driven so, and because the religion and this is largely you know in some ways uh, you know there there is a there is a whole theological background to this so th- there must be a why and there must be somewhere from where the practices are flowing here the practices are not flowing i mean i can guarantee like both of us may be called as quote unquote hindus by the way uh, you know if you have to fill a school form but surely your family would be practicing something entirely different mine would be very different we don't really need to even i don't even need to practice anything to be called a hindu for that matter right but this is not so all i'm trying to say is when these theological disc- when theology allows creation of frameworks to understand the world and this is definitely true in the 19th century britain like any other place in europe they would see the world with those frameworks and th- that framework will tell us certain type of indians and by the way the exactly opposite could also be true if we had colonized uk for that matter or england for that you know at that time we would be writing about our experience of england just like they are writing they were writing about their experience of india so long story short when we follow the writings of british on india we are really reading their experiences they are not they don't describe us they describe their experiences and in that sense they are right but because they don't describe us we are at a loss for a vocabulary and a framework to describe us this might be a little too complex uh, the way it sounds but it's really simple in in many ways it is really simple i love it though i'm going to listen to it again and uh, because there is so much food for thought in there and uh, no pun intended when i say food for thought though i love your counter question about a dog which is a, you know i eat everything but i've never eaten dog but i'm open to it uh, I'm, unfortunately <laughs> i guess i'm not some people might call me unsanskari but i love the sense in which you immediately place it in the category of a cultural practice that does not require an explanation like why do you wear a sari instead of shirt pant or salwar kameez it does not require an explanation Yeah. it is just a practice that has come down on that particular day you feel like wearing that particular thing and you do exactly. it and it's not a big deal you don't need to explain so it to anything so the fun thing is what is the obsession that wants us to know why so this is what i often ask my students did it even occur to you why do you wear a bindi and for most of them it didn't even occur to them so what makes certain societies and certain communities or cultures ask why for this so to give an example if you had told me 
that you gang today you know we don't wear black in our house i would have probably you know i would have probably picked up some other kurta but i would have never asked you why it would have been so normal you know you can come up with any kind of random excuse to tell me you know you gang we don't eat laddu on thursday i don't know and i'll probably say yes maybe you don't eat laddu on thursday i to us in india we do not get triggered by an absurdity so to speak but in the in the west everything which is not coming from a theory gets triggered in the in the form of a question of why so you know for instance when the british started documenting us and they started census they are trying to figure out what religion do we belong to the problem is we don't have a word for religion in our language there is nothing called religion you know hindu word itself is like you know corrupt version of sindhu and you know persian pronunciation and things like that we don't have that word we don't know in fact gandhi writes that his mother followed different kinds of sects and you know if we go back to our great grandparents times they would call us we are certain type of jati but we don't know whether we were could be called as hindu so british are having hard time figuring out who is a hindu so they ask the question are you a hindu this guy says yes and then they say do you eat beef this guy says yes no but you can't eat beef you're a hindu and so they are running into these problems and then they collect these 10 pandits and they ask them please can you codify what is hinduism can you write to us and tell us and these guys write this book which comes to be known as vivad varna setu and they for the first time they're trying to codify something which doesn't exist in fact do you know what Hindu marriage act do you know how it defines hindus no huh? so it's easy to define muslims and christians because if they believe in certain text then they are but can you say that if you believe in bhagavad gita only then you are a hindu i mean i don't have bhagavad gita in my home for that matter maybe many indians don't have most indians i would bet have not even read it but does that make them less of a hindu so you know how does the hindu marriage act defines hindu <laughs> <Tell me. laughs> anyone who is not a muslim christian parsi jew sikh or any other religion is a hindu so we are defined in that act 1956 or 55 uh, we are trying to scramble independent india is scrambling for this definition which i'm sure is an offshoot of the obsession to scramble for this definition that comes from british times because british were trying to scramble for this definition or codify this so for them to ask this question i mean i sometimes were i sometimes feel for the intellectuals of of india at that time when british were asking them these questions and they didn't have an answer and poor thing they didn't even have a framework in which they could put this answer so they would have asked them when was ram born when was krishna born and they probably didn't have a date we still don't have a, i i mean how i mean if i tell my grandmother you know ram was born 10000 years ago she'll be like okay great that's great if i tell her you know he was born 5000 years ago she'll say okay that's great i mean nothing changes in her life with the date but imagine if we don't didn't have dates how difficult it would have been for our intellectuals in fact ba- balgangadhara has also mentioned about these ideas and many of his uh, other you know uh, you know other scholars who f- who follow that uh, that line that line of thinking so so yeah i mean you ask a question and you you're the boss my favorite ram was born in 1958 do you know what i'm talking about your favorite what my favorite ram was in 1958 yeah since we were discussing ram's birthday yeah 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 okay 1958 he's been on the show five times ram guha Oh Ram Guha. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So yes, I have before we go in for a break I have another question for you but before that a formulation of how I have typically thought of one of the ill effects of colonial rule on us tell me if you you know I think you'll broadly agree with it but tell me if you'd like to add nuance and then I'll come to my question. And what really happened and I think Manu Pillai first spoke about it at length on the show many years ago uh when he was on the scene and the unseen is that the British come to India it is deeply complex they don't know what the hell is going on they're trying to figure it out and obviously the way that you try to figure out something is you try to look for patterns you try to look for categories that is how you understand the world their interlocutors happen to be this uh, happen to be these higher caste brahmans who are of course the elites of the time and they tell them oh this is hinduism this is a varna system this is how it works then they write it down then they do the kind of census that you speak of and then they topo that category hindu on the, the you know the peoples here whereas what you have is a whole bunch of different religious and spiritual traditions coming from a whole bunch of different places some people eat beef some people don't eat beef some people do this some people do that it's kind of all over the uh, the, the place but their explanation of it is homogenized but because they are the ones writing it down and we've been largely oral so far or persian has been the like the ufi- what english is today in india it's the official language but that gradually fades away you know what what we have is their writings and then we construct ourselves through their writings and we begin to think that what they have written about quote and quote hinduism is the truth and therefore that gets ossified and it is a restriction of our imagination and how we look at ourselves because for the first time it's kind of been written down and once it's written down it is imprisoned 
involved in that exactly. particular exactly. narrative and is playing out in various other ways for example what a lot of people the prudishness that a lot of people call sanskari today i am like this is not sanskari it is victorian yeah, exactly, you know exactly. uh, again i think it was in an episode with manu where he spoke about how in kerala you were supposed to be bare breasted if you covered your breasts it was rude there was something wrong with it perhaps you did it if you were from mm. a lower caste mm. but mm. otherwise you would uh, i'm talking about the women obviously would mm. proudly be bare breasted and this sense of shame this victorian prudishness comes in with them and then it completely becomes normalized to the extent that we are calling it sanskari today exactly. and adopting exactly. it as as our attitude we the land of the kama sutra you know in fact uh, if you read pride and prejudice mm. it looks like a story of i don't know 1990s 2000s india where there's a woman with five daughters who she is unable to marry and <laughs> she's worried because she can't get them married and then she finds a prince who was a, a nobleman so there is an advantageous marriage and these are the words that uh, you know uh, you know the these are the words that she she's using and then one of her daughters elopes with someone and that is bringing shame to the family and they're trying to hide this i mean doesn't it look like one of the saas bahu serials of india totally. and so and so in some ways the 17th uh, 18th century britain we have it in today's india if this is not colonization what it is and i don't know and you know historians will have to add to this whether this is how indian society was structured earlier i would say there were hundreds of ways of structuring indian societies perhaps this was like you know we're, we're all pagans in many ways and so you know the problem is when we try to explain and codify us we try to make an abrahamic version of hinduism when it is not uh, there could be a, a range of similarities there could be a range of uh, you know areas at which most indians converge or let's say quote unquote the hindu indians converge and surely that needs to be uh, you know recognized but to but the british efforts that did it they did it with a huge amount of violence and they their bracketing of this allowed many people to be out of it many people who were, were part were part of it should not have been in uh, part of it and so and this created a path dependent process when when you and you know i mean in in some ways what i'm trying to say is this is a big harm of colonization we could have had imagine this we could have had a whole new way of looking at religion in this place you know but writing is intolerant theory is intolerant when you create a theory when you write something you create intolerance in some ways in fact india is has been historically the most tolerant place in the world um and i'm not even talking about uh, you know how we i mean everybody knows about the relationship jews had with india the only country where uh, they were not persecuted but i am talking about everyday tolerance that we have we have tolerance with the government the, the <laughs> shadiest government i mean people are dancing on the street during their wedding the the entire traffic is blocked but you know they're all sitting i mean sometimes it can be annoying the patience that we have with each other but this is a massively tolerant country probably because of the type of uh, cultural traditions and uh, probably the type of uh, religious traditions that we had but now that they're bracketed these are uh, you know up at arms with each other and uh, you know to carry on with the thought and lead to my question we see in a sense a similar narrowing of possibilities and a constriction of the imagination with what has happened in our politics today where again hinduism is almost being presented in an abrahamic kind of way that it's you know one religion one book etc etc and is being simplified and all the complexity is just being stripped away and you know i had an episode with ranjit hoskote where he spoke on this at length and it was a great lament of his and so many other people as well that it's this massive com- complex religion which has so many aspects to it and now we are reducing it to one thing and in a sense that is similar to what the british did in terms of interpreting what our country is for ourselves and therefore shaping it in that process so my question to you is this that how does this process get reversed is what is lost lost irreversibly like uh, tell me a little bit for example about the project that uh, you are doing because it seems to me that one of the things we're trying to do is if not reserve if not uh, sort of get some of it back at least preserve what is there and etc etc so how do you think about the broader problem and what are the specific uh, sort of things that you guys are doing so you know you are absolutely right this is the problem we do not have the frameworks and maybe the intellectual patience to evolve a framework that allows us to explain our world in the way that we want to so the more we this is like you know somebody who doesn't know how to swim is trying to splash the water on the surface trying to stay afloat and this is what we're trying with with, with our culture and our, our religion so for instance what i'm doing let's say is that if i have to write about a temple i will not write 
those words which I know has no meaning in English because they strip me of the experience. So, for instance, I will not write the statue of the goddess is adorned with the, you know, beautiful sari. There's no statue. That is the goddess. In fact, I don't even use the word goddess. We write Devi. So, Devi has a lo lovely sari on, on her because in our culture, we she's a person. She's there. She's fed. She's, uh, she's go, you know, made to go to sleep. Uh, you know, you, you decorate her. People pray. She gives you ashirwad and all of those type of things. So, we write in the same way that a lady outside the temple explains her. And if I cannot explain it in English, I will simply not use the word English, use an English word. Or maybe uh, if I can, I will have to explain it in English rather than convert it into some word. You know, so idol, for instance, idol, you know, in Hindi, idol means uh, but, right? You know where the word but comes from? The word but comes from Buddha. Mm -hmm. Because when the, when the invaders came towards India, they encountered the huge Buddha statues in Afghanistan. And they and you know for these people this was you know an act of infidels like the you Bamiyan can't, Buddhas which the were Bamiyan later Buddhas, destroyed yeah. exactly so those so they started destroying them and so anyone who prays to a statue is known as someone who's doing but puja and so but words comes from Buddha now but that is not how we see our cultures I mean we are constructing ourselves against the definitions of Abrahamic religions it's like you can define night only if you define day and because day has been defined and now you will end up defining as night as something which is not the day. Because we don't want to do that, therefore, but both these definitions of day and night are following the same framework. They're following the same intellectual and cognitive load. In the same way, I think when we define Hindus, we end up defining them in the same framework that Christians or Muslims or Jews define themselves. And these are very specific one God religion. And we are not. In fact, we don't even have a capital G-O-D God. We have many gods with small g. And, you know, in fact, in a Devi temple, you will have a main goddess is Devi. And, uh, you know, there are some minor gods, Hanumanji and Shivji will be outside small ones. In a Hanuman temple, Hanumanji is the main god and Devis will be the small ones who are outside. So, which means, you know, in fact, one of the recorded instances, the British come and they're looking at this, you know, this, this Pandit is... Um, you know, saying, or, you know, I don't know whether Pandit or whoever, but, you know, there are so many gods and they're saying, no, you can't have so many gods. I don't know, we have so many gods, obviously. And they say, no, Jesus, this is another god. And you know, this is one god. This is the true god. And so the this person is very happy. Okay, give me this uh, this Jesus cross. And he puts this beside this, uh, beside all the other go gods and goddesses. And he says, oh, I'll start praying for, no, no, you can't do this. Because this is unthinkable to a Western mind in a way, right? Because there's one God or, you know, the true God and they are, all the others are false gods. To assume that the whole world is comprised of this was, anyway, this is history. Coming to the present, you're asking how, how can we undo this? I think it has to be undone by evolving new frameworks within our own university systems, our own intellectuals that have to now start thinking about making sense of what is going on. So let's say some people say that Ram Setu didn't exist. Or maybe let me go to the to the Babri Masjid case itself, which is the most recent. So the entire argument there is whether this is the birthplace of Rama or not. And I think this is this is a direction we should not we shouldn't have gone into at all because this is exactly the same Abrahamic direction that we're going to is to find a specific proof that Rama was born here and he was this is the place where he was born and we're trying to locate documents we're trying to locate Skanda Puran we are we are picking up Faizabad's gazetteers and we are saying oh no this is the place where he was born well it doesn't matter in India it doesn't matter if 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 people believe Rama was born here then he was born here that's it and but how do you how do you even make sense of this? But it is exactly the case. Sorry. No, in fact, I think that just by saying something like Rama was born here, you are reducing Rama. I mean, you know? yeah, that's that's another way to put it. You yeah. know, it's a reduction. But so we we don't we don't want to. The moment we start defending that Kurukshetra is the place where Mahabharata battle took place, then we are into the same trap and the same framework. And it'll take years and decades. Well, we believe this is where it took place and that is pretty much it because this is how the cultural con cultural constructions happen here. In fact, Amit, this is an interesting learning that I've had by reading and by observing. And these are some of the things that are coming back from the same old, you know, the, the, the old Yugang who was for the first time abroad. First, you know, first time he sees this uh, crazy countries like in Europe and trying to figure out how is this different. And so here's what I'm trying to think. A culture, I don't think, is defined by the type of answers it has to complex questions. I think a culture is defined by what questions it considers important. So, whether I wear a bindi or eat or not eat beef, these are not important questions to me. 
I mean, we were discussing, I mean, in Gita, we are talking about what is right and wrong. At the time when Europeans were killing each other, right, left and center. Those were important questions to us. It was not important for us whether we should wear this particular type of cloth or not. Well, my parents wear it, so I'll wear it. And, uh, you, know, um, uh, you know, my sons and daughters will wear it and so on and so forth. These are not important questions to us. Isn't that an amazing culture and an amazing tradition? But because we have lost a framework to explain this, we need to evolve a framework. So the answer to your question, how do we undo this? We will be able to do this if there is a framework where we can plant it and locate it. Right now, there is only one framework. You and I, we understand religion only in one way. Religion means there must be a God. There must be a practice. You must believe in the existence of God. And if you don't, then you are an atheist. These come from a certain type of theological framework, which are Abrahamic in, in nature. So anything which is non-Abrahamic, they're all pagans. So in fact, I'll say, Romans were far closer to Hindus than us. And in fact, you know, many of the non-Western religions, whether it's Taoism, Shintoism, Buddhism, you know, all of these, they are far closer to how... So we explain the world through our experience. Our, we do things because they're ancestral practices. We need a framework to put it in so that when we engage with students whose experience is different and their textbook says something else, they're able to relate to their experience because they don't have access to it. Part of it can happen if you make sense of the vernacular itself. Because the moment you translate it, you destroy the thing. So, for instance, today, you know, Atma is translated as soul. And soul, thank, thanks to Tulsi Rams and Shyam Ramse movies, uh, only gives us one particular type of impression. <laughs> this transparent sort of shadowy thing that comes out of the body. Like, that doesn't, that concept doesn't exist in our cultures. And uh, at least not in the communities that I come from. Atma is something else. But it has been, if I can use the word relegated, or it has been connected to the word soul and we don't have any other framework. So how? So the point I'm trying to make is not that we should have... Uh, so yes, we can have descriptions of many vernacular words, but this is only, you know, the toolbox. The framework within which this has to be planted is what is necessary. And this has to start in university and school spaces. This has to start at that age. Because it is exactly then when kids go through... These conflicting emotions. At one level, they have these superstitious parents at, and they are the smarter ones. At another level, these are the parents who are the smart ones who are putting them in schools and colleges. Are I, so let's say if Ram was not born there, then either all millions of in Hindus and Indians are liars and stupid people and intellectual imbeciles, including our parents and grandparents. Can we accept it? Well, we can't accept it. I don't think they're stupid. Well, then can we accept that Ram was born there? Well, we can't accept it because there's no proof. What do you expect? Then what will you accept? If you can't, if you think this is true, uh, this is uh, untrue that Ram was born there. If you think this is untrue that your parents, etc. are all fools, millions of Hindus are fools, then there must be something which is true. What is that? That framework we don't have. Just like for that matter, we don't have frameworks of what type of, what type of, let's say, governments we used to have or state we used to have. We don't really know. The Rajas, were the Rajas in India the same as the Rajas in Europe? Is, is, do people understand sovereignty here? I don't think so. That's a very European, you know, Treaty of Westphalia, post-Treaty of Westphalia construction. Or do we understand Shrenis, the old quote-unquote guilds? Maybe they were not guilds. Um, so, let me put it this way. I mean, and because you, you know, we've had, we've many common friends who use this term very frequently. It'll, it'll interest you. Any action in the world can either be public, private, or maybe commons. Is there a fourth category? Well, I don't think so, at least not off the top of our heads, right? So, you know, you, you doing something. Like, so let me ask you this. This conversation is a private conversation that we are having, which later on will become public, right? These are the two frameworks that we can put. But, are, but what if there's something which is neither public nor private? Is there a framework for that? I don't think we have a framework. Now, do we have an experience of it? Yes, surely we have an experience of it. Let's say many Hindus do Satyanarayan Katha. You know, some people do Ram Charit Manas Akhand Pat. Is that a public event or is that a private event? Let's say we are doing a puja in our house and there's a Ramayan part will happen. Is this public or is this private? If we are doing it in our house. Well, it's private because we are doing it in our house. Does that mean that if anybody who wants to come in will say, no, you can't enter? unlikely if somebody who is a devotee who wants to be part of it will actually welcome this guy but does this mean it is public is it open for anyone unlikely I don't think we'll. I'll put up a board outside anybody who wants to come should come we don't have a framework to explain this this incident uh, the, this, uh, this uh, event that I'm organizing 
just like we don't know anything outside society trust private limited corporation uh, section 8 company and maybe one or two more such but so let's say you and i are friends i buy something and you help me uh, sell it off to somebody you are neither so who are you like you're not part of the company you're not part of section 8 company but i can still give you some sort of commission let's say for this i mean is this is there a framework to explain this i don't know is there a framework to explain trade credit which is on purely on word of mouth i don't know so we what i'm trying to say is how do we undo this we need to evolve a very rigorous theoretical framework to explain our experiences because right now we explain them through the frameworks of the west which may have theological origins which may have their own historical path dependency through which they have refined it we have not refined it we have not refined it because we have not had scholars who were able to do this earlier the you know the elites were british later on the uh, the elites after the british went were you know more english than english let me put it this way and so we need some indigenous thinking to emerge and if and the problem is the point of uh, wokism that you mentioned earlier is that the places where i would expect this to happen the most are the places which are disappointing me the most as well these university spaces globally for that matter beautifully put and you know well, so uh, an aside which seems unrelated but isn't ajay and i just released an episode uh, of everything is everything where he gives a masterclass on unix and uh, there he spoke about the ideological battle between bill gates and richard stallman which seems relevant to this where richard where bill gates was like ki ip karo company banao profit banao etc etc and stallman was like well, everything should be free everyone should contribute open source etc etc and it seems to me that hinduism in its original form and quote quote hinduism whatever you call it is like an open source religion there are a lot of rivers flowing into it and a lot of tributaries flowing out and it's all over the place and that uh, a lot of these abrahamic religions seem almost like microsoft windows that this is one way and Absolutely if you fit right. this if you are compatible fit theek hai nahi to aapki app nahi chahiye you know it's and so that is sort of one way of thinking about it and the other thing is that open source or bottom up is actually very counterintuitive exactly. our brain thinks in top down engineering mindset kind of ways you know so a bottom up spontaneous order thing is not something that we can intuitively uh, compute it's it's very counterintuitive and hard to kind of drive home and therefore i when you speak of alternative frameworks is it something you can you know elaborate on and speak a bit more on because and i also see another conflict there that i totally see the need of frame more frameworks to understand the world right because the existing ones are constrictive and they miss a lot what kind of frameworks would go beyond what we have in terms of how do we live our lives like for me in that sense you could say i'm a deracinated westerner or whatever but enlightenment values mean a lot to me individual rights mean a lot to me so that is how i my framework for looking at what is good and what is bad is individual rights agency autonomy whereas somebody from here might say that no the community matters and the khap panchayat has a right to make decisions on behalf of whatever which i would you know have the moment you start thinking of group rights instead of individual rights i would sort of have an issue with that now these are two different kinds of frameworks one is frameworks of value for how should we live our lives where uh, i find it hard to sort of um, reconcile that uh, but the other where i completely agree with you is frameworks of understanding the world where i feel that the frameworks we have of understanding the world do come from a particular direction and we possibly even lack a vocabulary so when you think of alternative to frameworks what are the kind of frameworks you've come across or tried to formulate you know can you make that a bit more concrete for me so so uh, no this is great and i think there are two three things that uh, you've packed in this so let me unbundle this so first of all i think the reason why you say that it is counterintuitive that spontaneous ordering and open source could be the order of the world and this comes this comes to you as a counterintuitive idea the fact that this is counterintuitive is the reason why we need to redo and rethink of these frameworks because it's actually the most intuitive thing i mean think of hunter gatherer societies and they're evolving the the first thing that comes to your mind is this open source type of imagination that would have emerged perhaps in fact you know there are some scholars who have argued like naturally left to their own state would human beings think about one god religion or many gods religion like what seems to be counterintuitive and sometimes people and many of these scholars say that actually one god seems to be counterintuitive because typically different kinds of communities different people you know they would be creating co creating and curating different kinds of gods for that matter right so in a way the fact that you think open source is counterintuitive is actually symptomatic of the problems of the frameworks that we have 
because this is the most intuitive way in which you can imagine the no, I, I i think i'm let me clarify that i'm actually the framework i'm coming at is biology or evolutionary uh, psychology which is that when we evolve we are evolving in small tribes and therefore for example positive sum thinking is counterintuitive zero sum thinking is intuitive because in a time of scarcity with few people sharing few resources it is natural to think that for me to get that extra cut of lamb somebody else is missing out on it and it's nat- our bra- brains are hardwired to think in zero sum ways equally our brains are hardwired to think in top down ways where you know the only way of making something good is you know it, it's it's top down and your tribe has a that's also why we are instinctively drawn to strong leaders because that's when our brains sort of evolved and and i think people who care about liberty like actually if you look at the way the world works and matt ridley has a beautiful book on this called the evolution of everything i had an episode with him on that also many years ago and everything actually has come bottom up you know right from natural selection to markets to so the way society runs or to languages everything is bottom up but whenever we look for a solution to a problem our instinct goes to a top down thing ki mai baap karega or etc etc so i would say that the framework here is biology and in some senses so is, is a little immutable very interesting that you say this but now let me put it this way so you can you have a situation where it's bottom up you have a situation where it's top down why are you not thinking of a third framework that could potentially exist so here's here's a uh, thought experiment so surely there is this you know leader of a tribe who's trying to tell people but where is this leader drawing the legitimacy or authority from so is this true that this leader so this is a speculation right we speculated just like the british or the missionaries speculated god is everywhere and then there are some places which have, which has which have been taken over by false gods but every person on the planet must have a religion i mean this is an assumption about how the world works remember when we were growing up our school textbooks told us you know humans when we evolved as hunter gatherer societies we were we feared nature and you know that's why we created gods out of nature but why do we think that we feared nature like do we think a dog or a cat fears nature like is that the impression that they give i don't know whether that is the case so the fact that we think surely there must have been a leader of the tribe who would have organized a tribe in such and such way only tells us how limiting our frameworks are that make us think this way so why not these people were coming together and you know now you know a lot of evolutionary biology research also tells us that there was a lot of cooperation happening and that is how this happened but the assumption you are making is that cooperation happened because there was one person who was guiding this no no and i mean the coordination there's, a, there's a great book by robert axelrod and Axelrod, i think he did studies on it with robert exactly. trevers called the evolution of cooperation correct. so there are reasons why it evolved Over time, but yeah. yeah it it i mean so we have all these contradictory impulses within us but in terms of what our brain can grok our brain can grok zero sum if the rich get rich the poor must be getting poorer it can't grok positive sum So you know the it's interesting because I'm just thinking loudly with you right now and I'm, mm-hmm. I'm enjoying this when you have an institutional religion then a pyramidical structure or a top down framework becomes so natural to think through right so surely them this sort of one god and then there are you know who has given the priest or the pope the legitimacy to anoint a king who then has a legitimacy that is drawn from one singular source which is god to rule over people and then they are like so you know you can clearly see this pyramid so again i'm going back to the theological framework because that's the earliest norms quote unquote laws that we you know, that we you know and i think what would from. happen is that every religion would start evolving bottom up but then the elites everywhere when they come into power they want to take it over and they want exactly. to control it and they build these restrictive frameworks the 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 a fun thing here is that in non western part of the world there was no singular elite because the idea of a singular god didn't exist and so you can have hundreds of communities having hundreds of different types of gods and each one learning to live with each other because they think of course this is possible so in a way when you say you know and i'm com- comparing this with your the latter part of your question when you hinted at this this dichotomy between group rights and individual rights again if you look at it closely a bottom up approach would tend tend us to believe or incline us to believe that in that pagan or indian or non western approaches would have been more favorable to individual rights because they are bottom up in fact it is a top down approach which will create group rights exactly stronger than the bottom up now if you look at history and you know because you mention about what i mean there is an there is an anxiety when we start thinking group rights are more important and i've seen this very frequently 
elites and intellectuals and even any ordinary person who's uh, who has done a fair bit of reading thinks that you know they compare indian cultures or non western cultures as collectivist cultures and the western cultures as more individualistic cultures right but actually if you look at it deeply at the at the base of this pyramid there is nothing which is which is collective here in india so collective depending on how you define collective of obviously so in my community i would be doing something but surely i would not be doing things which other hindus are doing which means i am very much very much part of my own small community which has its own unit um so let me give you one example and this is why i think it's important that we recognize the beauty that lies within us and not make it more abrahamic in nature so uh, you know for instance most societies have in india most societies have this uh, tradition that if somebody dies in their family on the 12th or 13th day they feast some brahmins and some pandits now in some communities they feast the en- they feed the entire village um and you know i've been to some of these so i know this in some places it's only 11 or 12 pandits in some places they have done away with it in fact i remember somebody told me in assam the idea was that the sun will feast the sun will kill and cut as many goats as a number of water streams he will cross in order to reach his native place wow so for instance because people would go to different villages so if you are gone to several villages far ahead that means you must be earning so much maybe and i am trying to give a rational ju- justification only through you know thinking loudly with you i really don't know what was the reason and frankly li- li- i mean i'm contradicting myself because i earlier said we don't need a reason for this but let's say for whatever reason which is not important the ancestral practice was if you are living far away and your father dies then you come and feast with the uh, you you will sacrifice the same number of goats as the number of water bodies you have crossed over a period of time this became very exploitative in some ways right because you know you are poor poor family how will you kill so many goats so the custom slowly changed to number of chicken which then slowly changed to number of eggs and this was not done in a top down fashion this is the beauty of it there is no text there is no priest who saying okay this is what we'll do it just somehow so happened earlier the feasting for people who are dead their families would feast a lot many more pandits than they than they do now and these things are changing so an an open source framework for a culture or a society is going to be self evolutionary in a way and that means they are the ones who will take care of individual rights a lot more than group rights this is why not only markets thrive in india in ways unimaginable you don't have standard contract and property rights here but you have markets all over you surely have a huge amount of state in fact it is a state which restricts markets from thriving if you take the state away this country will you know thrive like anything if you look at historical accounts including the british accounts you will be amazed to see the importance of the raja or the lack thereof in these in these pages let me give you an example from a very popular recent movie uh, you've seen uh, kantara i haven't i'm sorry okay so i will highly recommend you and now that you've not seen let me ask you to predict what would have happened in this in a scene that i'm going to describe so the movie starts with i'm not going to be this is not a spoilers alert for anyone who's listening to the audience but everybody is uh, highly encouraged to watch this movie because i loved it anyway so here's a raja who is you know very happy you know wealthy and all of that but he's not able to find peace unto himself so he is you know roaming around wandering in the jungles trying to see if he can find some solace some peace because he has everything the world can offer but he doesn't have peace and you know at one point of time he comes across in a jungle a small shrine a shrine is not the right translation but ek chota devi ka uh, ek dev ka pratima aur ek mandir right so a small little temple in the middle of the forest and suddenly something happens inside me and he, uh, inside him and he starts finding that peace here so he gets down off his horse he bows and he feels so elevated and he feels this is the place this is where i find peace now this is part this jungle which is adjoining a for uh, um, a village is part of his own kingdom what do you think the raja would do in such a situation or could do this is an indian raja maybe some south indian state you can imagine who has found a temple where he has found peace far away from his from his palace but surely there is some what do you think he could do 
So, okay, so the answer is clearly something unexpected and I cannot go there. But uh, my logical response would be that if I was that Raja, I would build a luxury kutia near that shrine which gives me peace and hope to holiday there once in a while so I get the peace. And of course, since I'm a Raja, I would fence it off so that commoners cannot disturb me. This is a rational okay, answer. Good. So, this is amazing. Why did it not occur to you to take the temple away and take it to your palace? Because it is a combination of everything, the place. So, uh, a, a Raja, a king in European sense of the word, is a, an all-powerful king who derives his authority from the God himself, right? The other thing that people often tell me, so in, in so this answer, so I ask this question to, you know, my friends in India, obviously, and uh, my students or other people, and even people in the West. And here's the difference. For them, of course, this is a Raja, this is a king. So he will just do whatever he wants. So he will, uh, you know, do whatever, like, you know, um, take take the temple, build a grand thing. He'll probably shift his capital or probably take the temple there. Um, and what if the villagers protest? Who's the Gram Devta? How can you take away the Gram Devta? Well, he's going to kill these villagers. What else? Like, this is the Raja. But to most Indians and even my students, the natural response is not that he'll kill these uh, villagers. The natural response is the type of response that you mentioned. And you know what happens in the movie? He's asking the permission of the villagers. Please give me this uh, dev. What do you want in return? So he's negotiating with the villagers. If I want the dev, what do you want? And then they ask, you know, we need land. All kinds of things happen and then the movie goes on. But the fact that Raja is negotiating and requesting the villagers to give him the devi, to give him the dev, tells us something about our how our sovereignty was. And so, you know, the recorded instances are that British are here. And there's some of these bunch of these British, they're trying to figure out who is the person in command here who can give us a royal decree that we are the people who will deal in this particular trade. And they're asking people and nobody knows who's really in command here. Many villagers don't even know the name of the Raja, which happens even today. Like if you go to some remote corners, probably people would not know who's the president of India and they're perfectly okay to live their lives around. In fact, many people have made their YouTube videos around asking people that you don't know who's the prime minister and they say people are stupid. People are not stupid. What... There is a different way of looking at your your Raja or King or whoever. So, you know, when I ask my students, what how do you translate government? And this is Sarkar. How do you translate Indian state? And this is Sarkar. But state and government can't be the same thing. They have to be different because the words are different. You don't have another word in Hindi or in your vernacular. We don't know whether there is a word. But if state but if there is no word, so what I'm trying to say is that royalty in India probably did not derive its authority from the way the royalty in the West derived it. And the quote-unquote all-powerful Raja is not something that we know of as much. You know, when India got independence, how many princely states there were? 535 you know? or something. And how many districts there were? 340 something. Yeah. So you had more Rajas than number of districts. You know, in Gujarat, you have a small district called Panch Mahal, which means there are five palaces. <laughs> the district itself must have had five Rajas. So... In other words, we had every village had a Raja. You cannot have the type of top-down approach that you had in the West continuously for so many years in India. This does not mean we didn't have large empires. Surely the some, there were some big empires and we know about them in history. But they were how were they ruling the last man? We don't know. Unlike in the West where they were ruling it very differently. So why am I saying this? Well, I think if you allow open source cultures to flourish, they will actually favor individual rights a lot more than group rights. In fact, it is a top-down approach cultures for who individual rights become something that they have to make an effort towards. For open source cultures, the natural intuitive thing would be individual rights to emerge. Um, and this individual, and this is something I'm not very clear in my head because this work is still continuing. I'm still going, going on, uh, you know, th this research is ongoing, is how do you explain sometimes the imp imp the impetus or the force of a community on the person. Like you mentioned Kha Panchayat. Well, it is the same culture that evolves Kha Panchayats too, right? Which I am trying to now, you know, celebrate perhaps in the last few, few minutes. If it is an open source space, then the Kha Panchayat should allow anyone to do whatever. We don't know. I don't know the evolution, historical evolution of how this happened and how did this happen. We surely know before British came, castes were not rigid. I mean, this is now, there is a huge amount of documentary evidence that we didn't have this ossified, rigid manner in which from one caste, you could not move to another caste. I mean, we have instances after instances in both our mythologies, our history books, as well as, uh, you know, amongst our uh, 
the stories of our kings like for instance chandragupta maurya was found by chanakya and this is uh, you know is as documented history as it can be who was definitely not a kshatriya for that matter and but i don't want to go there what i'm trying to say is we simply don't know what were those frameworks like because i have a feeling the reason why our cultures are connected to collectivist nature and top down is something which is fairly recent in the past the more i read the more i realize that there was a high level of decentralized nature that this country was living in there was a high level of similarity in many of our cultural attributes like burning our deads and you know uh, hinduism having similar frameworks across the country so there they, so i'm not trying to say there we were million countries in one which many social scientists argue i don't think we were million countries i think there was a very the, there are very very strong reasons to believe that this land had a, you know had large large amount of or vast um you know huge amount of convergences cultural convergences um with millions of communities spreading around what happened during colonization and even before that during islamic rule what kind of frameworks made us what we are we don't know and like i said there's very little research on it anyway so you know we do contain multitudes and i think who, who was it was it naipaul or gandhi who once said whatever you say of india the opposite is also yeah. true so but caste style kind of push back slightly like on the one hand i do believe that the british categorizing caste and doing the census and all that played a part in ossifying it but equally i had an episode with tony joseph on his book early indians and the genetic evidence that he came up with shows a very interesting thing in fact it's there's a memorable quote by uh, david reich uh, who wrote a book called how we uh, who we are and how we got here where he says that if you want to look for a large population look for the han chinese india is a collection of many small populations and what the genetic data shows us which tony talks about eloquently in his episode with me and in the book early indians is that since about 2000 years ago before that india was partying everybody who was in india was you know mingling with each other and everything was fluid but since about around 2000 years ago a particular ideological strain in the gangetic belt seems to have uh, won out and since then you have very rigid caste and dog me which is why to go back to rike's words you have many small populations and not one large population which is kind of pretty stunning because what yeah so i think i think we are talking about two different things so first of all i am not an expert in this matter so i will of course reserve to the judgment that you and other experts have but but i am saying something slightly different so so here's the nuance to say that many people followed what their caste occupation emphasized is not to say that they were forced to do it so while we might find that the experiences that you know occupations are caste driven and you don't find these separations in these lineages probably from the genetic evidence this does not tell us that people couldn't switch all it tells us the switching if at all it was the switching was very minimal but if switching is minimal this doesn't mean that these uh, there is a structure to it it could simply a matter of practice and in a world where probably the resources are limited in a world where uncertainties are far more i mean you and i are sure that if we go out to the street here in mumbai nobody will kill us but 1000 years ago 500 years ago or even 2000 years ago maybe we were not so sure you know people leaving in caravan for places to trade they're not sure whether they'll come back so in these types of times it is possible there are chances that people would not be as risk loving as they are today so you surely i mean the genetic uh, uh, you know so tony's work surely tells us there was no intermingling but this doesn't tell us that the intermingling was not allowed the texts that we have tell us that intermingling did take place both in the religious texts that we have as well as in british gazettes that we find but it was not widely prevalent and the two things are very different you know you know for instance you can you can say that uh, you know if genetic evolution tells us that indians are not marrying westerners but is it not allowed i don't know it is allowed it's just happening in small number and the two things are very different and both can stand on its own irrespective of the other fact fair enough i'm not an expert either i'll sort of defer to experts on that though the, the one very interesting sort of addition to uh, tony's insight came from uh, sort of came when i was chatting with alice evans i did an episode with her and she was talking about female uh, seclusion the urge to you know keep women at home and not let them go out and 
part of it she of course attributed to the rise of islam but i think part part of it also definitely comes from caste endogamy because then obviously if you want to maintain strict caste endogamy you want to keep the women at home controlling women's sexuality becomes a big deal but like you are saying it's uh, there is a little bit of an assumption there in whether it uh, was you know socially enforced in such a strict manner my my instinct is that it was but you know that's so you're right i mean look i i would be the last person to say that that there is no caste i mean obviously i've come from an extremely conservative background i've seen this all around me and i and none of what i'm saying comes from my reading of i mean the caste is a is an area which is not my uh, not an area in which i am an expert in what i am saying is through the reading of the the colonial documents Fair enough. and where i realize that you know risley for instance was one of the authors who ossified and made caste frameworks rigid and so you find after when he carved out that this is a caste and you know what he funnily enough he calls that book people of india mm-hmm. and then he documents all the castes and tells these are the professions so when you write something i mean i mean writing is doctrine you know one of the reasons why greek philosophers did not write is because they felt that if we write it will fossilize this yeah and philosophy cannot be fossilized because times change and things change value systems change etc so in a way if you write something and if there's no other text that is written which can contradict it for so many decades it assumes a certain position of power any in any society so my limited understanding so i'm sh- i mean surely there was a huge problem of caste surely we need to work around it and we have been trying to my reading tells me that the ossification is fairly recent in history and again very limited reading of mine so again i'm going to be deferring to experts there but there's a lot to unpack if we read the colonial documents there before we go in for a break a quick quote from your book only i got the anecdote from your book you mentioned you know the greeks not writing anything down because they didn't want to fossilize it in your book you have this lovely anecdote about einstein where einstein once uh, you know he gave a question paper one year for a student and the next year he gave the same question paper so i think his teaching assistant asked him that what is this why are you giving the same question paper to the students again and he said because the answers have changed <laughs> yes and that just fills me yeah. with so much fucking excitement because what a time to be alive when the answers are changing oh yeah oh yeah that is true the, these are exciting times whether it's like a roller coaster ride going up and down uh, by the way that story might be apocryphal but it kind of fits into einstein's personality you know and premchand's uh, story kafan is definitely fiction but it doesn't matter it contains the it truth it doesn't matter it exactly can... that's the whole point of stories that's why that's what makes us human let's go in for a break much more on the other side Have you always wanted to be a writer but never quite gotten down to it? Well, I'd love to help you. Since April 2020, I've enjoyed teaching 27 cohorts of my online course, The Art of Clear Writing, and an online community has now sprung up for all my past students. We have workshops, a newsletter to showcase the work of students, and vibrant community interaction. In the course itself, through four webinars spread over four weekends, I share all I know about the craft and practice of clear writing. There are many exercises, much interaction, and a lovely and lively community at the end. of it the course costs rupees 10000 plus gst or about 150 dollars if you're interested head on over to register at indiauncut.com/clearwriting that's indiauncut.com/clearwriting being a good writer doesn't require god given talent just a willingness to work hard and a clear idea of what you need to do to refine your skills i can help you Welcome back to the scene and the unseen. I'm chatting with the brilliant Yugang Goel about many things, and we haven't even reached his book yet. But we will not get there just yet because I want to know more about your journey, and, and I'm fascinated by the fact that on the one hand you are engaged in what is almost an entrepreneurial journey from the time you join Jindal and then you come to Flame, where you are sort of building new things and figuring out a new way to see the world and engage with the world but at the same time you are doing what a good academic should be doing which is you're also doing serious research and getting into subjects and all of that so tell me a bit about this period like what did the academic life mean for you how much of it is administration how much how much of it is teaching how much of it is research how much of it is this vague startup evangelism kind of stuff that's um, also you know seems to be a part of it Yeah thanks uh, Amit again um I I think it's been different during different periods of my career so far so you know in the beginning while we were setting up Jindal University uh, we you know I was involved in administration heavily uh, because it was some sort of a startup university like I said during and after my doctorate I have also moved towards the direction of writing and research teaching has always been very inspiring to me I think I learn a lot 
by teaching and i think the one of the best ways to learn is to teach it because then you will have to you know go to the first principles and you know so i in fact it was for my love of teaching and for my love of running into questions that i didn't have an answer to that led me to do my doctor doctorate and you know after my phd i started also liking the life of a scholar and researcher and so i moved to um, teaching and writing less of administration so let's say between 2009 to 12 when i was in jindal i was doing more of administration then 12 to 15 16 i did phd from 16 to 19 20 i was more of a scholar and teacher but not as much of an administrator even though i helped set up let's say the indian school of public policy at that time and i did so i don't think administration has all, has ever been away from me it's sort of it's been a sinusoidal curve but you know during my you know during my period in europe when i was studying and uh, writing i came across some fascinating uh, you know descriptions of the world both in my mind and in reality and one of the things that i think i should you know declare here one of my mantras has been that i go to the field without reading the theory i studied different kinds of informal markets in india in my phd and that's the research that i continue to do continue to do so even now and i studied the agra so agra's footwear cluster i studied coal mafia in dhanbad i also studied the independent sex work in new delhi it's so not not the sex workers who are in the red light area but the independent ones and after that my research has also moved into the direction of higher education so i try understand how higher education governance and regulations work so i am now for instance the nep the national education policy steering committee member for the government of maharashtra doing whatever little bit that i can do i'm also i've also begun doing my research doing some research in public procurement which is the government tenders it's one of those areas which is relatively boring but i think extremely important and you know during uh, post my phd i used to teach i mean i i used to teach courses on economics law and economics public policy so public policy is a very interesting discipline right so it has an in flame for instance i am a i'm an associate professor in public policy so public policy allows me to enjoy the diversity of disciplines because it's like the mba of social sciences i say <laughs> yeah so it has all kinds of theoretical frameworks pulled out from sociology from economics from political science but you can't just stay up your own ass <laughs> yes yeah of course that is that is true and and that has that has inspired me to you know understand india at the local level so while policy framing happens at the center i think it's really at the district taluka or even village level that we really see it manifested and hence you know when i returned to india and um, i had a chance to do the gazetteer of a district in um, in haryana and that inspired me into thinking how british were governing us which is by documenting us at district levels now we have a huge amount of data and statistics that gets generated in india you know if you buy a car it is registered if you you know go in a train you know you're documented in fact the moment you buy a shirt you know you are again documented if you use your card and even if you don't at least the company you know sale is documented so the government is sitting on tons and tons of data except that it is never accessible it's you know printed in hard copies forgotten about it and so i thought why can't we collect it meaningfully visualize it digitize it and give it to the world you know a small local entrepreneur would like to know how many cars are being purchased in his city if he or she is wanting to set up a mechanic shop let's say right so so i thought let me create these repositories of knowledge where there are local level data statistics data and statistics that are popularized and so now what i'm also doing is in addition to my research on gazetteers which is also cultures i'm also doing work on local level statistics mapping and how india collects its data what are the issues there and why we need to look at district level or small scale data and statistics as well as cultures extensively so before the break we discussed a lot on how local cultures matter and how decentralized understanding of india is very important similarly i would say and which is also the second part of my project in flame is that local statistics matters as much you know typically so maharashtra is around 11 12 crore people which is you know six times portugal okay a small uh, where are our six cristiano ronaldos kahan hai 
<laughs> well, they are there. They're not, just not known yet, and I don't think they'll ever be known. And this is, you know, um, and by the way, Cristiano Ronaldo is also require a huge amount of training, which is so you know, it's like shining and polishing. Which, but ये मैं भी सोचता हूँ कि कहाँ हैं ये लोग? But you know, if you look at if you look at small towns, so Usmanabad, you know, recently they've uh, renamed it Dharashiv. So how many? I mean, so it's an aspirational district. one of the very low income districts in maharashtra i mean it has almost 16 17 lakh people i mean look at the size of the population there so statistics of these people or of this district is somewhere there but it's not accessible to you or me i mean it can be accessible but we'll have to go there probably if we want to find out number of cars in usmanabad we'll have to go to its rto office and things like that so you know that's also part of what i'm doing in terms of my research is district level statistics and cultures but i want to uh, mention about one part of my research which i think is useful because it helps explain our conversation earlier and also will explain why i do what i do in economics also which is to do with how informal markets work in india so these are markets that you know are not there on paper but but they are some of the most thriving places um and if you want to distinguish between the west and the east and i think this is one very unique proxy that we found is that non western countries have a significantly overwhelming presence of informal markets whether it's thailand or vietnam or nigeria or india for that matter so how is it possible how is it that they exist in fact they thrive whereas uh, you know in the western countries they don't and one of the ways in which i try to explain this both in my research as well as in my both in my phd research as well as in my publications is that these markets hinge on tacit knowledge which you know michael polani used to talk about it uh, friedrich hayek also mentioned a little bit when he was talking about spontaneous order that there is this knowledge which is decentralized and exists in the minds of people it's basically like i know more than i can tell and so because i if the market rests on that knowledge which can't by definition be explicitly categorized or stated then it's hard to formalize it because in order for a market to be formal the knowledge has to be formal so i don't know your credit worthiness because it's not formal but i own but you know your friend knows it only because my, his your friend knows you so there is a tacit knowledge that he has that if amit is borrowing money from me will amit be able to repay in time or not there is no formula to it if a bank has to give loan to amit the bank has to pull out the credit worthiness you know uh, on paper based on the assets that amit has and so on and so forth that means for the bank the search cost of credit worthiness is very high but for amit's friend it's not very high and so amit's friend and amit will deal in this business very easily and the banks will be out and because they are out of the banking system by and large they are out of formal system and so there is massive amount of informal networks that we have largely driven through tacit knowledge connecting this to the conversation we were having earlier is that this might simply be an offshoot of the experiential knowledge that we were talking about and theory driven knowledge so anything in non western societies which exists in the mind because it has come through experience through customs through modes of behavior through networks becomes difficult by definition to to make to be made explicit and because you can't make it explicit it's these markets are stubborn to be formalized governments have tried a lot i mean and scholars often say these markets are informal because they want to be outside the tax bracket because the transaction cost of following the laws are too high or because the government enforcement apparatus is weak but i don't think they, this is really going to the core of the problem which is what i've tried to do in my research the core of the problem lies in the knowledge systems through which these markets operate and are those knowledge systems at all possible to be formalized or not if you can't formalize those knowledge systems chances are these markets will evade formal designs of uh, law for that matter now this means there is a huge disadvantage that they may have which is that they may not be able to scale like uh, your friend will be able to do business with you but if you want to borrow huge amount of money you need a bank and the bank will not give you money because the bank doesn't have explicit knowledge about your funds etc and hopefully over time and now with the advent of ai a lot of this explicit knowledge is becoming more and more a lot of this tacit knowledge is becoming more and more explicit so i'm hoping that this scaling can happen but even but i'm sure there must be ways of scaling even these informal natures of uh, transactions uh, what those systems are how those knowledge frameworks could be evolved is still something which is a work in progress but all of this probably will indicate that 
I'm someone who's interested in small towns. And that's why I'm studying them, uh, both in my project and even in my research. And in that sense, I think the future of India also lies in its small towns. I had done uh, an episode with Rahul Mathan where he was talking about how data is uh, used to determine creditworthiness by algorithms in ways that humans would not possibly imagine. They are so crazy. Like, for example, what is the average charge on your phone? Like someone who lets his phone charge run out too much is not likely to be as credit worthy as someone who keeps it high. <laughs> or do you do you use all Wonderful. caps while typing WhatsApp messages? And I mean, I don't know which way the pendulum swings, but I am guessing if you are always shouting on WhatsApp, you are less likely to be credit worthy Wonderful. again. Perhaps you know. So AI will come up with all these insane things, like like you know your thing about uh, second year of engineering. Me math me acha kia. So which uh, yes. we can't yes. possibly make head or tail yes. of, but is nevertheless there is sort of. something to it i'm going to double click on a couple of these i realize i'm taking time away from talking about your book which i really want to do but your book is out there and everyone can read it and we will talk about it for as long as we can but what i have not read about earlier is you mentioned coal mafia in dhanbad and then sex workers in delhi uh, unorganized tell me a little bit more about what drove you to do those and what did you find because they sound incredibly interesting to me <laughs> wow okay so so you know Anurag Kashyap made this movie called Gangs of Wasipur. <laughs> I will not go beyond that movie to tell you what drove me to Dhanbad. So the movie, you know, I was hugely inspired by the movie. I wanted to dig deeper. I have friends from Dhanbad um, and from Bihar and I told you about my first job which used to be, you know, in in and around Calcutta and Delhi. So eastern eastern part of India has fascinated me in its own right. So I decided to take a plunge and try to understand really what is this going on because interestingly first of all mafia is a misnomer i think mafia in the academic world or scholarly world is understood in the context of italian mafia mafiosi who were very prominent both in italy as well as in the east coast and then you know this word was kind of used abused by many other people particularly journalists so we call dhanbad mafia as mafia but i don't know if that can fit but that doesn't matter let's you know let's keep that aside nomenclature as aside but i wanted to see why dhanbad attracted coal mafia while many other coal mines did not and what is so special about this place and why could people not come out of why was government which wanted to get out of the mafia's control could not do it and so i go there i start reading a lot of vernacular literature by the way amit i have to emphasize on the show how important you were asking me about you know what can we do to create a framework or undo the types of uh, intellectual violence we have done by western frameworks in india i think one of the most important answers lies in our vernacular literature books stories memoirs scholarly literature written by people in local languages by some local publisher I mean, there are brilliance, and you know, one of the things that internet has done—it has killed local intellectuals, which I feel very sad about. Every small town has its has his, uh, you know, its own intellectual or group of intellectuals, but these guys uh, may not be, you know, may not be part of a network where they could publish with top publishers, or even write books for that matter. So I think a lot of my own understanding of the world has also come from. you know local writers in vernacular so the, the socrates of gutcheroli sits alone tonight <laughs> yes <carry on. laughs> you're right uh, i mean i just hope he's not uh, poisoned to death <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> which was by the way through a very democratic process there uh, you go we'll, <laughs> we'll come to democracy and elections after this yeah so i um, so you know i go to dhanbad i read books and i talk to people and this is what i find so mines in and around jharia in dhanbad that region is very very rich because the coal was a very high grade quality coal british uh, kind of found it and then they started getting more and more coal out of it i mean british and coal what do you expect right and that's what they did in england so they start looking for workers and laborers to work in inhuman condition in the mines so they hire these people who they call, who are often called as pehlwans or sardars these sardars are basically labor agents they get labor from eastern up bihar and other places poor folks sometimes farmers during their lean seasons and they come and work in the mines and the and these people you know get paid for how many men they provide this continues in a very exploitative fashion for decades together and when the british leaves the government nationalizes it sorry and doesn't nationalize it these mines remain in the hands of private owners so many of these mines were purchased by you know some merchants uh, but mines are all private 
at the time of independence. So it, they simply changed hands from some British to some Indian. This goes on until the 60s and 70s when in mid 70s the government decides Indira Gandhi government decides to nationalize it just like they nationalize many other things um and so overnight they decide that we so the system in the mines remained such until nationalization so british the way in which british extracted mines through extensive exploitation continued after that and when british uh, when uh, indian government nationalizes the coal mines this is what happens and this is you know an interesting thing because it takes us to the conversation on democracy now they nationalize the mine but they can't fire the workers because they are voters uh, and by the way let me remind you this was the region because of the large number of laborers working in the mines dhanbad region was one of the most prominent hotbed for even independence movement in fact 1920 i think it was 1920 when gandhi went there and spoke to the workers because if you mobilize these workers en masse against british you have a strong case for independence as well so it was an important mo moment place politically so that is why this region has also attracted many political leaders as well anyway coming back to the story after the so the nationalization happened overnight and the government announced that we will retain the workers who will be given the government jobs these sardars and pehlwans therefore overnight created lists like shindas list lists of workers in the region who are employed in the mines fictitious names many names that they would otherwise bring from their villages and planted themselves in important positions within what was then to be called as coal india limited over time these people became therefore the union leaders these sardars because they are the ones who are getting laborers and workers now this is unique because this goes this kind of this eludes a western mind i'll tell you what eludes the western mind and i'll uh, sort of you know from your and my experience and then connected to dhanbad so imagine a a maid servant in your or my home who comes to clean the dishes or cook food or clean the house would we call this person a slave maybe we may not want to use that term and at the same time we also know that the lady or the person who comes is disadvantaged and that is why the person is doing something that you and i are not doing at the same time if we ask this question to this lady do you consider yourself a slave in this house the lady would probably say no i don't consider as slave this is a job that i entered voluntarily nobody is forcing me to do it and uh, you know i get paid whatever is the market rate so there is no slavery going on so on and so forth to a western mind this is indeed one In fact if you remember the case of Devyani Cobra Garden the you know the Indian counselor in New York she was not being paid the minimum wage even though she was paying being paid the wage that the that would otherwise Indians would otherwise pay to their maid servants so therefore it was not slavery at all from their perspective how do we make sense of the fact that the job that you and I don't want to do somebody else is doing but that is not slavery just because the person is not forced So Jan Bremen this Dutch scholar comes to India and he finds this going on now this is this happens in you know this happens in in farmlands where there are tenants who are working on somebody else's land this happened during zamindari this happens in any relationship where there is one person more powerful and the person less powerful but then by that logic every relationship has it even in a corporate setups you know they of we often call them as corporate slaves are you a slave of flame i am not thankfully because i am a you know universities are not designed in that same way perhaps thankfully So if I were working in a bank uh, probably I would be right doing things that you don't want to but so look gulam is a translation of slave I would you know I would I would just say that I even disagree with your contention that a western through a western frame that is slavery it isn't unless you're a radical left wing activist any uh, any voluntary contract between two people isn't slavery period so yeah in, i mean uh, so in, uh, you know people it, it, can differ on what is voluntary so you are right huh. i would i would also consider this to be an extreme position that somebody would take but it uh, you know but prominent narratives indicated such no no i'm just saying that it's it's a, it's it's a crazy far left narrative no reasonable person would say that somebody doing a job is a slave just because there's a power differential 
That's insane. I mean, in fact, that is one reason I think Western left-wing activists got it completely wrong on sweatshops. I think sweatshops are a service to humanity because everybody who works in a sweatshop is getting an opportunity to do the best job available to them. Okay. They've chosen that job so, over so every right. other job. So to call them slaves and to make that judgment on their behalf when you're sitting in an air-conditioned university room somewhere is incredibly condescending. So you're right. So I think And this I, is... I will also point out, I had done, in fact, a, a column where I mentioned these things long ago that there were Western campaigns carried out against child labor and from you know what I remember I think UNICEF did one study and there was another study run by Oxfam and they found that wherever child you know in particular factories children who were working were let go the boys went to crime the girls all became prostitutes you're, no you're right absolutely in fact, in fact so western is, uh, condescension of this is terrible but I think by and large most people in the west are reasonable if it's voluntary it is fine but you understand where it's coming from right so it's mm. very easy for them to think that people who are working in mines are actually doing slavery yeah. because you know they've been working in this I the mindset condition. i would just say that it's it's like a university left wing mindset most ordinary people would say that hey you know i'm doing a job out of my own free will yeah there's a power differential no i'm not a slave so here's so so i think you are absolutely bang on and this is what leads to a certain type of framework to emerge to explain this so if a western mind who's not able to explain this but is still seeing this in practice well, how does he explain this if it is not slavery? So here's a frame. But that I'm using Milton Friedman and Hayek's language ah, to correct. explain it. That's but, a but, Western but, frame. But these guys are also Western. So in, in that sense, there is no universal definition that the Westerners have. Mm. But we will not be surprised if a Westerner flinches looking at a coal mine laborer and saying that this, this is slavery going on in modern day. Um, the point I am trying to build is the framework that many of these scholars have often built around this is the framework of patronage and exploitation and they're saying that patronage and exploitation happens alongside happen coexist together so the person who is your slave is also dependent on you for his or her survival so he has his daughter's wedding he will come to you to give him money for the daughter's wedding at the same time you will also treat uh, him or her you know whichever way you want this doesn't go very conveniently in the like you put it the left wing uh, you know western western intellectuals and this is the same thing was going on within uh, in Dhanbad as well, right? So, coming back to the story where I started, I realized that these people also become union leaders because they these sardars and pehlwans are getting the workers and laborers into the into the mines. And when you have union leadership, you know what it can lead to. And if you control labor in a coal mine, you pretty much control the the entire mine because without these laborers, no matter which private individual has purchased the coal you this guy needs the labor in order to load his truck from the mine so the government tried in the mid 2000s to you know create an auction e auction for uh, coal mines so that people don't have to physically come there and be threatened <laughs> by these coal mafia so i could sit here in mumbai and bid for a certain type of coal in a certain mine in a certain colliery and the computer will generate a delivery because i bid the highest amount but the problem is on that day, I have to physically go there or send my truck to load my truck. And that loading happens through these workers. And if these workers are controlled by the union leader who is telling them which, which truck to load and which one not to, you clearly have a case of, uh, you know, exploitation. You have a case of appropriation. So the way coal mines, the way Dhanbad Mafia used to work was for every loading, they would charge a small amount of commission. And of course, for the coal, for the buyer, it's okay because if the number is fixed, then he just simply needs to factor it in. Factor it in, and you know the consumers pay. And I realized through my research that this number was high to the extent of around nine percent coal price was loaded, you know, due to the presence of the quote unquote mafia. And therefore, one of the conclusions that I drew from this research is that you will have mafia, or you will have this exploitation if you have strong union. But you need to have a union because obviously from the framework from the framework of patronage and exploitation, obviously these people are exploited and you need a union leader in order to who can then represent the interest of the workers. Now there is a lot of historical and historical context and nuances that I have eased out in this discussion. But by and large, mafia in Dunbad used to work because there was a very strong union leadership and the union leaders would obviously get corrupted. And they would then, uh, you know, go hand in glove with the owners or promoters. They will run the show. They may actually not work in the interest of the workers, uh, but appropriate the entire funds. And this is what happened when the government nationalized it. I mean, it continues to be nationalized. There are discussions that they will privatize coal. So is this still the case? 
it continues to be the case i would say in fact you know the story gangs of wasipur kind of sim- showed a similar mm-hmm. framework right so the it's the union leader and by the way these union leaders became so powerful that they became member of parliaments and member of legislative assemblies and the moment you enter politics first of all you have so many votes and then you enter politics you amass even greater power so now the fights that happen are between these families so there are two three families who control a specific number of collieries and uh, they charge a commission whether it happens today today i don't know uh, but surely it did happen during you know un- at least until the time i was doing my phd and i then i that the, pap- the paper got published and i said the the whole point of this is that if you create unions it's very easy for it to be converted into a mafia especially when you don't have an option of bringing your own labor whether they are useful for the workers or not is another question i don't think they are and so the workers are worse off the buyers are worse off the government is worse off for the taxes basically everybody is worse off but you need to protect the unions so you need to protect the unions and now it's in the interest you know there's a, there are incentives for the leaders to ensure that unions are protected because they are benefiting from it am i arguing against union i don't know but i'm definitely argue, i'm definitely saying that unions will help the workers uh, please let us get out of this mindset that unions help those who they are expected to help i mean classic public choice right is it the case here that in like unions everywhere would not be like this is it the case that this union is particularly harmful because it is both a monopsony on one side and a monopoly on the other side that it is a monopsony in the sense it is the only place that particular band of laborers can go to sell their wares and a monopoly in the sense that it is the only place that the company can buy labor from uh so because that would then be the source of the power isn't it uh, it's a good point i don't think that it's a monopsony of laborers because the laborers are hooked on to a particular colliery but they can i mean i mean i'll have to go deeper into this but i my my sense is that these workers are not necessarily permanent in the i mean some of them are surely because they will be on paper but many of them are like floating population and so you know they might just go to another colliery if they're getting a better wage but by and large what happens is that this is all fixed so they you know they're and they don't get to sell the coal they are only loading and unloading coal so all coal in this country is owned by the government of india if you want to buy coal you can only buy from the government you can only own a coal mine if you want to use it for captive consumption so if you want to use coal for electricity generation in your power plant only then you can own a coal mine but all mines are otherwise owned by the government so coal india limited is this big fat company sitting on the res- all the reserves of coal that india has um you know has its own issues you know i i think i think there, this is time that we should think about what do we do with our coal mines where all kinds of and by the way this is particularly the case in dhanbad and jharia coal mines uh, not others because many of those coal mines were discovered post independence and so the government could set those systems better but this one had its also path dependent the uh, legacy problem the legacy problem yeah it's like old clunky software and now you can't get the bug out of the system uh, sex work in delhi well so you know after the rise of smartphones sex workers can engage with the clients directly and this would otherwise obviate the need for them to you know be in the clutches of you know quote unquote pimp right the who in the literature is often regarded as the most uh, vicious character who forces uh, women to you know undergo you know who forces women uh, to engage in sex work so i so th- i mean this is well uh, studied in the literature so what i try to do is to see a certain part of delhi where independent sex workers you know professed and and you know there was a there's this primary survey i did with many of them through the help of a non profit and i realized that i can categorize those sex workers in two groups category 1 are home based and category 2 is street based so home based are sex workers who use a home to profess street based are those sex workers who are typically on the street now the street based sex workers suffer greater violence at the hands of police or violent clients home based sex workers suffer less so and my question was that why would people why would women prefer to be a street based sex worker and you know and i and i was also looking at the question of you know how does a home home based sex worker operate without a pimp so it turns out that the home based sex worker gets a small apartment or a small room on rent from a pimp by and large so in other words the literature was arguing that with the rise of smartphones or rise of uh, cell phones we will no longer need to have pimps and the client and the 
client and the sex worker will be able to engage with each other and i i realized over uh, through this research that pimps have not gone out of the market in fact they're still prevalent a different kind of pimp has emerged who provides the space for sex workers to profess at the same time it is the pimp who also pro provides protection to the sex worker both from police and violent clients and therefore pimps existed in my in my study i discovered that pimps exist to provide a service to sex workers they absorb the transaction cost and the uncertainty of being a sex worker in a country like india where even though sex for money is legal prostitution is legal but uh, everything else associated with it is illegal so is thus right. rendering it illegal in de facto so pimps offer actually a very valuable service because of exploitative state in other words to think that sex work is a result of pimp we have to go out of that thinking in fact sex work is a result of the state or let's say exploitative sex work is a result of the state not pimps can you explain that a bit more because i i guess sex work would arise because it's one way to get an income instead yeah, yeah. so uh, that's how i said exploitative sex work is a result of the state not sex work so what happens is you you would expect so let me explain this again you mm know -hmm. in a, in simpler words one would expect that pimps take away huge amount of commission from the sex workers so you don't need them if sex workers can engage with the clients directly but i realize that even independent sex workers need them and the answer to that question is well they need them because this got it because there's no rule of law and because it is illegal yeah so, because the pimp is the one who provides protection to the sex worker yeah. from violent clients or even police so yeah. pimp manages the police and sex workers therefore can practice yeah. can profess in 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 peace so if you really want to get the pimps out you have to get the state out yeah fantastic point yeah i mean if you want to get and until then do not label pimps as the horrible exploitative person. i mean maybe there are pimps who have been exploited and i am not trying to deny it but to paint all of them in this picture is something that i don't think we can do based on my own field research in western part of delhi in the, in some uh, residential neighborhoods so i've done a past episode and i've also written pieces on how victimless crimes should not be criminalized because the moment they are the underworld gets in which exactly. is exactly what is exactly. happening here exactly. there's no reason for prostitution to be illegal voluntary transactions between adults the moment you make it illegal you bring the underworld in and you exactly. also make the pimp necessary to protect the sex worker from the police you know just see the uh, irony magnificent and, um, and that is why when i realize that why do some sex workers prefer to do street based sex work without the need or the use of pimp i realize that these are sex workers who get paid much less they are older they have much fewer clients sorry they paid much less but they have far more number of clients but they also suffer at the hands of police and violent clients significantly more than the home based sex workers so one conclusion that i could draw from this is that only when you don't have an option to be a home based sex worker you will you resort to street based sex work otherwise you would prefer a home based sex work because you have the protection from the pimp wow it was very telling actually when i when i did that yeah so at this point i'll quickly recommend a book called intimate city by manjima bhattacharya yeah, yeah, read it course, yeah 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 she was on my show as well so oh, nice. uh, fantastic book let's let's get to talking about uh, who moved my vote tell me a little bit about how the book came to be in the sense how did you get interested in the subject what was it that led to the collaboration because you have a co-author in the book how how did all of that work out tell me about the processes uh, that led to the book and the interest that led to the book well so i think i am from western up where politics is the talk of the town i think that would be the case in most part of india anyway and so i was always interested in this theatrics of democracy called elections and i so when i you know so it was something that i was always interested in but never had never put a serious mind to thinking about it in a rigorous manner so when i was doing my phd one of my uh, batchmates also from india uh, but who was uh, a year senior there arun koshik you know was also you know doing the same same program and we met and we became friends instantly we continue to be very very good friends he later on also joined jindal university so we became colleagues so it was during the phd time when during you know one of those random conversations so we started thinking about this more seriously it really came you know came on the table because arun had written an article when he was studying in igidr on seat share and vote share and sort of compared it with many other indicators and so he started telling me about it and i started getting interested i i became so hooked on to it that i read a lot about it and i realized that 
while in india people talk about seats all the time and this is i think 2014 1314 or something they don't talk about votes as much and that was baffling to me because i thought votes need to be a stronger measure of how much a party is liked or disliked and not seats because you know you have you can win by one vote or you can win by a million vote you still get to have the same say in the parliament whereas in one case you are in the parliament with a lot more with a lot bigger mandate while the other case you're not there with such big mandate but you still get the same same importance this was even more peculiar or rather this was even more intriguing because we were in europe and you know how voting happens in european union so in the in the parliament every country has fixed number of votes based on the population and so therefore and sometimes if each country has only one vote the small countries tend to become a lot more weightier than they otherwise would so and then we started reading on you know how do you weight certain votes and so on and so forth and i told arun you know this is an interesting idea let's uh, work more on it and you know pick up some stories from states what's really going on let me tell you this with an example um, and which is uh, we're going to make things very easy at least for for the listeners let's say there are three constituencies you and i contest in them you win in two and i win in one you get to make the government but let's say you win with 51 votes against 49 of mine in both the constituencies and in the third constituency i win with 100 votes and you don't get any so the total number of votes you get is 51 plus 51 plus 0 that's 102 number of votes that i get is 49 plus 49 plus 100 that's 198 you get 102 votes i get 198 votes you get to form the government now this is bizarre but this will happen if the equation is set like this and we started thinking about is this only a mathematical problem true in theory uh, and never in practice or does this really happen and turns out that it happens number of times it has happened in india many times so what we are trying to show is a all the votes that came to me are wasted you've become the leader of even those who didn't vote for you so maybe you have become the leader with fewer number of votes the second the fewer number of votes it doesn't matter what is the strength with which you have won where you won so we just ran some numbers and we realized well this is going on in india and we need to write about it but you know like any like any aspiring academic who's doing his phd in a different discipline and who has pressures of publications in the field of expertise this was just a fun project that we picked up so it was never taken up so seriously by us that we would really want to write on it but it it was like in the back burner right it was kind of cooking cooking slowly and you know phd happened we came to india he was elsewhere i was in jindal then you know he joined us and then also it started cooking we started writing some papers in economic and political weekly we wrote some op-eds so this idea was kind of continuously tickling us until a point of time when we met kartika so i actually happened to meet ragu karnad who i gave this who sort of proposed this idea to and he was uh, very excited and he said you gang i think this is important and why don't you meet uh, uh, why don't you meet kartika who you know was who had just taken over westland uh, the you know being the chief editor of westland and i arun and i we met her she really liked the idea and she said no this really deserves a book we have to write it in very very accessible manner so that you know everybody who's an untrained in numbers can also understand it and and so the journey began and frankly it began in um, 2018 or 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 so or if i'm not mistaken 2017 18 or 19 or something like that and so so a lot of back and forth finally this was done covid was a time when we were we were really able to finish it we had to redo we had to update this book many times because many elections took place during <laughs> this process but you know it was a fun journey and in writing this i think what we decided is we'll add lots of anecdotes and stories so that uh, people understand so i mean in some ways through this book we wanted to show not of how we vote but how we get when we vote how what we get when we vote right so are the mandates leaked if they are is it because of certain type of design of electoral method and we realize it is because of that so we are allaying our excitement with elections in this in this book we want to show that elections are not everything just to equate democracy with elections is um, not going to be of much use because elections are after all an equation and just like any other mathematical formula you can call this formula as well and so it's a number game so what we have tried to do in this book is we have not looked at any jan bhavna we have not 
we have not made any speculative statement we were very very clear uh, this particular caste votes for this particular you know party or women voted for this we have tried to keep these type of speculations as little as possible and even with lots of lots of riders all we've looked at is the reveal preference which is how have people voted and what did they get after that i uh, i love the prose of the book so you definitely delivered to kartika's demand that you know it be accessible it had storytelling the language was simple and clear and we were discussing the importance of that earlier so obviously that's just what i would expect and what i particularly also liked was uh, right from the start you uh, you know made the focus clear that this is about elections not democracy and i think that's somewhere where people like me and so many scholars and so on will get waylaid where we will talk about how we might be a democracy but we are not a republic rules of the game constitution blah 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 you know thinking of elections as oh we just take it for granted it's normalized there is a procedure and of course we will lament majoritarian rule and what what will happen if two wolves and a lamb meet and they vote for what to have for lunch etc etc but those are all cliches but we took the system for granted or didn't really speak about it much i mean i i've had long conversations with jp narayan on the show about proportional representation mm-hmm. versus first past the post mm-hmm. but not more than that but you got me to thinking about not just how important the exact form of elections is in a democracy but how it pervades into our lives and this takes me to big boss so you know when big boss became popular in india at one point i remember 13 14 years ago i was watching it every day live tweeting all of that at a particular point in time and people were like why are you so obsessed but i will just like you could apply game theory to it so well and for example the voting mechanism Mm-hmm. now if the voting mechanism is that you vo- you have you vote on who should leave the house mm. then the smart strategy is to keep a low profile and not be noticed mm. right but if the voting strategy is on who to keep in the house then the smart strategy is to be an extremely polarizing character where it doesn't matter how many neg- if you get the most negative votes but you'll get enough positives to keep you in right and i think they changed it from one season to the other i don't remember the details but i remember that when the voting strategy was that they are voting to kick somebody out i said rahul roy will win because he was a most low profile you hardly saw yeah. him mm-hmm. he seemed doped out all the time yeah. and eventually he did win right and to me it was a natural <laughs> consequence of the way the voting system was That's and okay. similarly in first past the post you know you've yeah you've you made a n- number of trenchant observations for example the person who ends up getting voted in a multi way election is a person who is the least hated and not the most liked and that affects you know how you vote and 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 the other important uh, sort of observation you made is because parties come to power on the basis of constituencies of one and not total votes you came up with this uh, sort of concept and, and it's the first time here that i'm reading about it which is uh, the leakage of preferences right which is preference leakage and you and you came out with a measure for the difference between a vote share and a seat share yeah. which you called a disp right this proportional the, yeah. this proportional um, this thing so explain that to me because i find that fascinating because in through the book when i was just looking at how disp how do you do you say disp or yeah, dis, d- dis- so it's like short form of disproportionality yeah yeah i know but do you say disp or do you say disp well we we just call it disproportionality it's only written as disp oh okay it's i'm like not going to say disproportionality yaar is bahut lamb how many syllables are there i can't we, we can coin that term now if you like Uh, so yeah yeah i mean whatever so i i i will just say this yeah. so yeah so i i found that measure really interesting like there are certain elections like you know for example the way it changes in bihar over time the way it changes in bengal and kerala over time and what it indicates and one of your fundamental premises is that the higher the disp the more the leakage in preference in other words the less the voters are actually getting what they voted for yes. your votes aren't translating into yes. seats right. and in, in an ideal situation what you are saying is that your vote should translate into seats pretty much more or less if it is even that is the perfect system yeah. though which is proportional representation right yeah. so yeah. G- give me a sense of your thinking on the different systems that could possibly be the case and you know you've mentioned the constitutional debates around this and so on and so forth but what are sort of the pros and the cons of this because typically what happens is that when we are in one equilibrium and we lament it we will look at the cons of that particular equilibrium and compare it with some other equilibrium 
and with the pros of that you know where that looks perfect yeah, yeah. but every system has its flaws in practice and you've studied electoral systems throughout the world right yeah. so what is your sense was this good for india what are the pros and cons if yeah, you can so spell I, them out? i mean first of all i mean i don't think i have studied all the electoral systems but by and large there are different types of electoral systems uh, coming from uh, public choice theory itself so you know how do you aggregate preferences but you know i just want to put in perspective <laughs> frankly i mean I I wish I'd seen Big Boss I would have used that example in my in the book I've never seen a single episode That's mind blowing yeah. It's a it's a, a I mean I haven't watched it for 10 years but you should but it happens every year so you mm. should check it out and because it'll it'll just be so clear I because the winning strategy has to be determined by how, how the voting goes So it's basically an equation so if you you know write the equation differently the answer, you know the strategy becomes different So right now I think what we do is we choose the person who's most liked but not the least hated and therefore it is in the in, I mean there are incentives for the political party to be as uh, aggressive as possible because you you'll be liked by most even though you may not be liked by the most but you'll be hated by the least sorry what you said exactly mm. so um i think let me see there are two three points that you raised so one of the points is leakages so when your vote has gone to a loser by and large it is wasted because the loser doesn't get anything now this doesn't mean that you know when when it it's quote unquote wasted wasted but it is definitely leaked because what happens is out of a class of uh, i don't know let's say 100 voters and there are 10 people who are contesting everybody gets 10 votes except the last two where one person gets 9 and one person gets 11 so you can be, so the person who gets 11 votes can become the leader of the entire group so 89 votes did not go to this guy and they were kind of lost this you can preserve this you can you can minimize this wastage by creating or curating a new system of election so for instance you know what happens in france that we saw so you know everybody contests and people vote and in that first round the top two people are picked up and then the entire population has to vote again to those two people so if your first preference lost in the first round you are still not wasting that your preference you are still giving it to the top two some of them will still be wasted but not all of them similarly there are instant runoff voting there are proportional representation that i mentioned in the book that we mentioned in the book and we uh, for for us any system could potentially be better than first past the post system as long as the goal is to arrest the leakages of preferences the problem is no system is easier than first past the post system also to implement right you come to the ballot paper you know you put your you cast your vote and you leave and that's pretty much it whoever gets the largest number of votes gets to win even if they are not more than 50% uh, in fact you know interestingly in 1952 elections which we think were dominated by congress you know there were around 8 crore people who voted in 1952 you know how many of them voted for congress around 3.6 or 3.7 crores which basically means more than half the country did not vote for congress in 1952 it's another matter that you know 40% or 45% of vote share itself is a huge number in a democracy they got 74% seats with 40% votes from your book yeah so so there you go so in other words first of all let us think about this for a moment and consider okay so 60% of indians did not vote for congress in 1952 quite startling fact because we are dominated by the overwhelming impression of how many seats you get and not vote so but 60% indians were not voting even though 70% of the seats they got so any other system will be better than this because any other system means so there are a bunch of them right so you have board account method you have proportional representation which can be in form of instant runoff voting let me try to explain how instant runoff voting will work instead of uh, you know if the so this is something that i did in one of my classes so i asked them to vote for you know for the winner there were some elections happening in the class and so they wrote the person who they prefer the most then i asked them give them a score out of 10 and so they all gave them the scores and then i asked them give them a preference order who is the first who is the second who is the third so you see all the three things are doing the same thing but can you imagine that second and third will probably yield or furnish a different answer than the first because in the first people who hated the winner may have put him at him or her at the third position so you have the largest number of people hating him but you also the largest number of people putting him in the first position in the first case you will only get the guys who are putting him in the first position in the sec in the third case which is the ranking you know this guy could be also the most hated in the second case because there's a score you don't know if the second guy could win because he has got average score for all from all of the people and maybe this guy who is the least hated or 
or liked by most people uh, you know at an aggregate so if you can make an equation of of this type you know three marks for being liked the most one mark for being hated the most two marks for average maybe this guy has got two marks from everyone and gets to win the win the scorecard this guy is could be potentially more deserving of a winner but more importantly each of their votes has now counted or at least most of their votes have counted and many countries do proportional representation half the world does proportional representation our president uh, is selected through proportional representation rajya sabha members so proportional representation is actually far more desirable and the constitution makers were pretty pretty convinced with this the reason why ambedkar and others did not decide to go for this is because the ease with which you can do first past the post system by far exceeds any other system and you know you have an illiterate population by and large who doesn't know how to vote that is why you need symbols to vote on because they can't read the name of the party or the or the or the leader you don't want to complicate the matters by telling them vote for the party and vote for the candidate and them having to know that this is the calculation we will use well just vote for whoever you think is the best guy um, and we'll just add it up it made sense then i don't know if it makes sense now because now we particularly first of all we now use uh, you know electronic voting machine which most of the developed world doesn't use actually so we have still computerized a lot of our calculation if we were to convert to any form of pr which is proportional representation i don't foresee a huge problem there what it will do is it will begin to consider and recognize the votes of those people who have voted to the losing party in a much more holistic fashion there are people you know who may want certain party you know in the center certain parties in the state they may want a certain party but not a candidate and they can't vote for the party they have to vote only for the candidate and the maybe they have maybe the candidate loses and so the party also loses so i mean anyway i'm i'm probably making it more complex than i wanted it to be but simply put first past the post system attempts to factor in more preferences than sorry proportional representation attempts to factor in more preferences than first past the post system but it is also a little bit more complicated for voters to understand and so it's the ease of functioning that first past the post system continues here which actually explains why we took first past the post because a big feature in first past the post is easy to implement but now that we have gotten past that situation where we actually have pretty advanced voting possible that may no longer apply you know how it almost turned around in the early 2000s right It, it I did. did an episode with J.P. Narayan, hmm. and he managed to convince, uh, I think, a bunch of the parties and even the Congress that let's shift to proportional representation. And then Sonia Gandhi put her foot down, and uh, she said no. And her logic was that, hey, we are getting more seats and vote, uh, we are getting better seat share than vote share right now. Why should we switch? So you see the <laughs> irony. You see the irony. So I mean, it's in the incentive of the political systems to maintain. the status quo because they are benefiting from it the, the one who's in charge will maintain the status quo all the exactly. parties whose seat share is lower than their vote exactly. share will obviously say hey we are on the wrong side of disp <laughs> <laughs> oh also... yeah you mentioned about disp yeah so disp is just for a you know quick bit i mm. forgot basically if you get lot more votes and very few seats or the other way around Uh, which is usually not the case you get more seats and uh, you know or the other way around actually which is mostly the case there is a disproportionality uh, because i mean there's a mathematical formula but we don't need to go there what basically it say what it basically says is i have so many more seats with so little votes that means i have been able to win in most of the seats with thin majority perhaps that's why my total votes are small but my total seats are large which also means that i am sitting on a wafer thin margin perhaps which could switch and therefore a lot of people who did not vote for me are in the constituencies where 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 i have won and so i am not really representing everybody or most of these people i am representing a small group of people who were somehow able to make me the winner there so that's why i have a large number of seats and very little number of now disproportionality will typically be high in any democracy because you know the i mean you know we don't have unanimous type of uh, election in large in large democracies and particularly in india because constituencies are really big each constituency like there are only 543 constituencies you know in in the in the population size that we have so with so many millions of votes surely you know the unanimous nature of elections is never going to be seen and therefore we will have some disp but the disp when it is really big that means the margins have to be very small chances are this party in the next election might not be successful or the party has to work very hard to make sure it is successful in the next election also because it might just be a chance that they are winning because the seats are in their pockets with small margins 
Yeah, in fact, you pointed out, I think, uh, the UP election, the one before the last one, which Adityanath won for the first time, the disc was very high. I think this, uh, the BJP seat share was I, much more uh, than... I will need to look it, look, look up the numbers. I'll tell you, but, I, think, uh, I, I think I've... Uh, uh, they could be high, but I would imagine they reduced uh, the next time. Yeah, exactly. So, yeah, I have they it here. Yeah, so, yeah. in uh, the, uh, they got 77.4% right. of seats on the foundation of 39.7% of exactly. votes. And the next time, 2022, which happened after your book was written, I think the vote share actually went up from 39.7 to 41 point something mm. but the seat share went down by quite a lot so that means they, they still that won be, that means the disp became better it be and you're yeah. right 2017 up witnessed probably the highest disp after 1977 so so in other words you know you you had to i mean so my so my takeaway from this is that uh, up up bjp worked very hard in up during 27 to 22 yeah. otherwise after such a high disp the chances of them losing are quite high. But they did not lose. That means they really worked. They, they really must work. have really worked hard. They must have really worked hard. We'll we'll come back to that and uh, we will go into those details. But first, I also want to talk about another broader structural issue in Indian politics, which you've illustrated so well uh, in your book, where you've spoken about, to start with, the increasing cost of elections, where you point out in 2019, political parties spent up to 8 billion or 55,000 crores. This is the annual GDP of uh, Tajikistan or Kyrgyzstan, as you write, and most Indians would not know where those are on a map. I say, naam leke bahut yeah. But, and you also pointed out a related, and, and the reason the, the sort of spending so high is that coming to power in the state guarantees you an ROI because the state has so much power. If we had a minimal state which only did rule of law, then elections would not cost so much because the incentives would be different and there would be no return on investment on spending so much money. But because we have such a parasitic state, you know that once you you are in charge of the levers of the state, you can, you know, milk it dry and therefore the spending goes up. Another great stat you pointed out is you named our top companies and the top companies in the West and you point out that our top companies all, you know, thrive, not entirely, but they thrive on government uh, patronage. You get government contracts, government services and all that, while that is absolutely not the case with the global companies like Apple, Alphabet, Microsoft, Facebook, etc. Where is government in that? So, obvious, so that this talks about sort of the interplay between between money and power and I once wrote a limerick on that I used to write a weekly limerick for Times of India mm -hmm. so I wrote the world's first limerick on public choice theory I will read okay. it out for you please it's called politics a neta who loves currency notes told me what his line of work denotes it is kind of funny we steal people's money and use some of it to buy their votes Right. So, and you've also in your book quoted Raghuram Rajan speaking in 2008 to the Bombay Chamber of uh, Commerce where he said, quote, the poor need the savvy politicians to help them navigate through rotten public services. A politician needs a corrupt businessman to provide the funds that allow him to supply patronage to the poor and fight elections. The corrupt businessman needs a politician to get natural resources cheaply and the politician needs the votes of the poor who are numerous enough to assure him re-election stop quote. So we have this crazy vicious cycle of dependency where to win elections you need tons of money the money will come from special interests and businesses because they know that once you come to power they will get an ROI because you will use the power of the state and serve your cronies well etc etc so this circle goes on and on I want to ask ask you about give me the deeper structural insight into why our system is like this. Like one part of the structural insight, of course, is that the state has way too much power and therefore it can generate money, it can generate returns. So the kind of politicians you apply are the kind of uh, politicians who would be applied to, you know, power and lucre for the sake of making money and not the public spirited minded thinking, Desh ke liye kuch karenge. you know, people like that join Flame University <laughs> as associate professors. But so, so, so give me a sense of but how you would think of the design of the political system so that shit like this doesn't happen. So can I give you like a real shaker? Kindly. I think we don't need elections. I think we should scrap elections and we should elect our leaders randomly by draw lots. <laughs> okay. And I'm being very serious about it. Mm. So I think elections are overrated. And elections have, by, by draw of lots, by the way, huh? not by appointments. Mm. Mm. Elections are overrated and I think elections have run their ground. We, uh, I don't think they give us anything now. They are essentially number games and that too not very good. And when people con the algorithm, they can figure out how to do it. If we let people, so it's basically, Amit, between transparency and accountability, which one do you think is more useful or more important? 
so do you really need to know how the person became the leader or you want the leader to be accountable and if both of them can't coexist which of them you'll put your money on which of them would you think is more desirable the process through which this person became our leader or i don't care what the process was but now that you're a leader you have to be accountable i would say that the accountability is a given and on top of that if you have a good process that helps so you know kenneth arrow got a nobel prize in economics is the youngest to win and you know one of the reasons why he shook the world is because he thought he he i mean he proved that uh, democracy is i mean the only way in which you know aggregation of preferences has no leakage or aggregation of preferences is perfect is when you have a dictator and so democracy is only the second best we don't have a better word better version and when he's talking about democracy he's talking about election methods now we can have better elect- electoral methods but all electoral methods will have their own leakages their own um, shortfalls and their own susceptibility to be conned and therefore now some research is emerging which is showing that if you have a leader however chosen if the person is accountable you will pretty much end with a better state of affairs and there are two arguments that go in favor of this the first argument is because the person has not gotten leadership through popularity or through popular vote he or she is under less of a pressure to please his or her constituency and so this person will be less influenced isn't that a call for limited terms i mean don't they serve the same yeah purpose? but 5 years is too long to destroy anything anyway mm. the second because this person is coming there by fluke and not by hard work he or she is going to be incentivized more to do hard to work harder and not think that he can he or she can do this the next time so there is only so much uh, you know there is only so much that can go in his favor this person has just been lucky and if the person has been lucky he or she would like to do the most of it as long as the person remains accountable i think what is the point of having elections in fact think about it this way after my nit experience i was of this belief that if you select students after a bare minimum some of their you know if you if you cover their basic aptitude test and if they are all good in it then you should select students based on draw lots all the iits and nits and national law schools and iim should be filled with students on the draw lots as long as they have qualified for some basic threshold aptitude and then these guys can because ultimately the difference between the amount of effort gone into conducting those entrance exam and huge amount of emotional torture that many of these students go through when they go to coaching institutions the quota stories are you know around you know out there for us to scoff you know to for us to to be so distraught by uh, similarly so much of effort goes into organizing elections if you have these people selected randomly and make them strongly accountable you probably got it now this is a crazy suggestion and therefore in the book we don't make it in the book we say we should argue, we argue in favor of better representation because ultimately look you know people will say that india became uh, india had a you know open market policy since the early 90s and you know really free market came about but i don't think it really happened in fact theek hai little bit of license raj has gone away but state is still the all powerful all supreme in this country you... i i wrote a piece in the wall street journal in 2005 where i argued exactly that that the 91 reforms didn't go far enough not at all fact, not the markets especially left completely untouched this you know the amount of money that campaign financing has in this country surpasses american campaign finance by and individuals don't have so much money only corporations have what is the business of a corporation to do to give so much money to a politician in a poor country like india or poor country in terms of per capita income well the only reason is if the corporation can expect to earn a lot more afterwards and so all kinds of, you know by, and by the way this is what drove me to do some research in public procurement so public procurement is an area of my research interest now thanks to this insight that you have uh, you know uh, picked it up from the book and thanks a lot for uh, you know bringing it out all these companies earn huge amount of money from these rent thick sectors which the governments control do you know back of the envelope calculation tells me that the total amount of public procurement by value in this country is more than 20% of its gdp which by the way in oecd countries is 10 to 11% maybe it goes to 15% so we spend so the government is the largest spender indian government is one of the largest spenders in the world 
surely is going to enrich so many companies who will then give them money for you know for conducting elections and uh, so on and so forth so there's huge amount and all of this only because of elections so while it's extremely difficult to argue this you know in in a space where i where i don't want to be lynched let's say or while it is very difficult to be to argue this in general i think there is merit in considering this i think you know what i'm i feel really jealous of your students because it is now becoming clear to me that you're the best kind of teacher in the sense that you ask these provocative questions which force a person to think but i would nevertheless respond to your provocative <laughs> question and say that my response to it would be that number 1 the choice between unelected or the choice between chosen by lot and accountable on the one hand and elected but not accountable on the other hand is a false choice because i think accountability is what we needed a good constitution for sadly ours is terribly lacking and the rules of the game don't have enough accountability in place and give too much power to the state which you should change anyway beyond that when it comes to iits iims and how we you know selecting by lot that's an absolutely delightful idea but there is one flaw that in instinctively comes to my mind which is that you are not just that one of the things that you are selecting for is desire who wants to be an engineer more and you know and how do you select for that if you choose by lot you could have some casual random guy who's like theek hai ha kar leta hu not a big I mean, deal but someone who's <laughs> deeply passionate about it or you're saying no one's ever how passionate many, about how it how many engineers you think have stuck to their profession those guys who were terribly desirous of there being there are some who are passionate about it still <laughs> yeah but yeah in fact frankly uh, if people think they have become engineers by fluke uh, and by luck are more likely to retain that profession than those who think you have come through hard work and now they are free to knock this profession out and go to medicine or uh, sorry medicine mba or uh, that's also true know, but i'm thinking of that rare guy who's got a passion for it and he can't get it because it's by lot as if this guy is getting it anyway no but, but if he has that deep desire for it he'll go to quota he'll do what it people, takes it's a terrible pe- system right people now people who have no no so people but figure who, out different ways to select people who get through these engineering entrance exams you are not measuring their desire you are only measuring if they are so desirous that they can put in so much of hard work in order to get through so your hard work is a proxy for their desire but yeah. do you think that really is because if you get one answer wrong in a typical je exam your rank slips by hundreds even thousands for that matter is does that mean that the person had less desire and did not do enough hard work in fact what we have done is we have created these machines which create these which throw people into depths of despair in fact what is the good need of that desire which makes you work so hard and even after that pushes you into this uncertain zone where you are still not sure whether you'll get through if these if this hard work was actually getting translated into selection i would give you this point and i would concede but i don't think this is happening in fact majority of engineers who get through through the jees or you know doctors who get through the the, the neat exams they are really being tested for their hard work and uh, their intelligence rather than their desire and the two may not be same also the hard work is a proxy country, for desire right it Every- may not be because in our country engineering or many of these disciplines are a proxy or or are a are a means to get higher income mo- move across the economic class ladder and so you really want to do this because this is the least risky option in term rather than compared compared to let's say starting a business so consider a typical person in uh, i mean you why do you want to be an engineer really because you want to be an engineer or you want to make sure that you have a steady job no no i'm saying 99% of people may not want it for the, what we would consider the right reasons but there might be 1% who's in fucking so love then, with so mechanical then, engineering <laughs> yaar mujhe machine do mere haath mein machine do you gank this person so, what does that guy do this person so you are wanting to put 99% of people at stake so that the one person can get their way no because the point is the number of losers in the system and the winners in the system are the same uh, the current system is broken because you should not have to go to quota to uh, you know there have to be better ways of selecting but there are more losers they are not the same no huh? there are more losers than winners in the system the number of seats are the same no not the number of seats number of people who apply and mm. who take the test and number of people who get through yeah you have more losers than winners no over there but all those people are not that many people are not going to get through anyway but imagine many of these people were given an opportunity to study because the drop lot got their name and now they think oh my god this is my chance to be an engineer and there is somebody and there are a bunch of people who really want to be engineer and now they cannot be an engineer because you know the luck did luck closed their way is to say that as if the other person luck as if the other system was making sure that 
these people who are really desirous are getting it i think the point of agreement for both you and me on this issue is simply by saying you know repeating what we said much earlier in the show that is increase of freaking supply there is no reason why everyone who wants to do engineering should not be able to do engineering not that we need more engineers <laughs> but uh, you know uh, that being the case but my point about doing this in politics is also that i am actually okay with career politicians provided you they have different incentives in the sense that a career politician will have institutional knowledge of the process and of the previous time she would have spent in government she would have got gotten some expertise along the way hopefully and i think that there is a value to that rather than put a random person no, in no but this there. random person could be somebody who can be chosen from amongst those people all i'm saying is scrap elections and by the mm. way the distinction you made between someone being chosen in a transparent manner and being pushed to be accountable thanks to constitution however you know however successfully it's doing its job vis-a-vis -vis somebody being elected through some opaque random process but being highly accountable in the, in both the cases we are agreeing accountability is important right in the only difference is in one case i am saying you don't need elections to elect a leader you can just uh, randomly select one you are saying you need an elect you need a leader look at the cost of having a leader through electoral process and i'm not even talking about the cost that you mention from the book you know the amount of money that is spent this cost has significant spillover both in government contracts the power of the government the big mighty bulky state crushing the uh, poor folks giving them patronage from this money all of this has a huge cost not just uh, monetary but also emotional in some ways and i will and i will tell you you elect a random person from a certain pool who i am as, who i am giving you that could be someone who has cleared some sort of you know quote and quote virtue exam this person is virtuous to be oh a politician god, or something oh my god yaar virtue ko matlab beech mein are aap who who will who will decide what is virtuous are so somebody is who not? has had an experience in public service let's say right so you select ias officers based on an exam you don't have to have an exam for politicians but anybody who wants to join the public service you can have some criteria on the basis of which you will have a pool shortened that criteria could be dependent upon the type of type of attributes you want a particular politician to have allow the draw lots to select these guys they are going to feel extremely lucky less bowed down by corporate and you know you know interest which may lead to regulatory capture they are less influenced by their own party members they're less influenced by a certain constituency which is voting for them they would really like to do a good job so that whatever time they have in their hands they are able to contribute at least at least not worse job than the others have done so far after spending so much of money and imposing huge amount of structural co cost to the structures of the systems itself I agree with you. I think I am reflexively being aggressively non-conventional in this particular <laughs> case to use Paul Graham's words because I'm hearing something new, but it's worth thinking about and also if you picked someone through the system you would never have had the emergency. There you Be go. Your there's full no, incentives no are different. Exactly. There's no incentive to do the yeah, emergency. All I'm saying is so here's something that uh, you know now that we're talking and I'm thinking loudly maybe this is what we should do. We should let the monitor of a class be selected randomly through a draw of lots. and see how this person performs as opposed to somebody who has pleased people to come to take that position i mean pleasing is performance when you perform you're not being true yeah but you know if you choose someone randomly by draw of lots to be monitor of the class and here i'm thinking aloud and i'm even thinking premchand is that you could destroy that boy's life because he will change his behavior to conform to what he thinks a monitor must be and he will become another person and i can easily see a train of tragic events but he that, knows he knows it exactly so i'm not making not an argument i'm making no, no, a no. flight of fancy it's a, so this is good that because uh, i'm thinking with you as well you know this person is uh, deciding this exactly he's entering into this race fully knowing that this is going to happen mm. and so agreeing to this so this is a voluntary decision that he's making that yes if i become the monitor of this class i will have to change my ways and i'm fully you know capable as well as happy to do it actually yeah just crap elections and i and i'll tell you what i'm not saying this i mean frankly this idea comes to me you know thinking unconventionally in the you know in the way you put it but this is not something which is so unconventional after all there have been there, there has been some research on this which shows that randomly random assignment of entitlements can often be better for the society than an entitlement chosen through a process which is so flawed so i would not say this that you should randomly make somebody the ceo of a company because there the systems and incentives are placed in such a way that it benefits the the larger output which everyone expects or intends mm. in elections the incentives get warped 
and those and and the you know the resultant actions harm the constituent harms the democracy harms democratic environment by and large and this is something that we see all around in fact if you look at it closely elections are a site of celebration in india nobody gets so serious about it in you know the poor laborer by the street when he or she when that family you know looks at a rally a political rally going on the road these little kids start dancing they start taking pictures they're just enjoying it least realizing that the person who just went by is the reason why they're poor see my sense is this my sense is that a good election in india is like a manchester united versus liverpool game <laughs> ki you are not going to affect the game by shouting liverpool liverpool but you are part of your tribe you are doing yeah. that tribal affiliation yeah. thing and you're feeling good about yourself and you're in that moment which is which explains a high turnout also because you know we know how it is one yeah. vote never changes anything right public choice again yeah. so rational ignorance is the best outcome is a logical way to go but so much is why do people vote When you say people, you'll have to qualify. Why do Indians vote? Why do the Westerners vote? Why do old people vote? Why do? Even But I think everyone has a different motivation. I think, like, if I have to put this in one line, based on my own observation about how, and I've primarily I have only observed Indians voting. I've observed mm-hmm. other countries voting behavior by being there very little. I think Indians vote for uh, for fun. I mean, again, this is a very this is a very unconventional statement that I'm making, and again, this is not something that I've that we have written in the book. I mean, to write something in the book, of course, both Arun and I have to have to agree. And second, writing the book was a learning exercise for both of us. So while we wrote, we also emerged uh, more uh, sort of let's say more mature about our thinking and how can we. So let's say the next book that we write on elections could potentially put these ideas on the table. But I think uh, I think we vote for fun. Like, uh, have you ever voted? I've never voted, and in fact, I've defended it in an episode of uh, which Ajay and I have done in Public Choice Theory, which will be out a week from now. It's not yet out, mm-hmm. but you know, people often say that hey, you know, it's, it's if you don't vote, you can't have an opinion, which to me is nonsense. Voting is a right, not a sort of a, a duty. But my my logic is this: that in an actual marketplace, if I go, let's say I go to buy a shirt to in Orbit Mall tomorrow, right? I go to H and M, I go to Uniqlo, uh, which would be interesting because there's no Uniqlo in that mall, but <laughs> assume there is, and I go to both of them, mm. and I don't. find a shirt i want it is okay i don't have to buy the least bad shirt i can not buy a shirt and my not buying a shirt or not acting in a particular way in a marketplace is also a signal that there is a gap somebody please come and satisfy me so i think my not voting so far means there is nobody i am satisfied with and therefore it is an invitation to political entrepreneurs that come give me what i want maybe then i will vote for you and in a sense though i don't like the amadmi party at all i oppose them but as political entrepreneurs in in the context of delhi in the local market of delhi i think they were remarkably successful mm. and they did exactly this they went in and they said okay there is middle class uh, this affection and this is how we can uh, you know tap into that this affection and um, you know they did what they did pretty uh, remarkably so i uh, i feel that not voting is also a signal that we know what percentage of people doesn't vote smart political entrepreneurs and I should pick it up and unfortunately those are few and far in between but i think there is a problem in voting like so many people have you know will vote for quote unquote the least evil and mm. I, i i don't think that is optimal yeah. i i think so you know i if if you have not so first of all i totally prescribe to your views uh, or subscribe to it actually i mean why should people be forced to vote and i think there is a huge amount of discourse now developing that you know people should be forced to mm-hmm. vote in fact uh, reminds me of a story that i that i think was narrated by uh what's his name it'll come to me anyway but meanwhile can i give you a secret Please. there is one way in which you can get an enormous number of vote share across india but not much of a seat share which is if Please. you change your name to nota <laughs> I mean, I'm being glib. Obviously, party <laughs> symbols and all are there, but yeah. Well, you you never know. But there is a surname called Nota in some place in India. Some actually. place or the other, yeah. <laughs> Because be. yeah, I mean, that's where the that's where the, there'll be a crazy negative disp there, right? Where you know your seat share is uh, zero basically, but your vote share is pretty. By good. the way, uh, speaking of which, you know, in the early elections. we used to have a large number of votes a significant uh, vote share going to independent candidates in india yeah, when you second, were talking about second highest the, candidate in 19 second highest party in 1952 was independence exactly so. if you can call it a party yeah. 16% so congress got 40 42% votes hmm. um and independent candidates got 16% of the votes and what you also pointed out in your book very interestingly is that one state where independents do much better than in the rest of india is bengal 
you know i mean the when you mentioned about the tribal feeling that this hmm. is i mean and we were talking about decentralized nature of understanding india i mean what more can tell us about how decentralized we are if it's not the religion that we profess or practice if it's not the number of princely states there were when british left if it is not the number of parties you know how many more than 2000 parties are registered in the election commission of india altogether not all of them contest and the number of independent contestants even today in fact you know if if the election commission of india hadn't increased the registration fee to nominate yourself you know we would have had even more larger number of people like so anyway come, i mean this is also something that we could we could you know take a segue on but to come back to the point that you were earlier raising why do we vote and when i say indians vote for fun what i'm trying to mean is that indians i don't think in the sense of like how many indians think that their single vote is important we know all kinds of advertisements tell them this i keep hearing all of all the time you know every vote matters every vote matters and there have been very few instances where when every vote has mat- mattered in this country i don't know of anyone who has gone to vote by thinking that no my vote matters in fact whenever i have seen voting taking place in india i have seen some form of fanfare and celebration and rejoice it's a holiday people go back of course many people argue and claim that you know this is the contribution we are doing to our democracy but by and large ordinary folks are enjoying that day they're, yeah. they're standing in queues uh, isn't queues. it also the case that there is an assertion of identity here that otherwise in society i might be oppressed and i might be bottom of the ladder but at the voting booth i'm equal to you it any be, any one an person inter- yeah, it's an interesting point it's an interesting point barring few people who are deeply impacted by the outcomes of electoral processes by and large most indians don't make most of it they may be very happy about a certain party winning or losing but they really don't think that with a new party coming in the site their fortunes are going to change if they don't think that what are, what is in fact by the way do you know globally turnouts are falling in most rich countries lesser and lesser people are going out to vote might be an indication of how the lack of trust that they have in electoral methods or democracies and you know specifically but india is the only country where you know i mean not the only country but india is one of those few countries where turnouts are going up which means more and people are going more and more people are coming out to vote but do they really think that they are participating in the process of democracy or are they participating in celebration of democracy and the two things are very different it's like a festival like go out on the street electoral uh, you know i mean you know, the elections are around the corner they will uh, impose a code of conduct and before that parties will do all kinds of uh, rallies political you know gatherings it's amazing when you when you when you go to one of these gatherings do we re- i mean they are they are so happy to see some of the leaders talking many of the many times they have to be pulled to that ground by giving them laddus and money and things like that otherwise you don't have so many people but they're sitting listening to the leaders and they're enjoying a gathering indians love to i mean uh, gather. you know gather have festival fun and i'm not saying about this as indians indians i mean at least in my observation i will need more i will need a richer vocabulary to explain what i'm saying but by and large i think most indians are going to vote because they are enjoying it Jashun. not because they jashna not because they think there is a high level of meaning that they are drawing from it which is leading to some sort of massive democracy at action in work i don't think that is probably the uh, impression most of us carry or most um, you know most people i know um, or i've seen carry uh, in places that i visited while elections are going on it's like going to a hansraj hans concert except that he wants something from you really badly <laughs> <laughs> so it makes you feel important uh, no and also there is a charming optimism of candidates like you pointed out that in both 2014 and 2019 in the lok sabha elections with more than 8000 candidates contesting almost 86% of the candidates lost their deposits yeah. so a whole yeah. bunch of these most of these people would have known that they're going to lose yeah, their exactly. deposits they just had fun <laughs> they just i mean i would <laughs> argue amit you should contest elections next time just see what happens it's fun isn't it at least people who came and you know this will also tell you how many people who you invited actually voted for you Uh, my uh, unfortunately i think my listeners and my guests are spread out all over the place oh, but so if you have a good constituency of followers in the flame university constituency maybe <laughs> i'll stand from there and let you campaign for me or i uh, wish they pass some amendment in order to allow people who are not in their own constituencies can also vote that would be good
Yeah. So we've got to kind of wrap this up in only 45 minutes more. So what a uh, while I will encourage our listeners to go through uh, your entire book. It's got great insights on Bihar, on UP, on Bengal and Kerala, especially the ways in which they are different where well many people think that they are alike, but you pointed out why they're different. I I want to talk about, you know, one thread in your book like the two threads in your book that really fascinated me besides the structural talk is one is the the overall arc that you drew of how elections have proceeded and what they have thrown up in india in general over all these years since the 1952 elections but the other which speaks to the current day is you know the rise of the bjp and i was you know fascinated by that particular chapter obviously you're busting a whole bunch of sort of commonly held beliefs within that for example you're showing that uh, as regards the 2019 verdict you are pointing out that you know the, the, the if you look at the basic statistics you realize that the bjp actually did pretty you know the common narrative is that hey it was just you know more of the hindutva and nationalism which won them 2019 but you point out that number one they did better in muslim seats and they had the last time they actually improved they did better than congress you right there are around 15 seats out of 543 which have more than 40% muslim population in india bjp won four of these while congress won five more interestingly bjp's vote share in these districts was highest 22% even though it was congress that had had the highest uh, vote share in these districts in 2014 and you, you point out that it's the same for districts having 20 to 40% muslim population which took me by surprise and i'll ask you to elaborate the other thing that i already knew is about dalit votes how they did uh, so well and and of course in both 2014 and 2019 it's a famous statistic that the more dalits voted for the bjp than for any other party which again goes against the dominant narrative and actually while people think of them as an urban party there was a smaller increase in urban areas and where turnouts were lower bjp actually did better which again goes against the conventional wisdom that it's increasing turnout that helps them because they turn the people out and the interesting another interesting thing you point out is that the hindi they didn't really increase so much in the hindi speaking states that was 2014 but in 2019 you know the states where they did well were jnk karnataka manipur orissa tripura telangana and west bengal and the states where they didn't do so well include bihar delhi Chath- chatisgarh etc etc you know which is quite uh, striking there so tell me a little bit about you know what are the misconceptions about the current bjp and then we'll go back to history because i also want to examine the 80s and the 90s but about the current bjp what are some of the misconceptions because you know when i saw the jan 22 speech that mr modi made and and of course listeners of the show would know that i um, oppose him and etc etc i won't rant on detail in that but when i saw that speech i said that okay he's got it for life you know he is now ascended to the stature of a religious leader mm. he has transcended politics the speech is masterful in terms of craftsmanship at multiple multiple levels and multiple layers as much as it saddens me to say so and uh, he is not going to lose an election again mm. but when i look at some of the things that uh, you have pointed out i begin to wonder if that is really the case so what are your sort of thoughts on that in the light of uh, you know uh, all the things that you said about 2019 and also i simply do not get that the figure that you gave about uh, the, the muslim constituencies you know what explains that also so, if you have any insight so um, i so i don't know i can't give an answer in terms of what explains this i because for that i need to know exactly what the preferences of each of those voters were but first of all let me clarify for the listeners that when we say in the book that bjp did better it's basically about their own relative performance compared to 2014 not that they did better than everyone else so they improved in these places and i think amit uh, my sense is so i'll pick up the first point that you mentioned which is about that it is performing in places it is performing better in those places which otherwise one would think they would not be performing so well and i think the answer lies in how indian voters are viewing the performance of the party the prime minister himself and otherwise how their lives may have changed in the last few years so we've not had a uh, census so and we don't have large scale data on how people's lives have changed but from little bit of data that we have from let's say cmi and others we'll clearly know that people are getting wealthier we also know that a large number of policies that bjp introduced in tw- during 2014 to 2019 they they were targeting typically the poorer segment of the population whether it is jandhan yojana or janani suraksha yojana or kisan credit card i mean that scheme was there but they augmented it 
and, and so on and so forth. So many of these policies were actually focusing on the non-urban population, the more disadvantaged people. One might argue and say that maybe they were influenced by the success of these policies to some extent and therefore they voted for the BJP. And this brings me to a point that we were earlier discussing is that I don't think we can bracket BJP as a, a conservative party and Congress as a liberal party because both these parties have exhibited instances of being both liberal and conservative at the same time. Uh, and there's something that we've written in the book as well. And so similarly, to say that BJP's victory is only attributed to its charm and appeal for Hindu nationalists is to ignore the data. The data doesn't show it, as, as you've rightly pointed out. I don't know. So if you ask me what exactly could have happened, I mean, I can give you 10 ideas. Anyone can when they look at the data. But we really don't know what exactly happened. At least as scholars of you know electoral methods or sephology, we would desist from speculating what it could be because that's what journalists do. And I think what journalists will say, we would probably agree, but we all will have to take this from a pinch. You know, the only thing that explains this is that people did not vote for BJP in 2019 purely from the lens of Hindutva. They definitely saw many other things because otherwise it will not explain the rise in these regions that, that you mentioned. So that's like point number one. Point number two is about the how BJP performed with respect to... And point number two was related to the Prime Minister's speech itself. And, you know, this guy has got it for life. I think we would be naive to believe that a leader who doesn't understand the pulse of its own society, I mean, we would be naive to believe that such a leader who understands the pulse of the society will not be chosen again. Um, and I think Mr. Modi understands it exceedingly well. He understood this about Gujarat when he was the chief minister there. He now understands it about India. And there, and so, in so far as elections are a verdict on popularity, I think he's got his code, he, he's, he's cracked the code. And that speech itself indicates the rise of the prime minister as a national level leader in the minds of people. And you know why this is true? This is true because the symptoms can be found in how Indians have voted in state elections against the national elections. So consistently, BJP may have lost in many states one year before or one year after the 2019 elections, but these are the same states where BJP won exceedingly well in Lok Sabha, which means Indians look at the Prime Minister differently or Indians look at New Delhi differently from their own state capitals. To say, and this, by the way, also, you know, I mean, I'm urged in some ways to explain why those who oppose simultaneous elections don't understand this. People think that simultaneous elections will influence voters, the, the quote-unquote gullible Indian voters, to vote for the same party who is in center also in the state. But I have seen distinctly in all the data that we have screened, screened through and, uh, you know, Arun and I, we have discussed this at length, that Indian voters are actually smart. They know whether they are voting it for Vidhan Sabha or for Lok Sabha and they are very, very clear in, distinct, in making this distinction. So, uh, to come back to the religious aspect, which you mentioned on 22nd January, comes up with this absolutely brilliant speech. Everybody's hooked on to the television and they think uh, he's the man that they, that they need even for the next term. I would not deny it. I think it was extremely compelling what he said. I also know that this was not done in the way that it may have been done in the 90s, which is to say that there was no malice that was expressed in the entire speech. There was no malice that was expressed in the entire ecosystem that drew uh, 22nd January to take place. So there was no anti-X, anti-anything that this movement was. It was sim something which was a manifestation maybe of, uh, you know, many, uh, many Indians. And so I, my, my comment to your question would only be that uh, I think Mr. Modi understands India and Indians very well, probably more than any other prime minister in the recent past. And in that sense, if he understands this and if he knows how elections work, he has probably cracked the code, like I said. And the last bit which you said about, again, I mean, there's a similar thing that uh, I mentioned earlier. What may have explained this, I can't say. I only want to bring this on the table that people need to look at the numbers before making sweeping judgments on, on why a particular political party is winning or losing. Western media is particularly, you know, I would urge this particularly to Western media who think that Prime Minister's or uh, BJP's rise to power has been driven on a chariot of uh, Hindutva. I, I don't think, I mean, the numbers don't show this. 
So I want to go a little further back in history to ask you about another period of time where again you use the data to show things that are contrary to popular perception for example you point out that for that the link between ayodhya and bjp is not so strong at one point you write quote it can be seen that the link between ayodhya and bjp is not as strong as it is suggested to be there was a sudden rise in bjp's appeal between 1989 and 1991 but the babri masjid demolition took place only in december 92 and in 93 bjp seats had in fact fallen without impacting the vote share much so the real impactful period is 89 to 91 This is prior to the mosque demolition. Two things happened during this time. Advani's Rath Yatra took place in September October 1990 and the Mandal Commission recommendations were implemented in August 1990. So this is uh, one thing that I'd like you to elaborate on and also the part which I found super super interesting and I think my listeners also will where you point out that even before this they had the moment of 1989 which was a watershed moment for the Congress in losing everything that they did but also a huge upswing in the BJP. JP's votes and as you point out that 89 was before the yatra yatra before mandal and obviously before the babri masjid demolition and it was too far after 1986 shabano judgment which some Correct. commentators will say that caused it Correct. you have another explanation for it i'd like you to elaborate on that as well <laughs> thanks no this is this is uh, great that you picked it up and it was actually a surprise uh, so frankly we wrote this book without any preconceived notion we are just looking at the data and data is surprising us i think i'll highly highly recommend listeners to dive deep into the data now you can get all the data i mean election commission of india anyway publishes everything on its website so if you look at the data it will tell you stories that you will it will push you to think through several stories that were there but were never documented so this is what we find bjp's fortunes really changed in 1989 and not in 1993 Now, between 1989 to 1991 surely there was a massive rise uh, and that could be attributed to uh, you know a bunch of things maybe advani's rath yatra but what led bjp to come on the center stage in 1989 just 1985 to 89 what these four years now people think about shabano judgment like you rightly pointed out we actually look at the dates of how shabano judgment could have impacted and we don't think that it was probably a very strong reason two reasons one shabano's judgment you know the ram mandir gates opened before the amendment that rajiv gandhi government brought which nullified the judgment and so therefore it would not have had such an impact and also second more important reason you know 85 is too far behind 89 i mean indians tend to forget something must have happened closer to 89 and what we spec what we kind of zero it down to there were so many things happening we tried to pull out everything that happened in india during 86 to 89 and the only notable impactful you know experience that india as a country went through was to be glued on their television every sunday watching ramayana at the same time i don't think india did one thing at the same time together in such large numbers and some of us you know will remember uh, or our parents will will tell us how auspicious that one hour used to be during those days across the length and breadth of the country you know people would not have their weddings public transport would be would be shut shops were shut i mean i remember i was a very small kid but my faint memory of those times and i mean you may want to also you know tell me about what were you doing at that time you know we would go out we were so small that we don't don't really remember being uh, glued to the television set the way our grandparents and parents were but we would simply go out and enjoy the empty streets i just i have distinct memory of this old part of agra which is always crowded and i come out of my gully and mohalla and i and we, you know three four of us we friends we are on the road and there's nobody there and we're just enjoying it oh there's nobody on the road let's walk and you know there a bunch of a few people i mean literally the country was on a standstill during this hour and what were they going through they were they were watching ramayana they were they were putting garlands on the tv they were you know with their diyas light lit up you know they're they're sitting there they're praying while the serial is going on and they're hooked on to this television at the same time everybody in india was tied into this thinking about their own religious aspirations in a way unimaginable and of course this was followed by uh, you know by by mahabharata so i think this tied india in a way that and, and this is not that it was bjp's doing this just somehow it happened and it was the first time by the way when the whole country is told the same story 
at the same time and they all are trying to relate to it this is also the time when some of the other serials in the doordarshan you know buniyad and uh, what was the other one buniyad hum log were a little earlier 84 little 85 earlier. oh they were a little earlier ye jo hai zindagi would have been 87 88 but yeah i remember the phenomenon ramanan and and uh, you've uh, written about it beautifully so let me just read those passages out like i said this is a very well written book so K- kartika must be so pleased Airing through January 1987 until July 1988, the series moved the country in ways unimaginable. A total of 78 45-minute-long episodes aired on Sunday mornings and became week- weekly rituals that lakhs of Indian homes ceremoniously indulged in with great devotion and amazement. Streets would get deserted, buses and even trains would stop. Passengers would step out to watch the serial on TV in a roadside shop. At times, people would bathe, garland the television, burn incense, and kneel before the television as the show would begin. It was like a spell no one could have imagined. Generations of families and neighbors would huddle together in the same room to watch the serial with unparalleled reverence and humanity's most ardent following for any soap opera ever broadcasted. The actors who played characters on the show became real-life gods for people. Estimates suggest that around 65 crore people watched the show. Stop quote. And it the timing was perfect, like a perfect storm. Like you've pointed out, television sets were exploding in the country, right. and etc. etc. And you asked me what I was doing. My dad in those days an ias officer he was posted to pune as a director of the film and television institute of mm-hmm. india mm-hmm. and in those years i was getting into world cinema so when ramayana was on i was probably watching some fellini when mahabharata <laughs> was on i think that's when kislovsky's decalogue came out <laughs> so i'm really sorry to disappoint you but uh, but i could see the phenomenon all around me yeah. it was mad and again i'm struck by this fantastic phrase that you've used which uh, goes back to what we were speaking about earlier the centralizing imagination yes. where you have written quote people in remote areas had now expanded their horizon of imagining india and research shows that a strong node of this imagination had had hinged around middle class urban hindu imagination and then you talk about a bunch of surveys where muslim respondents sikh respondents laborers and artisans feel that they are not adequately represented etc but this middle class urban hindu imagination has just kind of taken over much as you know the image of ram actually is not some historical image of ram but raja ravi varma's paintings mm-hmm. which you know pop, uh, popular culture has taken from uh, ram krishna and all that uh, similarly you know you have one particular vision of this epic you know i think ramanujan had a great essay 300 Ramayana's right about all the different Ramayana's and essay came about around the same time when Ramayana was being aired like there you go there. yeah so i guess it was a response to that perhaps <laughs> in, in <laughs> a know, sense yeah, who knows it's a good point i don't know whether it was a response yeah, but but, uh, uh, but surely it's again you, homogenized and a particular exactly. vision and and you know what happens is that in electoral promises when you make a promise of a certain type which chimes with a large section of population they think that yes well time has come and i th- i think this is also the time when you know indians are connecting to each other maybe the transportation is much better there are also times of great distress the unemployment is a record high and by the way they also in- decreased the voting populations the age of the voters uh, eligible voting age from 21 to 18 years so many young folks who were otherwise not eligible to vote until 1985 are now going to be voting um, and these guys are also you know people who either have finished college and don't have jobs or even if they have they are now also watching the series um, so a lot of these people who are first time voters are understanding our, themselves they they understanding their identities in a way that was never done earlier and the, the youth vote also played a significant part in 2014 and 2019 uh, yes absolutely so, you know again and these uh, this youth they have only see th- so th- this youth has been now exposed to the western world they have been exposed to the type of media what media shows them about the west and now they want to be like that and they think this is possible only through a strong uh, charismatic leader and i think many of these young people so i don't know no one can know whether young people are voting more i mean we can do this correlation between you know young voter voting population in a constituency and whether bjp is winning there or not um, i can't say that but surely you know whether women and bjp women or youth are voting for uh, bjp speculations are that they are um, i can't be sure but i would not be surprised if they are and also just thinking aloud uh, you know at at one level you would expect the the young to be kind of rebellious and more liberal and etc etc we go through those phases in college where we are reading marx and all that but at another level if you think about what would motivate the young who have so much energy and perhaps spent of frustration and anger to vote they would more likely be extreme emotions of anger and so on rather than you know abstract things like secularism and tolerance and all of that which would not uh, excite the young unemployed imagine 
imagination so much but i'm just speculating no no but i think i think the answer to this is uh, i mean most people are not reading marx and going to good universities in india most youngsters exactly yeah and yeah. so therefore uh, no i mean the general not, inclination that you think in broadly bleeding heart kind of ways without really understanding the world yeah i mean i i see what you're saying and i think i partly agree with it too young people they are voting through their experiences more than any theories that they learn in schools um if they learn anything at all like most of them so let me ask you about something yeah. else i use the show partly to educate myself and this is another great opportunity and two of the narratives that i have kind of picked up from different guests of mine go thus with veer sangvi when i did the show and he wrote about it in his, in his book also his point was that look the bjp was founded in 1980 under the uh, rubric of gandhian socialism then 1984 happens and in 1984 according to veer if i remember correctly i hope i'm not misrepresenting was an expression of the hindu vote really you know the anti you know after indira gandhi ji died and that was the way he interpreted it and his thing was that it was a wake up call for the bjp that shit that is our natural constituency it is going away and at that point rajiv doesn't even realize what has happened mm. because that's not a particularly um, smart family uh, from that generation onwards mm. and uh, and therefore shabano which is very much part of veer's uh, narrative and the bjp comes storming back to take the hindu vote mm. and then that happens that mm. whole game plays out and the bjp is really supply responding to demand that society the other narrative which i got partly from vinay sitapati and uh, the book he wrote on narsimha rao and all that is that look all of us would agree that 91 liberalizations were awesome even if they were incomplete right, as both you and i agree they got Surely. hundreds of millions of people out of poverty Surely. but a side effect of that was that this massive newly minted middle class which could now express itself just happened to be conservative and just happened to have those kinds of inclinations mm. and that became a natural vote base for the bjp now as far as both these narratives are concerned when i read your book i felt that the figures don't back them up mm. for the second narrative you have pointed out that the bjp had this spike between 89 they did well mm. spike between 89 and 91 but then they plateaued through the 90s Correct. which would not be the case if that newly minted middle class was as uh, nationalistic as uh, one imagines and also when you you looked at the numbers in great detail through the 80s mm. and again the timelines don't seem to match up i find your uh, narrative of the ramayana and a mahabharat and that cultural consciousness that comes about because of that an extremely compelling argument yeah. but uh, i thought i'll share these two views and no and i whatever. think so i am aware of these views um, not necessarily attributed to uh, the authors but i surely know these arguments because when we were doing uh, when we were researching for this book uh, we came across uh, these arguments and uh, my own understanding so i was kind of getting challenged and we were thinking maybe this is not the case and then we thought maybe this is the case uh, we really don't know this is the beauty of doing psychology or you know studies of this type is that we really don't know because we are trying to theorize how people are thinking through their revealed preferences and these speculations go only so far to explain this um and i would leave it to the judgment of the readers which one do they consider compelling i am very you know i'm quite pleased and humbled actually that you find this this narrative uh, fairly compelling i think there is more research needs to be done so let's say for instance if we have the data on how much did bjp win in the constituencies where certain where what was the reach of doordarshan in constituencies and within those constituencies what was the voting you know uh, how many votes did bjp accumulate that would be a great study uh, that yeah. would be a great study so i think this is just a call for so what we are trying to do in this in this book is we are we are encouraging maybe future scholars to go deeper into the narratives that have been fostered upon us by by many other intellectuals and whose uh, narratives and arguments i quite respect because with limited amount of information there is only so much that we can tell we're all building on each other's we're work all building anyway. on each other's right so in some ways for, from the perspective of what many of the scholars mention fairly compelling now we have come up with another argument hope someone will go further into this and pull out but if we do go to the bottom of this we should then um at, so we may not be successful in proving in what we are saying but we surely are successful at least in my view in pushing readers to reconsider the dominant narratives because the dominant narratives don't add up if they don't add up this doesn't mean that our narrative is the is the correct one but it surely means that there is more research to be needed we simply cannot say that bjp is in india thanks to ram mandir we simply cannot say it I, i think it was in india much before that it had already made strong holds into the mind in, into the mental fabric of this nation much before atwani's rath yatra let alone babri masjid we also know that 
uh, you know, Shabano was not the only trigger. It could not have been simply. First of all, it was four years, you know, behind. Uh, if you talk to people, they will tell you things from their memory. But, you know, as economists, we generally don't tend to believe in surveys because people can say whatever. But what they really, you know, act what do they reveal their preferences in is what we rely upon. So, you know, we, we hope that more people can do this study and at least, again, find an Indian narrative about what, what is going on in India. Out of the three sort of takeaways you had from that chapter, the third one was that, okay, the BJP preference in the center has to be looked at differently from its performance in states. You've already spoken about that. The first two we've already discussed. One, that uh, its performance in 2019 was less reliant on the saffron color or the Hindi-speaking population than otherwise suggested. I find your data on this very convincing. It's also backed up by a lot of anecdotes, if one can call them that. Parth MN, I think, did some excellent reporting around that time where he mm. pointed out that the welfareism was really working in mm. UP for yeah. them. Yes, yes. and there was an upsurge of support for that so I buy that I love the and, and your second takeaway was of course that it is a Ramayana and not Shabano or Ayodhya that really catapulted BJP in people's consciousness so here's my question that I could either look at the Jan 22nd uh, speech which I agree with you is an example of Modi totally capturing the pulse and uh, and there are two ways to sort of interpret why he why there was no othering within the speech like he didn't say Jai Shri Ram once and it was all uh, feel good touchy talk and one is that it is plausible deniability that the foot soldiers of the movement will do what they do while he is like a statesman. But the other one is that he really uh, sort of kind of believed in that because why not? That is a legacy he wants. So regardless of which of them is true, I don't think that's relevant. But the question that I'm coming at is that on one hand, if the, uh, the saffron appeal is overstated, then... You know, on the one hand, the claim is that the saffron appeal is overstated when it comes to 2019. But on the other hand, if the Ramayana ha was such a pivotal and seminal moment in the history of the BJP, that is not exactly the saffron appeal, but it is that same kind of cultural consciousness that is helping them. When people say that the Ram Mandir helped the BJP, I think it is partly meant metaphorically and not the specific event of the breakdown of the Babri Masjid. And as a metaphor, I, th I think it seems to work, right? So yeah. how do we reconcile these? So I don't think we need, I, I think it's already reconciled, right? So both Ramayana and 22nd January have similar undertones. They go them. together very well. But they my point well. is, I can e I can look at 22nd January and either I can make that statement that I made, which I do believe that he has now elevated himself to the level of a religious leader. He's never going to lose an election again. Or I could say that, no, Amit, you're overreacting. 2019 was not a saffron thing. It was because they delivered on whatever they delivered on, welfare in Eastern UP, etc., etc. If they stop delivering, they can get voted out. You know, and I can look at, uh, you know, how different the states are from the center and say a personality cult can't last forever. So, which of these? So, I mean, uh, again, from the way you're putting it, it looks like it's the first one. So, l let me let me try to tell this, uh, let me try to explain this uh, with an example. You know, the first war of Indian independence was triggered by Mangal Pandey. Not because of subjugation or British not being nice to them. It was because they were forced to open up their, uh, their, uh, their sort of bullets with their mouth, which apparently had... Non-veg, yeah. Yeah, more particularly um, cow or, or, or uh, beef or pork. I don't remember exactly which one. Uh, which means, uh, for most part of India's history, whoever has ruled parts of India has come to terms with one fact, which is that if you let people f continue with their cultures um, and customs and religions, if you don't meddle into, into it too much, uh, they are by and large not going to you know, claim any share of power. And this is true because this is highly, highly decentralized society. So every community, you just allow the community to be be happy with itself. Now, it, sometimes it happened nicely, sometimes it did not happen nicely. But through history, we see that our, our, our association with our cultures and our customs and our religion is cannot be bracketed into something like we are not secular and we are very religious. In fact, most people who vote for BJP are not necessarily those, uh, you know, those... Uh, jingoist hardcore hindus they may not be people who believe in that certain type of sect or a tradition in the hinduism and would be praying in front of uh, you know god's image for hours most people are not like this and most indians are not like that but they still believe i think that their culture is important their customs are important what they do what they practice what they profess as a matter of ancestral practice is important and so when we say that mr modi has picked this pulse I think I will put it differently. I will say, you must be a stupid leader not to recognize this. 
I mean, any smart leader will need to know what is what is the population of which he is a, he or she is a part of. And I think if we if we look at major sources of discontentment amongst Indian population, they have not really been about you know what is the other person doing. You could do whatever you want. In fact, as long as I am doing what I am doing and you allow me to do it, I am fine. If you don't, then there is a problem. So. Our culture, customs. There is a reason, Amit, why, you know, you know, when Ibn Battuta came to India, this is 12th century, he is writing about some lovely food that he's eating in and around Delhi. I know what it was. It was these potato things which are now called the Batuta Vada. Sorry. The, 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 the samosas, actually. I'm kidding. In fact, those <laughs> Batuta Vada, yes. <laughs> so, I mean, but you're not very far, actually. So, he is writing about samosas. So, it used to be called as samosas, but used to have meat in it. And, you know, um, we still eat samosas, of course, with aloo now. Um, he's talking about black dal, you know, which we continue to eat. We don't have necessarily museums. I mean, partly it's a problem. I think we should have museums. But partly also because, you know, maybe what Indian women were wearing thousand years ago is what they continue to wear today. Uh, there so, was no stitched clothing, I think, thousand years ago. But there were drapes. Right? They were drapes, yeah. But yeah. there would be sarees without blouses. Sarees without blouses. Depends on which part of India you are in. Yeah. But by and large, what I'm trying to say is that much of what we were doing earlier is what we continue to do. This continuity in our actions should be enough for us to recognize how important our customs and cultures and everyday living is to us. And because we are all pagans, we don't necessarily have a religion. Like, we don't necessarily have a practice which, which is religion. In fact, you know, if you read Himalayan gazetteers, these, the British are quite confused and they are very very explicitly writing, how is it possible, you know, they have, in the same Buddhist temple, there is a Hindu priest and Hindu temples, there are Buddhist priests. Continues to happen. Like, if you go to Lahore and Smithy, you will find this. So, there's high level of intermixing of various religions, various customs. So, I don't want to call it, you know, something which is secular or non-secular. Um, you can only design secularism if you have a religion. Let, let me repeat this, okay? So, if there is no religion, secularism will not mean anything because secularism is defined against some religion. Because we are pagans, we don't know how to deal with secularism. So, it just doesn't make sense to us. But so, are we pagans? Haven't many of us redefined ourselves as Hindus following the colonial yeah, but, yeah. categorization? So, so this is, so, but look at our practices for that matter. You know, if we have a religion, then these practices must be sold somewhere. But they're not sourced anywhere. They're just ancestral practice. We just do it. Uh, some people will rise up and say, oh no, in such and such Shastra, this is written and so on and so forth. Anyway, long story short, what I'm trying to say is, for us, these customs matter, the cultures matter, our quote-unquote religion matters. And this is true of Mangal Pandey. This is true of 1989. This is going to be true for 2022. In none of these cases, are we seeing a situation where there is a fight over which god is better than the other god. That's never been the fight here, actually. Even in communal riots in India, it's not about whether Allah is better than Ram or not. It's never the fight of gods. That doesn't mean that it is not a fight. Of course, there are communal riots. But I, but let me not go there. The point I'm saying is, by and large, I think, I think they're both reconciled already. The, the fervor with which we saw 22nd January, uh, you know, uh, expand and flourish in India is the fervor with which we saw Ramayana. And any political party or leader will be, you know, will be stupid to ignore this about India. So you've given me tons of food for thought and I'm very grateful for that and I will keep thinking about it and process everything that you've said. But I would also point you uh, to a counterpoint to that whole thing about how it is not, uh, um, uh, you know, against anyone. To You know, Akar Patel did a couple of episodes with me and in the first of them, he made this point which I thought there was uh, something there to think about as well, where he pointed out that this whole Hindutva movement it doesn't stand for anything. It stands against Muslims and it stands against a certain way of being. And they define themselves by what they are against and not what they are for. And Akar's question is that if you are that define a Hindu Rashtra for me, what 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 are what does it have? Don't tell me what you're against, that we will not be, you know, second class citizens in a country ruled by Muslims or whatever uh, the rhetoric is. Don't tell me what we are against, tell me what we are for. And I thought that that was a really convincing rhetorical 
question to ask. At the same time, I get your point of view that when the Ramayana happens at the time of the Ramayana, when people feel good watching that and they feel that sense of community, at that moment, they are not against anything. At that moment, they feel that shared cultural bonding. So I get that also. And I think uh, that uh, there's a lot to think about. I feel, I feel you know, uh, the time we've had today is deeply inadequate. My listeners will be really pissed off at me. Ki das ghante kyun nahi liya usse, and etc. etc. <laughs> because bad, no, no, because uh, we could have spoken for five hours over this angle. We could have spoken for another five hours about your amazing book. But I, re- I recommend everyone, please buy that. It's just packed with insights and it's packed with numbers, and the numbers speak for themselves. You know, rarely uh, have you expressed any political opinion in the book. I, I mean, I don't remember any. It is just all about the numbers speaking for themselves, which I. I found a really powerful and a fantastic approach. So, you know, before we end this conversation, my traditional question for my guests right at the end is, for me and my listeners, recommend books, films, music, any kind of art at all that means a lot to you, that you like so much, you love so much that you just want to share it with everyone. So, I mean, I could give a long list, but I think a litany of it. But I think a movie that I definitely mentioned during the course of our conversation is uh, Kantara. Um, recently, I also saw this uh, Marathi movie called Cycle. And another Marathi movie called Mulshi Pattern, which I really like. I actually have a habit of watching regional cinema as much as possible or even black and white cinema because they open up a different kind of India to you, for instance. So those are good, of course. In terms of texts, I think I mentioned the scholarship of uh, Bal Gangadhara. And uh, one of his books is The Heathen in His Blindness. I will highly recommend that. A lot of the ideas that I've discussed, some of them, you know, you'll, uh, you know, the, the listeners will be able to locate them there and many of his co-authors actually but I think uh, instead of giving a longer list one or two more powerful ones will be uh, will be enough I will of course recommend everyone to read Gazetteers the mm-hmm. Colonial Gazetteers where do they find it? Is it you, you can find them online they are all in disparate sources so in, in our project and hopefully we will launch Maharashtra's uh, project uh, in a few months we will also have a repository of all Colonial Gazetteers on our website so people can download them they are properly catalogued look up your districts and uh, pull it out you know, hope we can uh, meet again at that time and I'll probably be in a bit, you know, more detailed One position. more episode for sure, yeah, yeah. And, uh, but yes, uh, right now, if you just Google, let's say, I don't know, Pune Gazetteer or Agra Gazetteer or, uh, or for that matter, you know, Himalayan Gazetteer, you will find those. Uh, just just read what the British have written about us. I think that will be itself, it's, um, once you hook with colonial writings, it's so hard to leave it rabbit holes here I come uh, Yugang thank you so much I had such a great time I no no thanks a lot Amit I, I'm so happy and uh, so happy to hear your thoughts on the book your questions are amazing uh, it's my first time with you and I think I learned uh, considerably uh, with you I, I learned a lot and also you know I'm not very you know both Arun and I we've not really marketed the book so much but thankfully you know people who have read it have told me um, you know good things uh, to hear that from you is uh, such a reassurance Uh, Thank you so much. Thank you. And you're going to hear a lot more, I think, from our listeners as they discover your book in the coming weeks. So thank you. Thank you so much. If you enjoyed listening to this episode, do share it with everyone you think might be interested. Do go over to your nearest bookstore online or offline and pick up Yugang's book, Who Moved My Vote. You can follow Yugang on Twitter at Yugang underscore Goel. You can follow me at Amit Varma, A-M-I-T-V-A-R-M-A. You can browse past episodes of The Scene and the Unseen at sceneunseen.in. Thank you for listening. Did you enjoy this episode of The Scene and the Unseen? If so, would you like to support the production of the show? You can go over to sceneunseen.in slash support and contribute any amount you like to keep this podcast alive and kicking. Thank you. <laughs>